starting from pachy meningitis um, and uh, the orbital swelling which all of us are aware about uh, then the uh, lacrimal glands, the salivary glands, which is of course very much part of the general uh, knowledge about IgG4 disease, uh, the thyroid gland swellings, the encasing of the aorta and retroperitoneal fibrosis, which I think all of us are familiar with. But mind you, you also get encasing of the carotid sheath very often. Okay? So any vessel sheathing also should make you think about it. Pancreas is of course one of the initially described manifestation. Lungs, we've seen a lot of lung involvement and a lot of sinus involvement. So we'll come to some of the cases, the bile ducts, uh, the kidneys, I think Dr. Paike is going to speak about. And uh, <coughs> so it's a very, very uh, great mimic. <coughs> and high index of clinical suspicion is very rewarding. So if you have an, a mass-like lesion, a tumefactive lesion as they call it in one or more organs, you might think of it once you've excluded, of course, other possibilities. A raised eosinophilia, raised IgE levels are often uh, seen in these patients and they have a history of allergies, hypergammaglobinemia and mind you, this is driven by complement, so there is hypocomplementemia. Uh, and uh, then the more specific studies, so this makes you suspect it and you can sort of uh, establish your diagnosis with serum IgG levels, histopathologic, uh, histopathological studies, the radiology also can sort of help you and uh, then you might have used these criteria for saying whether this IgG4 is a definite IgG4 when you have all three, that is the clinical, the hematological and the histopathological. But when you have the clinical and the pathological, it's probable. And when you have only the clinical and the hematological or the elevated values, it's a possible IgG4. But all these atypical cases will probably illustrate how a possible also, and not all the criteria are often met, even if it is a uh, proper IgG4 disease. So now this is the first case. It's a young girl in her early 20s and she developed pain in her lower premolars and underwent a dental extraction but the wound wouldn't heal and there was a swelling at the site of the wound. <coughs> and the CT showed a large multilocular lesion in the mandible extending uh, quite extensively anteroposteriorly. It was thought to be an enamel tumor or an ameloblastoma and she was referred to Tata. <coughs> now we get a lot of referrals from Tata, so two, three cases will be from Tata. And uh, so this is a CT guided biopsy which was uh, done at Tata. And uh, they said that this is not a malignant lesion. And later on, we asked them to stain it for IgG4 once she was referred. And she turned out to be positive for the same. And this is very classical a proven, completely proven case or a definite case of IgG4 disease. So you had a CT diagnosis which looked like a malignancy but a histopathology which showed a lymphoplasmocytic infiltration and which was positive for staining for more than 40% of the cells stained positive for IgG4. Now this is a, a baffling uh, case initially, this came a bit early in around <coughs> about 7-8 years ago. and. Uh, this was a male who was running a little fever and he had multiple lymph adenopathy. He also had some fungal lesions and with that he had loss of appetite and weight loss. He had a lymph node as FNAC, mind you, done outside and they had reported it as a malignant lymphoma. He was referred to Tata. Tata repeated it and they did an excision biopsy of the lymph node and they excluded a lymphoma. But because this patient also had some joint pains, uh, I think it's not come in this slide, they referred it to us to rule out an autoimmune etiology of this lymphadenopathy, predominant lymphadenopathy. So the December 2018 is when he, he came to us. And before that, if you can see, you have very early sky high ESRs and CRPs. And he, he was a running a little bit of fever and weight loss and some mild joint pains, <coughs> knees and wrists. 
So we did a rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP which was negative and because we were clued in into IgG4 also by then, we also did an IgG4 and his IgE was high, he had uh, allergy history, his, uh, so we did an IgG4 which was high. However, we were still not very comfortable with diagnosing him as IgG4 disease with only lymphadenopathy as the and we felt whether he was harboring a lymphoma which might manifest at a later point. However, uh, because it was referred from Tata, we, uh, uh, we accepted this as the diagnosis, working diagnosis. We put him on methotrexate and which we increased up to 25 milligrams and steroids initiated at 20 milligrams. He did well initially for the first six months, but again he developed loss of appetite, weight loss and his inflammatory markers were high. And then again an ultrasound abdomen was done, he had abdominal pain and there was a hypoechoic lymph node mass again. <clears throat> so this time uh, uh, he, we sent him back to Tata and uh, again at this time when they did the biopsy it was positive for IgG4. His IgG4 levels were also increased and then we was advised rituximab and he's done very well. Uh, uh, so he's, we are seeing him at least one and a half year after the rituximab and he's completely well. So this was a case where because of the significant weight loss, some fever and uh, loss of appetite, we were a bit skeptical about and only lymphadenopathy as the manifestation. So we were a little skeptical but then it turned out to be IgG4. Now this was a patient and this is uh, uh, this for everyone in the audience that retroperitoneal fibrosis, many of you are aware can be one of the manifestation of IgG4 disease. It was missed in this patient in the initial stages and then she went on to develop a multi-system disease. So this was a 19 year old girl with low grade fever on and off and mind you these two patients have fever. Fever is considered an exclusion for IgG4. So again uh, we'll come to that later. <coughs> So uh, over six months she developed pain and fullness in the abdomen and pain in the back as well and she had uh, on ultrasound bilateral hydronephrosis with hydroureters. Now uh, I'd like to repeat this that in the absence of obstruction uh, bilateral hydronephrosis and hydroureter should mean retroperitoneal fibrosis. So if you don't document a stone, you don't have a, a bladder outlet obstruction and you're getting this bilateral, you must think of retroperitoneal fibrosis and do a CT. So then uh, she was just treated with antibiotics then. Again she developed, uh, well, it's a low grade, so you can see that for a year she was reasonably okay. This is before coming to us. And uh, then she developed intermittent fever, weight loss of 13 kgs and then she had a lymphadenopathy which was empirically started on AKT because of the significant weight loss. On this treatment she had, she developed anemia, it was Coombs positive and she had ictris. This was attributed to the AKT, she was shifted to hepatosafe drugs. She was again a little okay maybe in between, again she had fever with chills and bilateral lower limb swelling and then she was, a CT was done, she also had breathlessness and then it showed multiple nodules within the lungs a pericardial effusion and another hallmark which we've seen in patients, she also had a swelling on the forearm, we've seen a lot of encasement of the vessels, be it the veins, be it the arteries and that also should be a sort of signal to you to think about IgG4 disease. And this was when she was admitted with us <coughs> and uh, I'm sorry we don't have many of the images because I couldn't do it in that short time. And uh, so again there were a lot of uh, ground glass opacities in the lung and multiple pleural based nodules mm, uh, and there were some lymph nodes retroperitoneal which were accessible but they were only showing reactive lymphadeno lymphadenitis. Now with the background of the retroperitoneal fibrosis we did a IgG4 and it was again elevated. So again she fit in only in possible IgG4 disease. And, but she was started on oral steroids and uh, uh, later on uh, while tapering the steroids she developed bilateral knee synovitis and then she was methotrexate was added and now she's following up for five years. She's not needed any uh, stepping up of treatment during these five years. So she's done very well. <coughs> this was a, a more recent patient 
And this is referred from a surgeon. Uh, this was a 67-year-old male with, who had jaundice uh, and loss of appetite, itching, and a weight loss of 7 kg in the last six months. But he was symptomatic only since one month for the uh, loss of appetite. So uh, he, he was investigated and the CT abdomen showed a thickening, wall thickening of the common bile duct at its bifurcation and associated narrowing in the suprapancreatic portion of the bile duct. This was the most important. He was ictric with a bilirubin of 15 and his liver enzymes were marginally raised. So CT they gave a diagnosis of a cholangiocarcinoma. He underwent right hepatectomy and a hepatojejunostomy. <clears throat> but the biopsy surprisingly showed a lot of fibrous tissue encasing the bile ducts. And this IgG4 was done later when he was referred to us because uh, the slides were done at Hinduja itself. And then it showed IgG4 in less than 40% of the cells. But his IgG4 levels were elevated. So he had a hematological, a clinical picture which was uncommon and a biopsy which was not completely diagnostic. Again, he was taken as a possible IgG4, treated with uh, steroids and he's done remarkably well. <coughs> uh, and he had, he's completely regained his weight loss and he's really done well. <coughs> his jaundice disappeared and everything improved. And this is another very conf uh, patient who had a very long illness prior to coming to Hinduja and uh, a lot of complicated story. Uh, so she had a 54 year old female and uh, she had some neck swellings that is lymphadenopathy and uh, uh, she had breathlessness, weight loss. She had gave a history of recurrent allergic rhinosinusitis. She was evaluated outside. So, so the USG showed bilateral diffuse neck lymphadenopathy and HRCT showed patchy consolidation. The biopsy of the lymph node was done. It was non-specific lymphadenitis. A PET scan was then done and it showed a mass, fibronodular mass in the left upper and right lower lobe of the lung. And there was some hypermetabolic activity in the splenic flexure and pericolonic fat stranding. <coughs> she was put on empiric AKT outside. <coughs> And repeat HRCT after a month showed progression of her lung lesions. So they thought of a, they thought of doing a biopsy. They did a biopsy, and outside it was reported as adenocarcinoma. And uh, uh, after a month of this, she developed abdominal pain, uh, which was radiating to the back. And again, the HRCT showed multiple areas of consolidation, ground glass opacities, and some enlarged lymph nodes. So this was when she came to us. So we thought we should, uh, she was actually in the ICU. She had uh, a lot of breathlessness. She was on oxygen when she came to us. And uh, we thought of reviewing her in all ways. And uh, the PET CT actually, when we saw the CT films, there was a lot of thickening of the omentum. There was a thickening of the entire colonic, the retroperitoneal uh, uh, space around the colon. And uh, there were all these lesions on, in the lungs, which are seen in that picture. And this was biopsied at Hinduja. And what they said was, this is a fibrosing sort of pneumonia and with some interstitial fibrosis. But there was no carcinoma there. Uh, and the IgG4 staining we had asked because the whole thing, uh, clinically to my mind, which she also had some uh, venous phlebitis and also in the now on the PET, it showed uh, uh, circumferential wall thickening in the stomach, surrounding the stomach in the anteropyloric region. Also carotid sheathing the, and also sheathing of the saphenofemoral junction extending into the right femoral vein. So uh, all this was very odd and possibly f did fit in with an IgG4 disease. So we did an IgG4 level, uh, not showing on this. So it was, it was marginally low, it was uh, marginally high, it, with the value of 2 being normal, it was 2.3 grams. Uh, and uh, the staining also was not conclusive, 
the biopsy was not conclusive for IgG4 disease, but the clinical picture, to my mind, was completely conclusive. And uh, sorry, this IgG4 was this. And uh, she was diagnosed as possible IgG4 disease. And she was quite a sick patient, uh, was treated with steroids and then put on mycophenol at Mofetil. Uh, and um, she's done also very remarkably well on follow-up. And we have a follow-up of about a year. We've done repeat scanning. And all those lesions have actually markedly reduced in size. And she's doing very well clinically. So this was just to bring out very unusual um, manifestations of IgG4 disease and uh, so apart from the mass lesions, uh, the uh, lacrimal and salivary gland which as rheumatologists we are very familiar with, when we have these other atypical sites of infiltrative lesions or we have sheathing of the vessels, um, uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis of course we are familiar with, so we must think of this possibility if other uh, things are excluded. And uh, uh, I think awareness about this disease amongst all specialities is important because uh, we more likely are going to get referrals from surgical referrals, even gynec referrals for this condition. So unless they are aware, they are not going to look for it. Uh, and uh, fever does occur in a minority of patients. It is an exclusion criteria in amongst the criteria. So I don't think that should be really so rigid. And um, that's it. <laughs> so. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rohini Saman, for such a nice and interesting cases. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Neil Rohit Paike, who is a young dynamic nephrologist, to deliver the next leg of this chapter. Thank you. Dr. Neil Rohit Peke is consultant nephrologist from Solapur, consultant at Yashodara Hospital and other multi-speciality hospital. He and his team has been credited for 50 and more renal tra transplants. I request Dr. Neil Rohit Peke to join the session and uh, discuss his experiences on IgG4 related diseases. Thank you. Good morning everyone, actually with the time constraint I am not going to show the slides because we have a very short period of time. I will just cover as Madam rightly said that awareness is very important in each branch uh, whether it could be rheumatology, gastroenterology or nephrology, neurology as well and uh, oncology, oncosurgery, in every field it is there. Uh, it was not, uh, the test was not readily available and the, even the histopathologists who were there earlier, uh, who were doing biopsies and everything, the staining for IgG4 was also not very strong or the, the suspicion with which the uh, biopsy was reported earlier was not very strong. But nowadays with the availability of the, um, the good uh, pathologist and the good staining pattern, Nowadays, we are seeing more and more number of cases with a diagnosis of IgG4-related disease. So this related disease can be in the kidney as well. For here, uh, I will just uh, tell that kidney, how kidney is involved in IgG4-related disease. It is not the routine picture of uh, renal failure or a proteinuria or a microscopic hematuria with which you should go ahead with the kidney biopsy. Because without kidney biopsy, not a single physician or a nephrologist will suspect this disease. When to do biopsy and when to do, when to suspect the patient with IgG4 RKD related kidney disease is very important because in these cases, the kidney is involved in only tubular and interstitial environment. Glomeruli are not at all involved. Very rarely IgG4 get deposited into um, glomeruli but 99 percent it is related to the tubules and interstitium of the kidney that is why you will not get anything in urine urine will completely bland you will just have the atn type of picture tubular necrosis type of picture with high levels of serum creatinine around 1 1.5 1, 1. to 2 1.8 2.5 2.4 and only unexplained renal failure is the indication 
for kidney biopsy for IgG for related kidney disease. In that case, when you will go ahead with the renal biopsy, you will get the tubulitis as well as interstitial nephritis as a presentation with IgG4 deposition in immunofluorescence. So in that case, when you will do serum IgG4 level, you, it will be on a higher side. And then you can label that patient as a IgG4 related kidney disease. When to do biopsy, when to suspect IgG, he patient will, may not have other symptoms which we have discussed uh, just now, lymphadenopathy or a severe weight loss, significant weight loss may or may not be there. So whenever there is unexplained renal failure, when you don't have any clue why this patient is having high levels of serum creatinine, I will advise we should go for renal biopsy, even though there is a no proteinuria. Proteinuria from 300 milligram per gram to 1 gram per gram, that is also an indication for kidney biopsy when your serum creatinine level is more than normal as per patient's body weight. So, in that case, when you will have the biopsy and when you will have the diagnosis, you can retrospectively send the IgG4 levels. The criteria of the treatment of the disease will be similar as uh, in any rheumatology case or any other um, IgG4 related disease case. But in ne uh, nephro or in renal failure related to IgG4, we use pulse steroid therapy, pulse methylprednisolone therapy followed by 1 milligram per kg per day uh, oral prednisolone which we taper over the period of 16 weeks, only 4 months. Within four, uh, 16 weeks, patient should have the response. If he will not have the response, you have to go ahead with another immunosuppression regimen. That is of course is rituximab. Again, the dose of rituximab in this case, whenever there is a kidney failure is different. It is not the same with other uh, cases of IgG4 related disease because the toxicity which will be there with the dose of rituximab when you will do CD19, CD20, even 200 milligram of rituximab will suffice. When you will do after 2 weeks CD19, CD20 ratio, it will be zero because of renal failure. The effect and the, the um, bioavailability will, which will be there with rituximab in routine cases when there is no renal failure, the accumulation of the drug which will be there and it will be very fast. So we monitor CD19, CD20 before giving second dose of rituximab in renal failure. And if it is zero, as I have told uh, in, with my cases, with 200 milligram of rituximab, even in transplant scenario, even in um, uh, patients with azotemia, you will have the result with the only 200 milligram of rituximab as well. So you have to personalize the dose, you have to uh, patient to patient the dose will vary. After rituximab you will have to wait and uh, around 80 to 90 percent patient will recover with rituximab. Here because the deposition is in the kidney, you may uh, not be dependent on the serum IgG4 levels to see whether the patient is in remission or not. Because in renal failure, you will have tubulitis and interstitial nephritis. That inflammation, that itis, I-T-I-S, that is the inflammation that should settle, that should settle. And if that will be settled, serum creatinine level will come down. Serum IgG4 levels will be normal, but serum creatinine will come down. So the criteria should be there to look for the creatinine and to look for the other symptoms related to IgG4 related disease. So that, that is my input from uh, nephro perspective and um, I am very much honored to have this, uh, to give this talk in front of you people and to give some awareness in related to kidney biopsy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful talk by Dr. Paike. Uh, let me uh, request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Neil Rohit Paike. Please. I request. Uh, I request Dr. Kansurkar if he has anything to add on this topic or he may share his experiences. Yeah. 
so IGG for related systematics is a newer entity and uh, it has uh, uh, recently been in focus especially with regards to retroperitoneal fibrosis and it, it has thrown surprises many a times uh, in our diagnosis and most importantly it's an entity which is easily treatable it's amenable to treatment so whenever possible you have IgG4 related system within your differential diagnosis if you could catch it you can actually treat the problem and cure the patient so that should always be kept in mind as a differential diagnosis and it has a capacity to mimic multiple rheumatic diseases simultaneously so uh, you have to be watchful about it thank you thank you, thank you very much for the panel thank you yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Questions are welcome. So I wanted to uh, ask you about your uh, strategy for using rituximab and using CD19. So even in other settings, apart from renal failure, how do you use this strategy? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like, what is the CD19 level at which you will uh, sort of yeah, actually, as I said earlier, that uh, the CD19, CD20 ratio will immediately come down with a very minimal dose of rituximab, even in a desensitization protocol when we use 200 milligram of rituximab. More than 50% to 70% reduction in the CD19, CD20 pre-rituximab and post-rituximab dose, or when you are planning to use the second dose of rituximab, say after 15 days or one month, uh, multiple protocols, multiple regimens are available with us with the dosing which, we, with, which is around 375 milligram per meter square. When you are using it every two weekly, then before uh, giving the second dose, usually you should do CD19, CD19. That, that is what I recommend because uh, in renal failure it is for sure you have to do it. But without renal failure also, some patient will respond, will give a response to the rituximab not likely the other patient but the dose will be it will vary as per the patient so i will advise to do it if it is more reduced more than 70 percent you can wait for next two weeks and then you can again use if you see the symptoms has recurred or uh, symptoms are not resolving then you can use the second dose of rituximab that's what i can suggest uh, in non-renal cases but in renal cases for sure we have to do it and uh, the result will be uh, very good with v even minimal dose of rituximab. So CD19, CD20, it is an anti-CD20. Initially we used to do, uh, send the levels of CD9, CD20 but it was not available in any lab. Nowadays we have absolute count as well as the percentage related to CD19 and CD20, both. So even you can do CD19 and CD20 together and you can see the response and it will be same. Both the percentage of CD19 as well as CD19 will be the, CD20 will be the same. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Gorse, sir, to felicitate all the chairman persons, please. Sorry. We move on to next session, uh, Osteoporosis and Rheumatic Diseases by Dr. Milind Aurangabadkar, sir. <coughs> he is Senior Consultant Rheumatologist from Nagpur. He has done MRCP in Medicine and Rheumatology. He is Fellow of Royal College of Physicians, London, and has worked as a Rheumatologist in King George Hospital, London. To chair the session, I request Dr. Anand Karvasar, orthopedician from Solapur, Dr. Raman Reddy, sir, physician from Udgir, and Dr. Rahish Ravindran, sir. Yeah. Good morning to all of you. Uh, I must thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, give this lecture on osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is rather a neglected subject uh, in rheumatology. 
you can uh, compare that to a uh, 12th man in a cricket match it only comes uh, when there's somebody's injured as we have until unless you have fracture we don't think of osteoporosis as a clinician and uh, uh, this is outline of my talk uh, basic concepts of osteoporosis and then uh, in the prototype of our uh, rheumatology practice we have these three common diseases i'm going to cover only these three and then important about uh, glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis and then uh, some principles of management it's difficult to cover everything in this uh, 15 minutes time but i'll try and do my best now what does osteoporosis mean literally means porous bones that the bones uh, the micro architecture of the bone uh, its deterioration in micro architecture as well as this low bone mass that means the weight of the bone itself is low and then the bone strength is compromised and then you have more tendency for fractures and it's a silent disease until it is complicated by fracture so our att attention is not drawn to the disease until unless you have a fracture and if you don't take it seriously until the fracture occurs and what are the types of osteoporosis one is primary which is to do with the age and then the most common is the postmenopausal so these are to do with the hormonal um, influences and the secondary causes we have our rheumatoid uh, rheumatological diseases and the steroid use myeloma and gi disorders and drugs so we'll be focusing on the secondary aspect not the primary but mind you most of the guidelines and uh, you know all the research goes on in postmenopausal osteoporosis and not in the secondary osteoporosis now what is the indian perspective about osteoporosis uh, there is very poor awareness among the people in india about osteoporosis on the lighter note i can say that about uh, in india if you think of how many people uh, pay the income tax it's about 4% of the indian population and awareness of osteoporosis is about 5 to 7% so they are still do better as compared to people who pay income tax and calcium and vitamin d deficiency is very common in india and uh, there is also a problem of early menopause and increased longevity uh, now the life expectancy in india is about 67 years which is bound to increase to 71 by 2025 so we are living longer but the osteoporosis itself is a aging disease so the bone quality is bound to deteriorate so that is the reason that longevity of you know the life uh, you are more prone to develop osteoporosis and then we also have a problem of diagnostic facilities the dexa scan is not available in the rural areas even in uh, big cities it only available maybe in two or three places so it's difficulty to diagnose as well and then indian women uh, you know they have genetic predisposition they have lower bone mass and in one in five women uh, above 50 they have osteoporosis and worldwide if you see it's one in three uh, women and one in eight men have osteoporosis how does it occur osteoporosis there is a constant it's a like a turnover of the bone you have bone formation on one side and bone resorption on the other side in the adolescent and young uh, adult age the osteoblastic activity takes predominance so you have more bone building which occurs until the age of 30 after that there is slow decline in the bone health which sometimes does get accelerated because of the disease process which uh, we treat which is inflammatory arthritis and later on with age and with menopause now what is the pathophysiology it's all to do with bone remodeling the remodeling process constantly goes on throughout our life depending on various situations mechanical stress hormonal factors then diseases intracurrent illness and then steroid use so these uh, things do affect the bone remodeling either in positive manner or in negative manner so the bone remodeling it maintains the architecture and the strength of the bone and also regulates the calcium level because we know the pth has strong influence on the bone now what are the key players in bone remodeling if we consider resorption the key players are osteoclast rank ligand sclerostin and dk k1 and in bone formation you have osteoblast and osteoprotegerin if you look at the bone cell there are essentially three types of cells osteoblast osteoclast and osteocytes 
Osteocytes are specialized uh, osteoblasts which are embedded in the bone matrix and then they orchestrate the various um, uh, 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 remodeling steps. Now this is a uh, cycle of the uh, uh, bone remodeling. On one side you have the bone formation, on this side you have bone resorption. And uh, this is active osteoclast. Osteoclasts are nothing but specialized macrophages. And then the, their job is to re remove the bone and then so that uh, the next cycle the osteoblasts are able to deposit the matrix and make the bone stronger. So this cycle goes on throughout our life and whatever diseases and drugs they act on this uh, remodeling cycle and so either they increase the osteoclast so that the bone resorption is more or what the, our aim is to try and increase the bone formation where we want to prevent osteoporosis. So essentially whatever disease you can consider it's do with the bone remodeling. Now uh, the main uh, aspect of the bone uh, health is to have the peak bone mass in your young age. Now the problem with these days is um, uh, the dietary habits, uh, lack of exercise and then alcohol and smoking. These things uh, they reduce the uh, peak bone mass so that means that in eventually later on in life you are likely to have osteoporosis at a younger age now this is a, a graph of the age and then the bone mass if you look at the bone mass which is one uh, approximately 1.5 uh, kg and then uh, this peak bone mass is genetically predetermined so if you have a healthy lifestyle you have a good diet you do exercise and then you don't indulge in bad habits you can achieve the peak bone mass which your body you know you genetically you are you know bound to develop but if you don't have that then the peak bone mass becomes reduced in this is diagram for the male and female in male if you look at this age of 30 years the, the peak bone mass after that there's a gradual decline and subsequently if you look at the woman after the menopause there's a gra rapid decline in bone mass which is cause of the postmenopausal osteoporosis. Now, what are the risk factors of osteoporosis? There are major risk factors. It's a history of fracture in adult, fragility fracture in first degree relative, and postmenopausal woman, low body weight, smoking, and use of steroid for more than three months. And the additional factors are early menopause and poor uh, health or frailty, uh, and then uh, low calcium intake and alcohol. So whenever you assess any patient with osteoporosis, you have to look at the risk factors. And in each and every case, depending on the risk factors and some other um, parameters, so we decide about treatment. Now how to diagnose osteoporosis? Now in laboratory, this mainly is useful for secondary causes of osteoporosis, which is very important if you are evaluating someone with a premenopausal age. So before jumping to conclusion about osteoporosis, you have to look at secondary causes. And then skeletal x-rays are only useful when you are dealing with a possible vertebral fracture, somebody comes with back pain and you have to make sure that there is no fracture or there is some deformities in the uh, spine that you want to evaluate. Now what are the specific tests for osteoporosis? The gold standard is a DEXA scan which is a dual energy x-ray absorptiometry. And uh, some cases bone density scan in the DEXA may not be useful especially where you have uh, ankylosing spondylitis where there is excess bone deposition or in cases where you have degenerative arthritis giving you falsely high reading of DEXA. So in those situations you can use a high resolution peripheral quantitative CT scan or trabecular bone score. These are mainly used in research setting and not available widespread. Now what is the utility of DEXA scan? It detects osteoporosis uh, well in advance so you can take preventive measures to prevent osteoporosis. And then when you put someone on treatment, you can monitor the response to treatment by the DEXA scan. And it is uh, the, the report of the DEXA scan comes in either T-score or Z-score. T-score is uh, compared with a uh, young adult so that you know how much is the bone loss as compared to young adult and their score is uh, age match person. So in a premenopausal uh, woman we would normally look for a Z score. Now this is a classification of uh, osteoporosis as per the WHO criteria. I must say that this classification is to do with the postmenopausal osteoporosis and this may not apply to our patients who are relatively younger age especially patients with lupus who are in the childbearing age. 
and this is a normal bone density scan we look for here is the dark uh, the red is uh, severe osteoporosis the green is normal and the yellow is in between is osteopenia now this is a dexa scan showing severe osteoporosis where you see the dot here in the red which is severe osteoporosis now this is a osteopenia which is in the yellow when you see a report with a dot in the yellow which is osteopenia so what you have to make sure that the the dot doesn't go in the red uh, zone and it stays in the yellow or maybe goes in the green zone which is uh, better bone strength now frax is a tool uh, designed by the university of sheffield to assess the 10 year risk of fractures and it is uh, it combines uh, various risk factors uh, and it gives probability of uh, risk fractures of uh, the hip and major osteoporotic fractures now why 10 years because our experience of the uh, bisphosphonate and other drugs is only limited to 10 years we don't know the safety of the drugs beyond 10 years and uh, uh, there are some drawbacks of this uh, uh, frax assessment it is only appli applicable to age group of between 40 to 90 so if you have someone age of 35 you cannot use a frax score although if you, you, you do use the score and use the uh, the va values it will show the frax score of someone who is age of 40 so this is uh, if you go on online just uh, click on frax tool and then uh, put india then you have it hardly takes 2 minutes very easy to do and then you can calculate the frax score for risk, risk assessment in the areas where dexa scans are not readily available you can very use, easily use a frax tool now if we move on to the rheumatoid arthritis and osteoporosis now uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients they always have this background of uh, conventional risk factors such as age gender on top of that they have other factors which is inflammatory state and glucocorticoid use and immobility and sarcopenia which is loss of muscle the thinning of the muscles because muscle strength is very important because it gives uh, pressure uh, it, it gives strain on the bone and then activates the osteocytes in the bone so active exercise uh, it influences the osteocyte function and it improves the bone strength so loss of muscle mass is a risk factor for osteoporosis so what is the burden of uh, rheumat uh, osteoporosis in rheumatoid the prevalence is about 18 to 56% now anti ccp is a independent risk factor for bone loss there are some studies which show that patient with psoriatic arthritis who have positive anti ccp have greater bone loss as compared to patient with psoriatic arthritis who are anti ccp negative so it has direct effect on osteoclast at 60% of higher risk in osteoporosis in ra as compared to controls and then two fold increase in males with ra as compared to controls and steroid use doubles the risk of osteoporosis now cortical sites are more susceptible to bone loss cortical sites is, is like for example neck of femur as compared in lupus patient where the trabecular bone which is vertebra which is more involved as compared to the uh, cortical sites and cortical bones are supposed to be stronger than the trabecular bone so fracture risk is more in vertebra because it trabecular bone and less in uh, hip because it has more, more cortical bone the bone loss in our we are all familiar with the uh, x ray of the hands which you do look for osteopenia osteopenia is because of the osteoclast acting on the bone uh, the periarticular sites causing resorption so we have the picture of showing periarticular osteopenia this is due to chronic inflammation cytokine release and increase in um, rank ligand with bone resorption now we look at some remodeling uh, uh, players in uh, ra i mind you these are uh, common in all other diseases as well now receptor activator for nuclear factor kappa ligand rank ligand now the bottom line is its levels are increase in rheumatoid and it has positive effect on osteoclast and negative on osteoblast so it, it is responsible for uh, osteoporosis with uh, action on osteoclast now other two key players are dkk1 which increases the bone loss and uh, sclerostin which uh, inhibits the bone formation so in various rheumatological diseases we have interplay between the inflammatory cytokines and these bone remodeling players to cause osteoporosis now we have looked at the uh, the agents which cause osteoclast uh, activation now we have another one which osteoprotegerin which increases the bone strength so what is the therapeutic implication if you block the rank ligand with denosumab which can reduce osteoporosis by it can reduce the bone resorption
I'll just clip some. Now, in SLE, we have osteoporosis uh, because of various reasons. We have inflammatory cytokines, we have immunolog immunological factors, metabolic factors. Then, in addition to that, we also have the, tra the traditional factors and hormonal factors and use of steroids. Now, if you look at this diagram, there are various ways and means which you have uh, the hormonal factors, then disease activity, use of steroids, low vitamin D because we use photoprotection. All of them, they lead to osteoporosis risk in addition to the usual risk factors. So, people with uh, patient with SLE are at more at risk of developing osteoporosis. I'll just skip a few slides. Now, in spondyloarthritis, the prevalence is 19 to 62 percent. Low bone mass and fractures are well known complications in spondyloarthritis. Now, DEXA scan may be misleading in ankylosing spondylitis because of uh, newborn formation and aberrant osteohyperostosis. Uh, so, we have uh, some other techniques which we, we can use is quantitative CT and uh, quantitative ultrasound. Now, uh, the patients who have increased acute phase reactants and radiographic sacroiliitis and uh, MRI defined bone marrow edema are at risk of osteoporosis in patients who have spondyloarthritis. The glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis. This is the commonest cause of secondary osteoporosis, osteoporosis under age of 50, and iatrogenic bone loss. The glucocorticoids, say, although they are useful to treat the underlying disease, they affect the bone remodeling, they also cause muscle atrophy, and the death result is uh, increased risk of fractures. Now, all patients with glucocorticoid uh, should be on calcium and vitamin D irrespective of the dose and duration of the steroid. And the patient who have increased risk factors or low BMD or increased risk on FRAC score should be considered for uh, resorptive therapy. Either uh, prevention, which means you start the therapy at the beginning of the steroid treatment or maybe within three months, uh, which is a, a treatment uh, of the osteoporosis. I'll just skip some slides. Now, drug therapy options, we have anti resorptive therapy. The highlighted ones are bisphosphonate and denozumab, and bone forming agents are teriparatide. Now, treatment summary, bisphosphonates are the um, uh, first drug of choice. IV zoledronate because of it uh, does not cause any GI upset. It's only once a year, the patient compliance is better. So, we can use IV zoledronate. Second line would be injection denozumab every six months or teriparatide. There are new drugs which are available is abaloparatide, which is better action as compared to teriparatide. It causes less bone resorption, more bone formation. And romozumim, romozo, romosozumab, which is a sclerosin inhibitor, which has action on, it is a, a, a positive effect on osteoblast and negative effect on osteoclast. So, it's the ideal drug. I'll just uh, go to the summary now. The, what, what we have to do as a rheumatologist is to create awareness among uh, the uh, patients about osteoporosis and ensure the patient has adequate uh, calcium and vitamin D intake and achieve optimal control of the disease activity so that the inflammatory cytokines are less. Use DEXA and FRAC score to identify high risk patients and discuss treatment options with the patient and uh, preventive programs to be developed for patients at risk and patient with osteoporosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Aurangabadkar, sir, for strengthening our knowledge on osteoporosis. I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Aurangabadkar, sir.
esteemed speakers if they can finish their lecture in time today we would like to uh, have one or two uh, questions after each session so that the chairperson can also share their experiences on the topic and even the audience can ask questions so again it is a humble request uh, to the speakers please abide to the time moving on to the next session which is on myositis for the first lecture on clinical relevance of and specific antibodies i request dr wasim kazi sir to come on dais um, for the chairing session i request uh, dr pritesh agrawal sir neurologist from solapur dr anup chikmurge sir physician from udgir and dr avinash buche sir Dr. Wasim Kazi is consultant rheumatologist from Kolhapur. He has done UGN PG from BJ Medical College Pune and has done DNB rheumatology from Medanta the Medicity Gurgaon. Hello, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, first, be before beginning the lecture, I would like to uh, thank the organizers, uh, API Solapur and uh, MRA for inviting me for this uh, talk. And before I begin, I would like to say that uh, this particular topic is due for another session, but I will try to cover this as uh, in a given time as possible. So uh, before be next. So uh, before we begin, this is the timeline for classification of IM. In 1887, there was initially polymyositis was identified and coming to 2022, we have various different uh, types of myositis such as dermatomyositis, uh, polymyositis, immune-mediated necrotizing myositis, non-specific myositis, etc. So uh, for diagnosing myositis, we do proximal muscle, we uh, have the patient with proximal muscle weakness with or without a rash of uh, dermatomyositis specific uh, rash, uh, raised muscle enzymes while doing the uh, the serol, uh, doing the lab investigations of the patients along with that the muscle biopsy showing sp uh, specific findings and lastly uh, the EMG and NCV showing myopathic pattern and MRI showing muscle inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I would not go into the details of diagnosing and the specificity of the what are the various uh, uh, biopsy features of each individual myositis types. But uh, initially, originally, um, Bohan and Peter classification had told primary my polymyositis, primary dermatomyositis, uh, myositis with connective tissue disorders and myositis associated cancer as the original classification. Later, we modified the Bohan and Peter uh, classification using the term entity called as overlap myositis, where we used to diagnose it uh, where there was at least one clinical uh, overlaps feature. And now, we have come to the novel clinico serological classification where we have during the uh, overlap myositis at least one clinical feature of the overlap uh, symptoms and or myositis uh, antibodies. So in myositis patients have multiple subtypes, they have multiple associated diseases, they have multiple organ involve involvement and also multiple uh, and autoantibodies. So whether this is a this adds to the confusion or this is a final conclusion in the diagnosis of myositis, let us see. The autoantibodies in myositis are divided into myositis specific autoantibodies MSAs and myositis associated antibodies MAAs. Uh, now the emerging terminology for this is myositis spectrum disease anti, uh, autoantibodies and since 1976 we have come a long way uh, uh, from the initial di uh, identification of anti me 2 antibody in a dermatomyositis patient and now we are having in IBM patients diagnosing with anti CN1A antibodies. 
Now, why we would like to focus on autoantibodies? Because they may help us to determine the disease association, the clinical presentation, and hint at underlying malignancies, whether they are going to present along with the disease or not. Also, each individual will generate only one type of myositis-specific antibodies. These are uh, single autoantigens, and they enable us to accurately diagnose a specific clinical phenotype uh, associated with each different uh, myositis specific antibodies. So this is a paper which shows that a newer approach to the classification of uh, inflammatory myositis uh, where myositis specific antibodies define a useful homogeneous group of patients. Along with that these antibodies are mutually exclusive. So presence of one myositis specific antibody is usually not associated with presence of any other uh, myositis specific antibody. They may be associated with myositis associated antibodies and therefore they give a specific clinical phenotype and homogeneous group for treatment in these patients. This is an image where uh, we can see the myositis uh, patients are uh, having Myositis uh, patients are having different types of antibodies. The group on left usually depicts myositis specific antibodies which are not usually associated with any other disease group. And uh, PMSCL, Q antibody, SSA, SSB, etc. antibodies are myositis associated antibodies which are also associated with other connective tissue diseases or other rheumatological uh, diseases. Now, myositis spectrum disease uh, autoantibodies is a new terminology as I have already told. Now, coming to the re repertoire of various myositis specific and myositis associated antibodies, coming to initial group of uh, um, overlap myositis, which is the most common myositis, where we can see MSAs like anti synthetase antibodies, anti Jovan, and non Jovan group, and MDFI antibodies are usually classified as having uh, overlap myositis. Uh, myositis specific antibodies and myositis associated antibodies we have a huge list of certain antibodies such as anti UNRNP antibody, anti PMSCL antibody, anti Q, anti CNP, AB etc. So in dermatomyositis we have certain myositis specific antibodies such as anti Me2 antibody, anti SAE, anti TIF1 gamma, anti NSP2. In uh, necrotizing myositis, we have HMG coenzyme A reductase antibodies, anti SRP antibodies, and anti SMN antibodies. And novel uh, recently discovered and myositis specific antibody, uh, anti CN1A associated with IBM. So, what is the difference between these two? Usually, myositis specific antibodies are anti cytoplasmic antibodies, and uh, these are antibodies associated with ILD and um, clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis but not with cancers. Also anti-nuclear antibodies are usually myositis associated antibodies and they usually are associated with some uh, associated uh, CTD like features. So point of interest in identifying these myositis specific antibodies are specific syndromes associated with this, predisposition toward a specific organ involvement, association with underlying malignancy, associated connective tissue disease and what is the prognosis, whether they define different prognosis in different types of antibody profiles. Now coming to the first of such syndrome is antisynthetase, which is a most common myositis related phenotypes. It is associated with myositis, obviously, ILD, mechanics, hand, spirexia, Reynolds phenomenon and arthritis. They may have features of polymyositis or dermatomyositis. Uh, that means they may or may not have rash associated with it and one or more features of other connective tissue disease. Anti Jovan is most common antisynthetase syndrome antibodies and usually found in 19% of uh, idiopathic inflammatory myositis and remaining antibodies are seen in 3.5% of the patients. It is rare in uh, juvenile uh, uh, patients and it usually is associated with good prognosis. The dictum uh, is not all patients with antisynthetase syndrome ultimately develop myositis but nearly all of these patients will eventually develop ILD. Uh, I will not go into the prevalence of organ involvement, but usually anti one PL7 and EJ uh, have predilection towards muscle disease and anti PL7, KS, OJ, PL12 have predilection towards ILD development. Now coming to the immune mediated necrotizing myopathy, uh, which is also called as necrotizing autoimmune myositis. 
एच एम जी कोइंज एम ए रिडक्टिज एंटीबॉडी एस आर पी एंटीबॉडी एंड एंटी एस एम एन एंटीबॉडी दीज थ्री एंटीबॉडीज आर एसोसिएटेड विथ दिस पर्टिक्युलर फिनो टाइप दे हैव मार्क मायोफाइबर नेक्रोसिस विथ मिनिमल स्कैंड इन्फ्लेमेटरी इन्फिल्ट्रेट्स ऑन द बायोप्सी दे ऑजल यूजली हैव अ प्रोफाउंड मसल वीकनेस एंड दे आर यूजली रेजिस्टेंस टू द कन्वेंशनल इम्यूनो सप्रेजन ट्रीटमेंट दिस पेशेंट वेन एसोसिएटेड विथ एंटी एस आर पी एंटीबॉडी यूजली हैव डिसफेजिया और आई एल डी ऑल्सो so we can see in this image that if hmg coenzyme a reductase antibodies when they are associated with the statin exposure which is uncommon presentation they are not usually associated with uh, um, cancer but when they are without any statin exposure they can be associated with cancer also this uh, necrotizing auto antibodies when they are present they, there is uh, negative association with the cancer but when a phenotype of the patient is necrotizing myositis but without presence of antibodies there is increased association with the cancer which is seen hmg coenzyme a reductase antibodies is seen with statin use in 40 to 60% of the patient 2% of the population usually have this particular gene which have higher risk with statin myopathy and uh, these srp and hmg coenzyme a reductase these are rare in juvenile dermatomyositis but when they are present they are associated with severe and resistant disease uh, there is another new antibody which is found in uh, necrotizing myositis which is called as four and half limb domain antibody anti fhl1 usually these patients have muscle atrophy dysphagia pronounced muscle fiber damage and vasculitis and this fhl1 mutation in certain patient can also called cause hereditary myopathies now another syndrome is ilds associated with myositis and most common antibodies in ilds are anti synthetase syndrome antibodies uh, along with that pmscl and mdf5 are also uh, antibodies associated with ild mdf5 in particularly can cause rapidly progressive ild with a high associated mortality also anti synthetase antibodies when they are associated with ssa and ssb they can also lead to a rapidly progressing ild and cause high mortality ILD may be the first presentation of the myositis MDF5 is usually uh, seen in japanese patients and usually associated with clinically a uh, myopathic dermatomyositis now jo1 when present in anti synthetase syndrome has a better survival as compared to other anti synthetase antibodies like pl7 and pl12 and mdf5 is uh, when uh, present in juvenile dermatomyositis it is usually seen in 40% of the affected children mdf5 also have a peculiar cutaneous ulcers in uh, uh, presentation which is due to the systemic vasculopathy Uh, now the uh, clinically a uh, myopathic dermatomyositis the characteristic cutaneous disease may occur in absence of any clinical evidence of muscle involvement and usually anti mdf5 and anti sae antibodies are associated with this particular uh, phenotype patients with anti sae antibody typically go on to develop muscle involvement several months after the onset of the disease and association of uh, clinically a uh, myopathic dermatomyositis anti mdf5 uh, antibodies with rapidly progressive il disease most commonly reported in japanese and uh, asian population now uh, cancer associated uh, myositis usually the cancer develops 3 to 5 years after the onset of myositis seen in 10 to 20% of the pm uh, polymyositis or dermatomyositis patient usually the patients are more than 65 age most commonly dermatomyositis is the clinical presentation 80% of the case, patients they, there is association with tif1 gamma antibodies and uh, NM, nxp2 antibodies with cancer and tif1 gamma antibodies when they are associated with tif1 alpha antibodies they lead to pre increased predisposition to the uh, cancer in children these antibodies occur uh, only as a tif1 gamma and they usually are not associated with the cancer uh, cancer associated myositis does not seem to have tif1 gamma when they are they are present less than 40 years of patient they do not have to be associated with increased risk of malignancy they are also seen as i discussed in juvenile dermatomyositis up to 33% of the patient and in children there is no increased risk of malignancy nxp2 also seen in ju juvenile dermatomyositis with no risk uh, of associated malignancy uh juvenile dermatomyositis this is usually uh, a muscle disease typically associated with a progressive cutaneous disease uh, 
TIF-1 gamma, NXP2, MDFI antibodies nearly are present in 50% of the patients. TIF-1 gamma and NXP2 when they are associated, they are associated with more severe cutaneous disease and chronic disease scores. ILD and malignancy is less common in juvenile dermatomyositis and calcinosis is more common and GI involvement is more common. Calcinosis especially is associated with the anti-NXP2 group. So this image particularly depicts the summary of all the uh, myositis and characteristics, uh, myositis typical phenotypes like classical adult dermatomyositis is associated with Me2 antibody, adult dermatomyositis TIF1 gamma anti SAE antibody and TIF1 gamma and NXP2 when they are associated they are associated with increased risk of neoplasia and severe disease. Similarly, in juvenile dermatomyositis, we can see TIF1 uh, gamma antibody and NXP2 antibodies are associated. These are associated with severe disease, calcinosis, but not associated with any risk of cancer. Now coming to the inclusion body myositis, we all know it is more common in male and has a different pattern of presentation with distal, predominantly distal uh, weakness, typically insidious in onset, most of the patient initially are diagnosed as a polymyositis and later on they are found to have uh, no response to treatment and on biopsy they turn out to be having uh, um, inclusion body myositis. So there is a delay in diagnosis of these patients. These patients usually have cytosolic 5-nucleotidase uh, 1A that CN1A antibodies which are found in 30 to 50 percent of the patient and they have increased risk of mortality in these patients. These initially were told to be myositis specific antibodies but later on these were found to be associated with other connective tissue diseases like uh, SLE and Sjogren's syndrome. So uh, these are now called as myositis associated antibodies. So how the autoantibodies we can take them to our advantage. The myositis specific antibodies are highly specific diagnostic tool, they are useful, pro they give useful prognostic information, they guide regarding further investigation in search for associated malignancy or associated CTD, they may predict the treatment resistance as we discussed previously, they may predict a response to B cell depletion, this uh, in this uh, original article where the response to uh, rituximab by presence of various antibodies like, such as anti jo one anti tf one gamma, anti me 2 antibodies were associated with a better response in these patients. Uh, CPK level usually correlate with the disease activity but, but uh, not all the patients have muscle dominant disease and some of the patients the CPK may not correlate with the disease response. So it was also evaluated whether the antibody levels can predict the outcome of the disease in these patients. So this particular pa uh, paper shows uh, anti jo one antibody levels correlate with the disease activity and treatment had fall in these le levels of these activities. Antibodies also can predict the organ involvement. This particular image shows like uh, Typical dermatomyositis is associated with Me2, NXP2, MDFI antibodies. Lung disease in uh, lung involvement is predicted by antisynthetase, anti-MDFI antibodies. Arthritis is seen in anti uh, antisynthetase antibodies. Severe myopathy uh, can be seen in HMG, coenzyme A, uh, reductase antibody, anti-SRP antibodies, etc. So we can predict the organ involvement also with these antibodies. So finally, to conclude this lecture, uh, the antibodies do not add up the confusion. They do not also give a uh, conclusion, but it, they lead to a conviction and a strong conviction precedes great actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Wasim Kazi, sir. <laughs>
So uh, what is refractory myositis? So against arthritis, myositis is actually a difficult disease to treat because many of our patients do have refractory disease and frequent relapses. So how do we diagnose a refractory myositis? Whenever we diagnose an inflammatory myositis, all of our patients are started on a high dose steroid. So all the patients we put on 1 mg per kg steroid. If the patient has severe myositis, we also give pulse solumedrol for 3 to 5 days. Usually at the onset of the disease only, we start a first line immunosuppression which can be methotrexate, azathioprine or mycophenolate. Most of us are, uh, use methotrexate as the first line of treatment. The dose, is tap the dose of steroid is tapered only later after 4 to 6 weeks. So what is refractory myositis? So when there is an unfavorable response to a combination of uh, uh, at least one immunosuppressant in a proper dose with adequate steroid dose for a period of 3 months, then we call that the patient has refractory myositis. So once we know that the uh, patient has refractory myositis, we need to evaluate the causes of the refractory myositis. So is there actual active inflammation or is there residual damage due to the past inflammation? So as most of us know that our myositis patients many times come to us late. There is a delay in the diagnosis for around 3 to 4 months by the time they reach us. So many of them develop a muscle atrophy. So we need to know whether there is active disease or a residual damage which is leading to the refractory disease or whether the patient has mimics of myopathy like a muscular dystrophy or a steroid myopathy due to your steroid dose or an undiagnosed malignancy. So how do we differentiate between this? Now the serology like CPK, LDH, SGOT, they may normalize very fast with the steroid dose faster than the clinical response. So when patients come to us on follow-up, their CPK which was in thousands has come down to almost normal. But clinically you feel many times there is not much improvement in the patient's power. So what will help us here? So we have this modality called MRI myositis protocol in which there is a stir sequences of all the muscles from the neck to the thigh. This can efficiently pick up the muscle edema and tell us that the patient has an active disease. They also say that we can do a repeat biopsy but we don't do this usually because of the cost, it's not very cost effective. So now once you know that the patient has a residual disease because of an active inflammation, what are the next line of treatment, what other modalities you can use. So the list is huge, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, IVIG, uh, calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, tofacitinib and ACTH gel. Now how do we choose what to use? So as Dr. Kazi mentioned in his talk, uh, the myositis specific antibodies can help us choose the drug of choice. The clinical features of the patient can guide us towards the drug of choice. And finally it is an individual opinion you have to take a call case per case. So there is no definite protocol of what to use when. The, now rituximab, it is generally the preferred treatment which most of us use in refractory myositis. Positive antibodies on the myositis protocol panel predict a good response. So especially if the patients have a Jovan antibody or a Me2 antibody, it predicts a good response to giving rituximab. When there is presence of anti-MDA5 uh, antibody, this predicts a rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease. So in such patients, when you do not see a response in 2-3 to three months, you should be fast in switching over to a next line therapy like rituximab. The dose of rituximab like in all other conditions is usually give, we give 1 gram, 2 doses 15 days apart. Again the maintenance dose, there is no fixed protocol, you may decide it on the CD19 antibodies or may repeat a dose after 6 months, again there is no recommendations for this. IVIG, now the main if, uh, problem in using IVIG is the cost, otherwise IVIG is very rapidly acting an effective mode of therapy in uh, refractory myositis. It is generally used when the patient is having a rapid deterioration in spite of giving a good dose of steroids and especially the role of IVIG is proven when there is a refractory esophageal involvement. So when there is dysphagia, it can be even used as a first line of treatment if the patient is affording for IVIG. 
especially when our patients have an active infection and when you cannot increase the immunosuppression, you cannot give rituximab or when the patients have a very high diabetes and you are not being able to give a high dose steroids, you can consider giving IVIG. The statin-induced necrotizing myopathy, which is associated with anti-HMG coil reductase antibody, in these patients, it can be even considered as a monotherapy, as an alternative to the other modes of treatment. The dose of IVIG usually, like in other conditions, is 2 gram per kg to be given in divided doses over 3 to 5 days. And you have to give it for around 3 to 6 months. Again, the main issue is the cost. So many of us give it for around 2 cycles and then let the other immunosuppressions take over. Cyclophosphamide is actually a very cost-effective treatment for refractory myositis, especially when the patients have other things like a severe ILD or a systemic vasculitis, it should be considered as the mode of choice. Uh, it can be given with rituximab in patients who have severe ILD. So just to mention about this, I had a patient of very severe myositis whom, he, whom I had used IVIG also because the patient had dysphagia and respiratory weakness also. The patient didn't respond too well even to IVIG and on treatment this patient got a retinal vasculitis, bilateral retinal vasculitis and almost lost vision in the eye and that time we started on cyclophosphamide and after cyclophosphamide the patient's myositis also went into complete remission as in, in remission now since the past 5 years. So it's a really good drug to use. Uh, tacrolimus and cyclosporin are calcineurin inhibitors. They are generally used when there is an associated active ILD. Also, whenever there is anti-synthesis antibody, they may show a good response to these agents. However, they have their own uh, side effects like hypertension, nephrotoxicity, and hence they should be given in a monitored fashion. Now, the Brahmastra in rheumatology. Uh, so, tofacitinib, wherever you, whatever diseases you take, tofacitinib has come in the in that disease. So, similarly, even in myositis, tofacitinib has been used in refractory myositis. There are good results in small trials. There are no large trials yet. However, they have been shown some promising results and considering the cost effectiveness, if larger trials come, it may be useful in future in patients of refractory myositis. The dose what we use is in other conditions, 5 milligram twice daily. Plasma exchange again is more used as a rescue therapy. So when patients you have severe, uh, uh, severe myositis or severe ILD, you have given something like a rituximab and cyclophosphamide steroids and you are awaiting the response, it can be used as a bridging therapy while awaiting response to your other drugs. Especially in necrotizing myositis with anti-SRP or anti-HMG-CR antibody, plasma exchange may be of useful nature. Uh, ACTH gel, we, it's not available here, we don't use. It is uh, given subcutaneously twice weekly and it does not act only as a steroid. It in fact causes steroidogenesis and also has an immunomodulatory effect. It does not have the side effects of steroids, like it does not cause Cushing's faces and steroid, I mean water retention, but uh, never used before. So to complete the list, there are many agents which we can use as an experimental therapy like leflunamide, abatacep, TNF blocker like infliximab, anathenra and tocilizumab. However, they all come later if your other things also fail. Coming to malignancy screen, now, as Dr. Kazi uh, also mentioned that there is a strong association of myositis with malignancy. Cancer-associated myositis is when the patient develops a malignancy within three years. So it can be preceding or following the diagnosis of myositis. Almost 10 to 15 percent of the patients of myositis have an associated malignancy. So we have to actively screen for malignancy. Most of these patients will not have any symptom of malignancy at presentation. Again, there are no specific recommendations. All they say is you should do age-specific screening as per the age, you decide whatever you have to screen. There are some predictors of malignancy in myositis. So older age of a patient, male sex, the TIF1 gamma positivity, NXP2 positivity, and the other antibodies coming negative, they may predict a malignancy and may uh, prompt us to do a more active workup for malignancy. 
the myotomyositis has more malignancy association than polymyositis so actually initially we used to do many tests to for a malignancy screen but at present we would advise that wherever possible and where there is a way you can do a pet ct you should go directly for a pet ct because it will pick up all the malignancies which are needed a mammography when needed things like colonoscopy we do not do on all our patients unless they have any symptoms and you are suspecting something then you can go ahead with a colonoscopy also in the female patients who have myositis because uh, ca ovary is one of the common association a ca 125 may be done in the places where you do not have a pet ct then a ct chest abdo pelvis with contrast should be done but this should be done at least once when we diagnose a patient of myositis they also say it should be done every year where there are high predictors of malignancy but at least once everything should be done so we are going to take home the delicious solapuri chutney but i think we should take home these messages that uh, aggressive treatment of myositis should be done as soon as you diagnose the disease we should be fast to switch to a second line treatment when your first line treatment is not working choose the drug based on the clinical features and if you have the antibodies then the antibody positivity you should screen every patient actively for malignancy thank you thank you very much madam may i request all chair persons oh, okay okay sir in addition actually uh, emg is also very much helpful when we do an emg we look for four points one is a insertional activity spontaneous activity the motor unit potentials and the recruitment or the interference pattern so uh, the insertional activity will be increased as again in an inflammatory uh, myopathy as against the steroid induced myopathy and uh, even the spontaneous activity will be there in the form of positive sharp waves and fibrillation potentials which will be absent in a patient who is refractory because of a steroid myopathy so that in additional will probably help to differentiate whether we go for a, a second line or third line therapy or come down with the steroids that's one thing so emg will help uh, in addition to the mrs stir images which you correctly uh, mentioned thank you sir thank you i request uh, all chair persons to felicitate madam thank you to come on dais for his lecture on juvenile dermatomyositis he is consultant rheumatologist from mumbai ular certified in rheumatic diseases and pediatric rheumatology presently affiliated to byl nair charitable hospital mumbai good morning respected teachers and my dear friends uh, and uh, at the outset i would like to thank organizing committee for having given me this opportunity to discuss about treatment modalities in juvenile dermatomyositis uh, this would be the outline of my presentation in the beginning i shall briefly discuss the armamentarium in the treatment of juvenile uh, therapeutic armamentarium in the treatment of juvenile dermatomyositis followed by a brief discussion on various treatment modalities for calcinosis which is a bothersome problem in uh, children with uh, this condition and uh, lastly follow with uh, uh, cara ctp cara stands for childhood arthritis and uh, rheumatology research association ctp uh, consensus treatment plan for jdm and uh, the share guidelines for this condition
As we all know, the mainstay of pharmacological treatment of Juven and Dermatomyositis is a combination therapy consisting of glucocorticoids and other immunosuppressive agents. Uh, these immunosuppressive agents uh, comprise of first-line agents such as methotrexate, intravenous immunoglobulin and cyclosporin. The second-line or third-line therapies which are used mainly for patients with refractory disease or severe disease include the non-biologic medications such as mycophenolate, mofetil, azathioprine, tacrolimus and cyclophosphamide as well as biological therapies such as rituximab, abatacept and TNF inhibitors. Patients are also given non-pharmacological therapy in the form of physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise regimen and sun protection measures. So glucocorticoids are the cornerstone of treatment and the methods of administration may vary from oral high-dose glucocorticoid that is prednisolone 2 mg per kg per day in milder cases or to pulse steroid that is intravenous methyl prednisolone which is normally dosed at 15 to 30 mg per kg per day and given over 3 to 5 consecutive days. Uh, this is usually used in patients with moderate to severe as well as ulcerative disease. Also it is important to bear in mind that uh, gastrointestinal vasculopathy may limit the absorption of oral medication, hence uh, intravenous methylprednisolone may be preferred in these settings. Uh, there are various uh, protocols regarding tapering of steroids. Uh, one such protocol uh, advocated by CARA. Uh, the steroids are normally tapered from 4 weeks onwards and uh, there is a goal of discontinuation of steroids by 10 to 12 months from start of treatment. The other uh, protocol which is uh, formulated by the PRINTO that is Pediatric Rheumatology uh, International Trial Organization, it advocates a slower tapering and discontinuation of steroids over a period of 24 months and here generally after upfront treatment with intravenous methyl prednisolone. Uh, we switch to oral prednisolone at 2 mg per kg per day and over the first two weeks it is reduced to 1 mg per kg per day. Then over the course of the next two months it is reduced from 1 mg per kg to 0.5 mg per kg per day and thereafter it is reduced to 0.2 mg per kg per day by end of the sixth month and the same is continued for the next six months. Uh, between months 12 and 18 uh, uh, prednisolone is administered in a dose of 0.1 mg per kg per day and from 18 months onwards, that is over the next 6 months, it is administered as 0.1 mg per kg per day on alternate days and then discontinued. Methotrexate is the most widely used glucocorticoid sparing agent and the reason for this is the findings of the study conducted by PRINTO. PRINTO had conducted a multicenter randomized control trial comparing the efficacy and safety of a prednisolone alone versus combination of prednisolone with either methotrexate or cyclosporine in children with newly diagnosed juvenile dermatomyositis. They found that the combined treatment with pre, uh, consisting of prednisolone with either methotrexate or cyclosporine was superior to prednisolone monotherapy at 6 months and the median time to prednisolone discontinuation was shorter in the combination groups compared to the prednisolone group. At the same time, while comparing the two combination groups, they found that the adverse effects were more common in the group which received prednisolone with cyclosporine versus the group which received prednisolone with methotrexate. A methotrexate is usually started at a dose of 15 to 20 mg per meter square per week, the maximum dose being 40 mg per week, preferably subcutaneous at disease onset as advocated by the share recommendations. And generally improvement is seen by 4 to 6 weeks after starting therapy. Uh, methotrexate is generally well tolerated in children and the most common side effects are mild and reversible. They may be in the form of nausea, abdominal pain, elevated transaminases. Intravenous immunoglobulin is effective as adjunctive therapy in refractory skin and muscle disease. Also it has a steroid sparing effect. It can also be given upfront in the initial management of patients with moderate to severe disease and is also one of the additional therapeutic options for patients who have persistent skin rash despite resolution of their muscle disease. It is generally administered at a dose of 2 gram per kg, the maximum dose being 70 grams which is administered every 2 weekly for 3 doses and then it is given monthly. But uh, the cost uh, may be a limitation. Uh, the side effects include infusion related reactions which are generally seen at the time of first uh, infusion and may consist of fever, chills, headache, myalgia, nausea. The less commonly encountered adverse effects include aseptic meningitis, thromboembolic events and anaphylaxis. Cyclosporine is also an effective steroid sparing agent and is often considered in patients who are intolerant to methotrexate. 
the starting dose is 3 to 5 mg per kg per day and the CARA CTP is also include cyclosporine as an option in patients with persistent skin disease uh, despite the resolution of their muscle disease. It can also be used in uh, macrophage activation uh, syndrome occurring in the setting of juvenile dermatomyositis and the adverse effects include hypertrichosis, hypertension, hirsutism and reversible decrease in renal function. Hydroxychloroquine is generally used in patients with dominant cutaneous manifestations. It is also considered to have a steroid sparing effect. It is administered at a dose of 5 mg per kg per day, the maximum dose being 400 mg per day, generally well tolerated. The side effects include skin hyperpigmentation and retinal toxicity. Mycophenolate mofetil in uh, retrospective studies has shown efficacy in treating recalcitrant skin and uh, muscle disease. It also has a steroid sparing effect and a role in myositis associated ILD. It can also be considered in patients who are intolerant to methotrexate. Generally, the dosage is started at 600 mg per meter square per day in two divided doses and the common adverse effects include GI intolerance. Uh, patients can have cytopenias and infections as well. Cyclophosphamide due to its potential toxicity is generally reserved for patients with refractory or severe disease such as those with skin ulceration, severe muscle disease with dysphagia, dysphonia, gastrointestinal involvement, interstitial lung disease, associated vasculitis. It is generally administered as pulse that is intravenous cyclophosphamide which is given at a dose of 0.5 to 1 gram per meter square once a month for 3 to 6 months. Coming on to the biologicals, uh, rituximab has been studied in the RIM trial that is the rituximab in myositis trial uh, which assess the efficacy of rituximab in refractory adult polymyositis and adult and juvenile dermatomyositis. Uh, in this uh, uh, trial the dosage was based on the body surface area. Those with a body surface area of less than or equal to 1.5 meter square received 575 mg per meter square per infusion whereas those with a higher body surface area received 750 mg per meter square up to 1 gram per infusion. In this study they found that of the 195 randomized patients including 48 children with juvenile dermatomyositis, 83% responded to rituximab and they were able to decrease the steroid dose as well that is the corticosteroid sparing effect was noted. In this trial they observed that the presence of anti-synthetase antibodies particularly anti-JO1, anti-Me2 antibodies, juvenile onset and lower damage at disease on, uh, lower damage while starting the therapy predicted better efficacy. The use of TNF inhibitors in myositis is little controversial although TNF, in, uh, TNF has been implicated in the pathogenesis of this condition. This is because uh, uh, various trials have shown mixed results. Some have shown beneficial effect in some there have been no improvement whereas worsening has been observed in some reports. At the same time there are a few case reports of uh, myositis induced by anti-TNF therapy. Hence their role appears to be uh, mainly for patients who have prominent inflammatory polyarthropathy or a refractory calcinosis and infliximab and adalimumab are generally preferred over etanercept. Coming on to the JAK inhibitors, the new kids on the block, uh, an upregulated uh, type 1 interferon signature is strongly associated with juvenile dermatomyositis and uh, uh, the downstream of the cytokine receptor that is the interferon receptor, uh, the jak site pathway plays an important role in signal transduction and a further uh, pro-inflammatory response. Uh, promising results have been observed in case studies reporting the use of jak inhibitors namely baricitinib, tofacitinib and roxolitinib in the treatment of refractory juvenile dermatomyositis including MDA5 positive uh, JDM patients and however there is a need to evaluate safety and efficacy of these drugs in clinical trials. A wide array of medicines have been used, the treatment strategies with different mechanisms of actions have been used for calcinosis in juvenile dermatomyositis. These range for, from immunosuppressive agents such as uh, infliximab, rituximab uh, to uh, those which um, uh, the non-immunosuppressive agents which uh, modify the calcium phosphorus metabolism such as bisphosphonates, calcium channel blockers and sodium thiosulfate. However, none have proven to be consistently efficacious. IVIG and pamidronate have been relatively commonly used among these medications with uh, uh, reports of successful uh, therapy. And surgical excision is generally uh, required where the uh, calcinosis is extensive and impairs the mobility. 
in the next few slides i shall discuss briefly the various guidelines for the management of juvenile dermatomyositis the cara that is the childhood arthritis and rheumatology research alliance has formulated a ctps that is consensus treatment plans for the initial management of moderately severe juvenile dermatomyositis for this purpose they have defined uh, uh, moderately severe juvenile dermatomyositis as patients who have rash muscle weakness age at onset less than 16 years However, they should not have the presence of features such as of severe disease, such as severe disability, parenchyma lung disease, cardiac involvement, CNS involvement, skin ulceration, myocarditis, etc. And uh, these are the three protocols which are recommended by them. The common medications in all the three protocols is a combination of high dose oral glucocorticoids, that is 2 mg per kg per day of prednisolone equivalent with methotrexate, preferably administered subcutaneously. In addition to this, the protocol A and protocol B also include intravenous pulse methyl prednisolone, 30 mg per kg per day, maximum of 1 gram per day for 3 doses. And uh, this may be continued optionally for uh, 1 per week. In addition to this, protocol B also includes uh, IVIG. And uh, here it is used in a dose of 2 gram per kg, maximum of 70 grams every 2 weekly for 3 doses, followed by once monthly. The CARA guidelines recommend that the patient should be reassessed after a period of uh, four weeks and as depicted in this algorithm, uh, the uh, response is uh, based on the physician judgment and takes into account the muscle strength, the muscle enzymes and the uh, rash. And uh, if, in, if the patient has improved at four weeks, then uh, normally the same treatment can be continued and uh, the steroid tapering is started from four weeks onwards. However, if the disease uh, remains unchained, then the same treatment is continued for the next four weeks and the patient is reassessed at that point in time. If at that point also the disease has remained unchained, then uh, the escalation of treatment is advocated. And in the last scenario, if the disease has worsened at four weeks assessment, then escalation of therapy is uh, warranted, which would include addition of uh, uh, immunomodulatory drugs such as IVIG or immunosuppressives, both uh, non-biologics as well as biologics. Some consensus based recommendations have been for the treatment in juvenile dermatomyositis have been proposed by SHARE that is single hub and access point of pediatric rheumatology in Europe. They have given two algorithms. This first algorithm is the one for patients with mild disease, mild to moderate disease and uh, the second algorithm is one for patients with severe disease. In both the algorithms the treatment usually begins with the pulse steroids followed by oral glucocorticoids started at 1 to 2 mg per kg per day in conjunction with methotrexate preferably subcutaneously. They advocate methotrexate in a dose of 15 to 20 mg per meter square per week, maximum of 40 mg per week. In addition, all patients are given calcium, vitamin D supplementation and advice on protection measures. If the patient responds to treatment, then uh, the methotrexate is continued while weaning the steroids and uh, the uh, consideration is given to withdrawing methotrexate in case the patient is in remission for at least a year of steroids. On the other hand, if the patient is intolerant to methotrexate, then uh, we can uh, switch to some other DMARDs such as cyclosporin A or mycophenolate mofetil. On the other hand, if there is no response to treatment, escalation of therapy would include the other options such as uh, IVIG uh, and the biologic medications. Uh, this is the algorithm for patients with severe disease and uh, by severe disease they mean uh, internal organ involvement such as cardiopulmonary involvement, systemic vasculitis, extensive cutaneous ulceration and here th in addition to the uh, baseline treatment that is steroids with methotrexate, the patients are given a pulse uh, IV cyclophosphamide and in case of lack of response there is further intensification of therapy which would include uh, IVIG biologics uh, such as uh, rituximab or uh, TNF inhibitors or a combination therapy consisting of high dose methotrexate, cyclosporine A and IVIG. Thank you. Sir, please be there only. Any questions from audience or chairpersons? Calcinosis is a very big problem. What yes. is your experience? Uh, madam, uh, first of all, calcinosis indicates uh, ongoing uh, disease activity in the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So, uh, one uh, thing, the first thing would be to intensify the immunosuppressive treatment. And in addition to that, uh, we have tried various options such as uh, pamidronate. Pamidronate is generally given 1 mg per kg per day for 3 consecutive days, once every 3 monthly. 
and uh, such cycles are repeated and we have seen a good response in many patients with that regimen and in very refractory cases we have also used the IVIG and uh, were affordable and also infliximab in one case. of antibodies which we re really don't remember. We have gone so rapidly that hardly we got few, few points. So whether histopathology is the first thing and then auto antibodies estimation. This is, this is the course uh, of line of treatment. This is my question. Sir, in the first place, uh, based on the clinical and lab features, uh, juvenile dermatomyositis or uh, juvenile idiopathic inflammatory myositis will be suspected. That is on the basis of uh, the characteristic mm -hmm. rash, proximal muscle weakness, elevated uh, levels of the serum muscle enzymes. Uh, since muscle biopsy, EMG are invasive procedures, they are not commonly done in children with juvenile dermatomyositis. Rather, uh, MRI and uh, myositis autoantibody panel can be done ahead of that. So, the, as far as the MRI is concerned, the uh, fat suppressed T2 weighted image or the stir sequence will show hyperintensity, which reflects the muscle edema. And also, one can also do the myositis autoantibody panel. And uh, in children with uh, juvenile dermatomyositis, the myositis specific antibodies are present in about 60 to 70 percent of the children. And if they are positive, they will help support the diagnosis of juvenile dermatomyositis. And also they will help in prognostication and expecting what internal organ manifestation would be expected. Muscle biopsy is rarely done. It, as per the SHARE guidelines, the muscle biopsy is generally reserved for cases with atypical presentation or where a rash is absent. And the other possibilities, other differentials are also to be ruled out. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Chikarmani, sir. Thank you, sir. With that, we move on to our uh, next session, which is very important, Symposium on SLE. For the first lecture, I request Dr. Ganu for lecture on suspected SLE, how to evaluate in OPD and IPD. For chairing the sessions, I request Dr. Kiran Joshi, sir, nephrologist, Dr. Bharadia Gopikishan, sir, and Dr. Arvind Chopra, sir. So, first of all, please be chairperson. <coughs> Dr. Ganu has done DM rheumatology and clinical immunology and has done postdoctoral fellowship from CMC Weller.
थैंक यू फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई थैंक द ऑर्गेनाइजिंग कमिटी फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू प्रेजेंट दिस टॉपिक सो आई एल बी प्रेजेंटिंग सस्पेक्टेड एस एल ई हाउ टू इवेल्युएट इन ओ पी एंड आई पी सिचुएशन्स एज वी ऑल नो इवेल्युएशन ऑफ अ डिसीज बेसिकली कंसिस्ट ऑफ मेकिंग अ डायग्नोसिस assessing disease activity severity extent damage and prognostication of the disease sle uh, does not have a single diagnostic test and it is a multi system inflammatory disease which has uh, uh, which has a variable course and its prognosis is also variable therefore the clinical context in sle evaluation definitely matters so Uh, what is this so called clinical context there we should consider epidemiological features heritability natural history of the disease serology uh, features of sle that indicate disease activity and organ specific features of the disease we should also be aware of possible differentials of sle in epidemiology we know that sle is more common in reproductive age group but we should also know that it does present in other age groups as well and that has specific implications childhood sle is more severe we know that it is more common in females but it does happen in males as well and that also has a prognostic implication we should also be aware if a patient has has been taking oc pills has had a recent infection and whether it is likely to be an ebv infection is there any history of smoking we also should know that sle is inherited as a polygenic disease but in rare cases if we see a mendelian inheritance pattern particularly in children and adolescents uh, it monogenic form is also known in sle we do get a lot of patients which come with positive antibodies so we should be aware that uh, antibodies happen occur in the preclinical stage of the sle they occur as early as 10 years prior to the clinical stage is reached first antibodies among first antibodies to occur is anti ro and as the disease progresses towards the clinical stage we get more specific antibodies like ds dna anti sm by the time patient reaches a clinical stage usually more than one types of antibodies are present in the patient so with this background <coughs> uh, we should also know that the sle is a disease that pre presents in remissions and flares even though that is uh, that is true we may have persistent features of sle that may result from organ damage complications and comorbidities uh, associated with sle in the antibodies we uh, have antibodies that are used for screening that are important in diagnosis and prognostication for screening we all know that ana immunofluorescence is used and like any good antibody it has a very high uh, any good screening test it has a very high sensitivity but we should also be aware if the clinical context is very strong there are causes for false negative uh, screening ana immunofluorescence for diagnosis we uh, specific antibodies like ds dna anti sm and anti histone are more useful uh, but other antibodies if they are present they also help and give us a clue for diagnosis and they are there in the classification criteria of sle there are a lot of antibodies which have a multitude of uh, prognostic roles and the, those i will discuss with the specific disease uh, manifestations evaluation of a specific disease manifestation so with this knowledge we should when a patient comes to us we should first do screening with ana immunofluorescence at the baseline we should also do anti ro la rnp anti sm and apply antibodies wherever possible we should also ask for a quantitative ds dna c3 c4 complements urine protein creatinine ratio and urine 24 hour protein along with esr these tests are to look for the disease activity of sle there are certain situations uh, where we do need to repeat aplas 
even if they are initially negative. The clinical context for this is if we are suspecting a vascular episode or an obstetric complication and if a patient is planned for uh, surgery, transplant, pregnancy and things like this. So when a disease flares, we commonly get constitutional features. These include the most commonly uh, present ones like myalgia and arthralgia. They are present in almost 90% of cases. Fever as a uh, manifestation of disease activity may be present in as high as 40% of the cases. Usually it is low grade. Fatigue is another uh, manifestation of SLE uh, that is there in the active disease. But we should also be aware that it can happen, it is a multifactorial uh, present um, manifestation and we should be aware of the other causes of uh, fatigue in the SLE. So when an active disease is present, we are uh, likely to get oral, uh, oral or nasal ulcers, alopecia, cirrhositis, cytopenias, arthralgias, arthritis and myositis and rarely but uh, less commonly we uh, maybe might also get myocarditis, acute lupus pneumonitis, myositis, uh, diffuse cerebral dysfunction etc. So coming to organ specific manifestations when mucocutaneous manifestations are concerned it is helpful to differentiate them into lupus specific lesions, lupus non specific specific lesions. There may be lesions which are associated with drugs that we give for lupus. When we see a lupus specific lesion we should also think about the disease activity. Features that indicate the disease activity include erythema, scaling and hypertrophy as against uh, the damage which is indicated by atrophy, scar, hyperpigmentation. There is a cutaneous specific activity index class C but it is not very much uh, in use in clinical practice by rheumatologists. Um, when should we biopsy a skin lesion? When a skin lesion is specific to lupus but is present in the uh, in absence of a, con a correct context, when we have lupus non-specific lesions, drug induced rash and mimickers, we usually get interface dermatitis and lupus band test in such situations. Coming to uh, renal manifestations, it can present with uh, many of these uh, renal syndromes that itself does not give us very specific clue so we should look for features of renal flare in the correct context these are presence of uh, active urinary sediments increased creatinine increased urine protein creatinine ratio increased dsdna uh, drop in c3 and <clears throat> when these are present we should do evaluation for same anti c1q has a high negative predictive value for uh, renal involvement in lupus so uh, biopsy will give us a prognostic and therapeutic uh, information that is necessary so it should be done in most cases however the agreed upon indications are uh, new or state or worsening proteinuria uh, renal failure failure to respond to treatment and relapse we are all aware of the ISN RP, uh, <coughs> ISN classification, 2004 classification uh, of histopathology of lupus. But we should also be aware that there are other features which may be there described in the biopsy of a, a, a lupus nephritis and that may have prognostic implications and therapeutic implications. NPSLE will be covered in a subsequent lecture, so I won't go in detail of NPSLE. In the gastrointestinal manifestations, we have manifestations that are, though they are re relatively rare, they may present with <coughs> acute abdomen and specific investigations in these scenarios are necessary, like in lupus enteritis, which is a small vessel vasculitis occurring in children and adolescents. Here we expect that angiography is usually normal as against me mesenteric vasculitis which is a medium vessel vasculitis commonly seen in adults here MR angiography is the in, uh, investigation of choice mesenteric vessel thrombosis when we uh, suspect it presents as ischemic bowel disease 
angiography is helpful and very commonly it is associated with antiphospholipid antibodies. Pancreatitis in lupus has a very high mortality because of presence of uh, higher prevalence of necrotizing pancreatitis. So we should have a low threshold for doing CECT abdomen. Lupus hepatitis may coexist with autoimmune hepatitis and ANA does not help in differentiating between these two. Eventually biopsy is confirmatory. Ribosomal P is an antibody associated with lupus hepatitis. <clears throat> Other manifestations uh, for peritonitis, we should avoid uh, acetic typing as far as possible unless red flag signs are present. I mean, to hematological manifestations, uh, lymphadenopathy associated with lupus disease activity is usually generalized, has soft and non-tender lymph nodes and lymphadenopathy fluctuates with the disease activity. If we get red flag signs that indicate infections, malignancy and kikuchis, we should uh, proceed for a lymph node, we should have a low threshold for doing uh, lymph node biopsy. Biopsy in SLE would usually su uh, suggest a reactive hyperplasia while characteristic necrotizing lymphadenopathy will be present in Kikujis. The anemia needs a guided evaluation like in any other anemia case. However, the causes of anemia in lupus are slightly different than in general population. Special consideration should be given for autoimmune hemolytic anemia and complications of lupus like thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Again, the pancytopenia needs a guided evaluation and most common cause for pancytopenia in lupus is disease activity along with drug and drugs and infections. Special consideration should be given uh, and macrophage activation should be suspected. If serum ferritin is high, triglycerides are high, ESR is dropping, fibrinogen is decreasing and autoimmune myelofibrosis should be suspected when bone marrow shows global hypocellularity, plasma cytosis and necrosis in absence of any obvious cause for C. So when we uh, see a thrombocytopenia in lupus, we should look uh, for active multisystem involvement or presence of bleeding. If it is present, we should consider possibilities of uh, TTP infections or disease activity related and uh, do investigations likewise as shown here. If these are not considerations, this can be assumed to be because of antiplatelet antibodies, anti-GP2B3A antibodies, which are not uh, commercially available at most of the places. So we can go ahead with a therapeutic trial in such situations. If the patient does not respond to treatment, then we should look for rarer causes of thr thrombocytopenia like this. And those are antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, thromb thrombotic tr secondary TTP, uh, von Willebrand factor deficiency, and additional platelet uh, function defects. Isolated thrombocytopenia usually does not cause bleeding, even if it uh, at times it is below 50,000. Coming to cardiopulmonary manifestations, pleuritis is a feature of disease activity. Interstitial lung disease is seen in very high percent of, uh, up to 10 percent of SLE patients. Lupus pneumonitis uh, and pulmonary hemorrhages are rarer but see serious complications of uh, manifestations of lupus. In which case we should rule out embolism, hemorrhages and infections. So bronchoscopy and uh, bronchiolar lavage are required in all such cases. In cardiac manifestations, again myocardial dysfunction and asymptomatic myocardial dysfunction and pericardial effusion are the most common ones. Here again the pericardial effusion need not be uh, tapped unless red flag signs are present or hemodynamic dynamic compromise is present. Myocarditis is seen in very high percent of patients and the rest of the evaluation is like any other general case. In musculoskeletal features, I would say that fibromyalgia is present in very high percent of uh, SLE patients. In an OPD, we can use any of these disease uh, sladi or their modifications or other disease activity indices. However, it is little cumbersome to do most of them. Most commonly used, uh, I think, is uh, Selena sladi and sladi 2K. For all patients of SLE, we do need to see for comorbidities particularly osteoporosis and fracture risk 
accelerated uh, atherosclerosis, infection risks and cancer risks. So take home message in this situation is presence of presence of uh, context is mandatory for guided evaluation of SLE. Evaluation should be uh, should wrongly consist of establishing a diagnosis, assessing disease uh, activity, damage and complications and comorbid conditions and differentiating lupus specific manifestations, lupus non-specific but associated manifestations and lupus mimics uh, is the key first step in the evaluation. Thank you. Thank you sir. I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Ganu sir. One or two small questions. Uh, how smoking is a risk factor for SLA? I'm sorry, sir. How smoking is the risk factor for SLA? You have mentioned smoking is a risk yes, factor for. So, uh, exact uh, pathogenetic um, mechanism for this is not known. However, uh, there are theories, one of which includes smoking causing netosis and uh, lung injury netosis and uh, subsequent uh, initiation of disease activity. That netosis causes uh, availability of intracellular uh, antigens for formation of antibodies and that ultimately res results into uh, SLE in long run. When we should do the kidney biopsy? If urine shows the trace of albumin or one plus albumin, yes, sir. whether that is an indication for doing a kidney biopsy, yes, sir. or so, we should wait for more than three hundred milligram or three fifty milligrams. So, uh, most of the people agree that when you have a correct clinical context, you should anyway go ahead with a renal biopsy. But the uh, consensus is on the indications that I have mentioned there. There are studies which show that. Uh, low grade protein urea that is one less than one gram per 24 hour uh, protein urea also is associated with uh, histopathological changes uh, suggestive of lupus nephritis. So I personally would have a low threshold for doing renal biopsy but uh, there is no still uh, consensus on that. Sir, <coughs> Sir uh, nowadays we go little aggressively for kidney biopsy. If proteinuria is more than 500 milligram in 24 hours, then also it is a one of the indication to do kidney biopsy in the presence of active urinary sediment. This serves as a baseline biopsy because these patients are going to live longer with the immunosuppression therapy. There may be class transformation. Sometimes a condition arrives when patient comes to us who has left treatment due to some or other reason, financial issues, uh, depression, and then suddenly creatinine goes up high. In between, we don't have any record. At that time, baseline biopsy will be very useful. And even before a transplantation, such biopsy serves as well. So if proteinuria is something to the tune of around 500 or more, biopsy should be done. I have one small question. What is the utility of a ANA by ELISA? Yes, sir. So ANA by ELISA does not cover the entire spectrum of antibodies. It, these are usually uh, antigen directed tests. So they detect antibodies that are specific to a particular antigen which is known as against ANA immunofluorescence which has HEP2 cells which express uh, a very high number of antibodies. So with ELISA we might miss some of these antibodies uh, if we look for specific one. For example, we have ELISA against DSDNA. If we do that we may miss anti-SM anti uh, SSA, anti SSB, other, all other antibodies. So anti ELISA is uh, done if we have a clinical uh, association, uh, if we have a renal involvement and we are suspecting anti DSDNA to be positive for confirming that we, uh, in such situations we would suggest to do anti uh, uh, specific ELISA antibodies. Thank you, sir. 
conditions for uh, uh, of a silly who get uh, recurrent uh, mucosidosis. With increasing dose of steroids, they go under remission. But as soon as their dose is decreased, again they flare up. So how long we should use the steroids? Or we should change the other drug? Yes, sir. So uh, ideally, that we, we should be inducing a remission with uh, high dose steroids and giving a steroid sparing agent for specific same purpose. Uh, the idea is as we start tapering steroids, the steroid sparing agents take over and they, uh, they maintain the remission. And which steroid sparing agent needs to be used depends on the initial manifestations of the disease. Uh, so, by and large, we should continue uh, this treatment for minimum three years post, uh, <clears throat> post remission and then we can take a decision on whether we should taper it. Uh, probably we should continue steroid sparing agent for a very long time and probably forever. But steroids we can taper and stop. Thank you Dr. Ganu. Uh, we have spared some time after the session of SLE for uh, question answers which will be moderated by Dr. Nachiket Kulkarni. It will be very convenient if we take the questions at that time after the session is over so that everybody can contribute and everybody can t participate in that. Okay. Thank you Dr. Ganu. I request all chairperson to felicitate Dr. Ganu sir. from Pune, Head of Department of Rheumatology and Chairman of Research Advisory Board at Sancheti Institute, Pune. He is also a Fellow of American College of Rheumatology. A very good morning. It's an immense pleasure finally talking to a live physical audience after two years. Thank you organizers for inviting me today. Uh, my topic today, emergencies in SLE. I'll be sharing few cases from my practice in the recent past. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the common, common causes for SLE patients in emergency care usually are related to disease flare, infection or thrombosis. But today I am going to talk about some uncommon conditions which in fact will be life threatening if not identified and treated in time. So this is a 38 years female, more than 7 years of SLE. She was mostly on complementary and Ayurvedic medications first saw uh, for the first time with fever, rash, arthralgias, uh, unresponsive to antimicrobials and was hospitalized in the wards. So within first day of admission she had seizures and had to be shifted to ICU. She was acutely ill, hepatosplenomegaly, she had acute flare of rashes, uh, probably acute cutaneous lupus uh, type of rashes. She also had tender joints. Her primary evaluation was suggestive of pancytopenia, high CRP, deranged LFTs, mild proteinuria, ANA was positive, anti-Smith antigen was positive and hypocomplementemia. What was important here is ESR was only 20. So in fact, her earlier reports were suggestive of very high ESR. And in fact, here you see a low ESR. In fact, Dr. Sahil just mentioned dropping ESR as important sign for 
one of the condition. So her investigations further done revealed very high levels of serum ferritin. LDH was high, D-dimer deranged, fibrinogen low, triglycerides high, and bone marrow aspirate was done, which was suggestive of hemophagocytosis. So this is what is known as macrophage activation syndrome. So macrophage activation syndrome actually is a form of HLH. HLH, uh, a full form hemophagocytic histio, lymphohistiocytosis. So actually it's a form of HLH in the setting of autoimmune disorders. Now HLH actually is a genetic or uh, sporadic disease usually, usually seen in pediatric population. There is innate immune dysfunction which leads to hyperimmune activation or excessive immune activation, especially macrophage driven, uh, causing hypercytokinemia, hyperferritinemia uh, and multi-organ failure. So this, this condition is rapidly progressive, life-threatening. So as I already mentioned, it is driven mostly by macrophages and natural killer T cells. Uh, <coughs> with ongoing activation resulting in hypercytokinemia leading to uh, hyperinflammation and multi-organ failure. Now, how do we diagnose mass or macrophage activation syndrome? So, in a patient with underlying condition like SLE, if there is persistent fever, organomegaly, cytopenias, always check for ferritin, LDH, they'll usually be raised if it is macrophage activation syndrome. And in fact, uh, bone marrow aspirate will show hemophagocytosis. Also, you, you need to do some other uh, tests probably to rule out viral triggers like viral serologies, PCR to identify uh, other etiologies. But mass, as I said, usually happens in the setting of uh, usually systemic onset juven, systemic GI, but almost in a recent series of around few hundred uh, patients of macrophage activation syndrome, 10 percent were, uh, around 10 percent were having SLE. Now, more importantly, in such patients, what are the possible differential diagnoses that we need to consider? So herein, number one is SLE flare itself. But you can identify SLE flare with, uh, you know, hypo uh, complementemia, a specific diagnosis, a specific uh, trend or clinic, clinical evaluation which shows some organ involvement. And this can be actually managed with slight tapering of steroids or uh, adjustment of immunosuppressants while macrophage activation syndrome will not respond to minor adjustments. And there will be very high levels of ferret serum ferritin as I have already uh, <clears throat> showed in earlier slide. The next comes, next and more important uh, differential to consider is sepsis with DIC. In fact, I understand most of you are physicians and you, you probably will be seeing more num number of these patients in your ICUs. So uh, the similarities are quite, uh, you know, fever, liver function failure, cytopenias are common in both the conditions. But there are two main differences. The macrophage activation syndrome will have ongoing lymphocyte activation. Okay. And the serum ferritin levels are, in fact, alarmingly high. You can get high ferritin levels in uh, sepsis syndrome as well, but they are, they are usually static. Okay. But here it will go beyond thousands. In fact, if more than 10,000, it is very sensitive and specific for macrophage activation syndrome. About 2,000, almost 70 to 80 percent sensitivity specificity for macrophage activation syndrome. But still, ferritin levels will help you here. And uh, of course, bone marrow aspirate will suggest uh, hemophagocytosis. Now, uh, sepsis usually is caused because of bacteria or fungus. And it will tend to respond to antifungals and antimicrobials, while macrophage activation syndrome will not. So if any of your suspected patient of sepsis syndrome is not responding 
to antibiotics and antifungals. Definitely consider macrophage activation as a differential. Now, thrombotic microangiopathies are another rare conditions usually you can find in the setting of uh, uh, <coughs> underlying rheumatic diseases or SLE to be more specific. TTP, HUS, in fact the underlying pathogenesis there is small vessel uh, thrombosis because of uh, platelets and there will be microangiopathic anemia. So since I mentioned it is microangiopathic anemia, you will see peripheral smear which is suggestive of fragmented RBCs and spherocytes. Okay. <clears throat> While the anemia in case of macrophage activation syndrome usually is autoimmune where Coombs test will be positive. While for TTP Coombs test will be negative. Another important feature is there is not much of LV dysfunction with TTP or HUS or even drug induced microangiopathy while uh, if there is no evidence of LV dysfunction you can safely rule out macrophage activation syndrome. So you have to have some high SGPT as well as LDH which is high to consider macrophage activation syndrome. Even, even patients with primary liver failure can present with coagulopathy, encephalopathy and should be an important uh, differential that should be differentiated from macrophage activation syndrome. But, but in fact, uh, mass is multi-system or multi-organ uh, dysfunction and again serum ferritin level will be very high. DRESS which stands for drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic syndrome. So certain drugs can precipitate macrophage activation like condition with coagulopathy, cytopenias and fever. But eosinophilia and temporal association with an exposure to a drug will help in differentiating. Treatment includes triggering conditions should be identified and treated especially infection. High dose glucocorticoids form uh, the first line along with cyclosporin A, IV, IG and any other immunosuppressants which have to be optimized for underlying autoimmune diseases. The protocols for prime genetic HLH are slightly different. They are etoposide based which are not much helpful in patients with SLE associated macrophage activation syndrome. Now uh, only five minutes so I will run through next cases. So another one uh, again was a case of lupus nephritis 40 years male <coughs> cyclophosphamide induction in 2013 was on maintenance mycophenolate mofetil. He presented to OPD with headache, visual disturbances and raised blood pressure. In fact refused hospitalization for further evaluation but the same night he had to be brought to the hospital in ambulance because he had developed seizures and encephalopathy along with accelerated hypertension. Now this was the MRI and as you can see the posterior lobes there are hyperintensity in subcortical white matter. Okay, so grey areas are spared. In fact this is quite sensitive of a condition called posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or press more uh, recently it's now called reversible, uh, <coughs> I think, reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome, that is the uh, recent name. So this condition in fact <coughs> is because of disordered cerebral autoregulation and endothelial dysfunction because of suddenly increased blood pressure. Treatment is not very aggressive, you just have to control the blood pressure but not very aggressively, you have to target reduction of blood pressure by 10 to 25 percent at a time. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, it, there might be a permanent neuro deficit. Usually more than 90 percent of the patients will recover with symptomatic treatment. Uh, but if not treated, there still is likelihood of around 10 percent patients uh, dying of the condition. MRI is very diagnostic, in fact very specific features, it will also rule out posterior circulation stroke. <coughs> now uh, the third case, in fact uh, I got a call for the first time, she was 29 years female in ICU on ventilatory support with acute renal failure, encephalopathy, cytopenias. And uh, when inquired 
with the relative, she had bad obstetric history. In fact, three first trimester abortions. She had history of joint pains and rashes, but was never uh, diagnosed with any condition, rheumatic condition. Uh, of course, ANA was positive. Her ACLA, IgG titers were very high. Lupus anticoagulant was positive. This is a condition called catastrophic antiphospholipid syndrome. Almost one, though rare, almost one percent of patients with antiphospholipid syndrome will probably have this condition. It's it's important to diagnose because almost the mortality touches to 50 percent, and almost 30 percent of SLE patients will have antiphospholipid syndrome. The underlying pathogenesis is multiple small vessel thrombosis with multi-organ failure. Usual precipitants are infections, but some patients do have history of contraceptive or have become pregnant. The presenting features usually are involvement of uh, kidneys, lungs, brain, heart and skin. Uh, and of course the hematology that is uh, severe thrombocytopenia. Again here you get microangiopathic autoimmune hemolytic anemia and DIC. So uh, the diagnosis of CAPS needs three or more, more organs that are involved simultaneously or within one week with the background of anti-phospholipid syndrome or positive and APLA antibodies and confirmation of small vessel thrombosis on histopathology or maybe imaging. The common differentials that we need to consider are disseminated intravascular coagulation, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and other thrombotic microangiopathies we just discussed. So it's easy if you have history of antiphospholipid syndrome or ACLA, lupus anticoagulant or uh, anti-beta-2, GP1 antibodies, usually it favors uh, CAPS. Treatment, again, more importantly, you need anticoagulation in this uh, set of patients. Uh, you need to suppress cytokine cascade with high-dose steroids, plasma exchange, along with or without IVIG as well. In refractory cases, rituximab has been used, cyclophosphamide, especially if patient is SLE and Ecolizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, helps. Now my final case, actually a 55 years female SLE since 2014, on azathioprine maintenance, low dose glucocorticoids, had more than two weeks of fever, cough, severe fatigue, anorexia. She also had comorbidities. Her history was significant in the sense that recently her primary care physician had uh, initiated Xyloric for hyperuricemia when patient had gone to him for some increased joint pains. And she had presented, she now had pancytopenia, mild azotemia, and high ESR and CRP. So, so talking about similar patients, SLE with fever, usually the causes could be infectious or non-infectious. Non-infectious causes usually will be disease flare thrombosis or rarely drugs. Infectious causes, again, a lot of uh, infections are possible, you can see. But what, what I would like to drive your attention to is always, always seek for neutrophil uh, counts. If there is severe neutropenia that is less than 500 per cubic milliliter, or in fact lesser than that, which is persistent for more than seven days, then you have to consider for opportunistic infections. Otherwise, you can just neglect. So what opportunistic infections, commonly candida and aspergillus, uh, as well as the pseudomonas or originosa. So in persistent neutropenia, you have to consider all opportunistic infections, even those like nocardia or uh, the uh, many, many other causes. But but uh, that's where you have to be very aggressive in treatment and include drugs like, uh, you know, amphotericin B and other uh, antimicrobials in your treatment. Now, finally, because there was uh, in the topic mentioned something about drug toxicity. So what about drug toxicity? Usually, it is a major concern of physicians whenever they see my patients on mycophenolate or any immunosuppression, they are first worried whatever patient is presenting to them is because of the drugs, which is usually not the case. So drug toxicity only happens if there is overdoses, as in cases of methotrexate, inappropriate uses as, as it happens with glucocorticoids or drug interactions, which we commonly miss. 
So these are the common reasons for drug toxicity. Serious adverse events, less than 3% of all patients are receiving immunosuppressants. Common adverse effects are GI intolerance, which can be managed without stopping the drugs. Cytopenias usually are disease-related, rarely drug-related. Fever, mostly infections. Rash, often disease-related. And glucocorticoid is the commonest culprit for most of the adverse effects. So again, coming back to my patient, she actually had drug-induced pancytopenia because she was put on allopurinol. Most probably miss that allopurinol increases the toxicity of azathioprine and both should not be given in one patient. And there was secondary infection. Once azathioprine was stopped, allopurinol was stopped, it was easy to treat the patient. So finally, SLE emergencies may be because of disease flare with various organ manifestations like kidneys, CNS, etc. Associated complications should be sought like mass, TTP, caps, infections should be looked into, thrombosis, drug toxicity, other, other possibilities. Delayed diagnosis and treatment may lead to fatal outcomes and one has to understand that multidisciplinary care is very important in these patients with involvement of rheumatologists, hematologists, intensivists, etc., etc. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Nalaude, sir. Sir, please be on desk. Please, sir. delivered by Dr. Sanat Pathak, who is a rheumatologist from Pune. He will be talking on neuropsychiatric lupus. He is also visiting consultant in, in BJ Medical College and KEM Hospital, Pune. Uh, good morning, everyone. After that shock, short, inadvertent break, <laughs> uh, I'll be talking about neuropsychiatric lupus. Um, very nebulous topic is what we feel when we um, uh, think about neuropsychiatric lupus. So what I'll try and do is at least simplify, try and simplify uh, what we think is very vague into a few learning points. Right. So. Um, Okay. Uh, so, when we look at the evolution of neuropsychiatric lupus, uh, the 70s and 80s were clearly um, easy times on us when um, uh, all that was included within the ambit of neuropsychiatric lupus was mainly seizures and psychosis. Even if we look at our uh, old Harrison's and medicine textbooks, that's all there is. Seizures and psychosis, even in the 1980s, that's all there were. As time progressed and or as I like to say as medicine became more knowledgeable, maybe wiser, maybe not wiser, uh, the number of things just rapidly went on increasing. So uh, now if we see current case definition of neuropsychiatric lupus, you will find everything under the sun. You will find um, the entire textbook of neurology within 
the heading of neuropsychiatric lupus. So you have both central nervous system involvement, um, everything. I'm not going to rattle them out um, from meningitis to stroke to um, psychosis to confusional states. You have peripheral nervous system involvements, you have peripheral neuropathy, multiplex, a mononeuritis, uh, all of these things. So, um, are we more, are we wiser, are we more confused or less confused because now we have a lot of things to deal with. When it was just seizures and psychosis, it was probably easier. When uh, we know more, medicine has advanced, we have all of these things. And when we say medicine has advanced, however, it's not that um, everything is easy. Um, Current case definitions say that about 50% people with lupus have neuropsychiatric manifestations. In some series, about 70%. That is not a convenient number for us to take because um, it's really difficult what to do with this 70%. If, when we think that 70% of a population has something, we think of it as less severe, as um, something that we can just let go. But however, neuropsychiatric lupus continues to this day to kill. So this was a study that I had published um, when I was a um, DM resident. So this was a pediatric lupus cohort uh, of 273 children. They were diagnosed as children and there were 14 deaths in about 25 years. So it's good to look back on what mistakes we have made or what the disease has taught us with deaths especially. And if you look at the causes of these 14 deaths, Eight of them um, had neuropsychiatric lupus at the time of death. Um, most of their sled eye was contributed to by neuropsychiatric lupus. In fact, when you did a regression analysis of the factors predicting death in these patients, the highest hazard ratio uh, was with neuropsychiatric lupus. So the presence of CNS disease ever um, gave a five times higher risk of death in these children. Remember, these are children, these are not adults. They are not confounded by strokes or um, hemorrhages and all of these things. These are children, so probably all of this is because of the lupus, right? So um, we have now a kind of dichotomy where something which is extremely common when we say something which is 50 to 70 percent prevalence, and yet there is a certain um, level of disease which continues to kill. This is where we need to concentrate on the ones that are serious, right? So when we approach neuropsychiatric manifestations to SLE, I'm going to ask a few questions, just three in fact, of what I would do in a clinic or a hospital situation to try and make sense of this. So as I said, because um, it is common and yet some of them are severe, what I would do, the first question is see how severe the disease is. We do this all the time. All diseases have a severity spectrum. COVID has cough and cold. COVID has ventilated, um, I mean, ventilated patients with ARDS. So all diseases have a severity spectrum. And as physicians, we tend to focus on the more severe. So um, the less severe uh, end of the spectrum, you can have anxiety disorder, you can have mild cognitive dysfunction. You can have mood disorders and in an ideal world it would be nice if uh, we could handle or uh, address all of these concerns. But even if we can't, it is important to identify the more severe spectrum of disease. So that is the most important take home message that I would say that uh, the severe spectrum of disease, there are two common ones. Uh, cerebrovascular disease which occurs in about 7 to 10 percent people. Uh, with lupus, uh, usually it is ischemic, very, very small percent have hemorrhagic. It can often be multifocal as compared to sort of garden variety stroke. The second one is seizure disorders, again mostly present with generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Usually there is no focal onset if at least we are trying to attribute it to SLE. 70 to 10 percent patients still um, to this day and age suffer a seizure um, in the course of their disease. Then there are some less common ones. Uh, acute confusional state is uh, pretty specific to lupus. So uh, it's, a, it's a slightly vague term, but usually it tends to um, tell you that it is an acute state which comes with uh, visual hallucinations uh, uh, to um, differentiate it from auditory hallucinations that you more likely see in psychosis. So visual hallucinations and you can have two states. You can either have a hyper-aroused state or a hypo-aroused state or an under-aroused state. 
So you either see a patient who is very agitated with all of these things or you see a uh, patient who is dull and lying on the bed. So uh, this is a um, case that one would like to pick up, acute confusional state. Psychosis, you have again a severity spectrum of psychosis but you would like to pick up the severe end of psychosis because one thinks that is part of the lupus. And of course there are many, many, many different types of things that are uh, fall within the less than 1% category. So like I said, everything under the sun, everything in the neurology textbook, you'll find one or two case reports that have occurred in lupus. So um, these are the four or five things that you would like to pick up in a patient who is present in a or at least in a patient of SLE or known SLE who is presented with uh, either a neurological or psychological features. The second question that I would like to ask is, is this feature, is this neurological feature due to the SLE itself or is it something else? We tend to use these terms now, uh, primary NPSLE, primary neuropsychiatric lupus tells you that it is due to disease activity. Secondary neuropsychiatric lupus is a complication of disease or due to medication of the disease. Concomitant disease is a neurological feature presenting with something completely different. It may not be linked to a disease if a, uh, nobody has stopped a um, person with SLE from developing a stroke um, at age 70. So that is concomitant disease. That is not uh, neither primary NPSLE or secondary NPSLE. So this is the second question after the severity. Unfortunately, this is the boon or bane of our existence that every feature that happens in SLE has a differential diagnosis. Every feature. So if you say that a person has SLE associated septic, aseptic meningitis, I have a team of intensivists come up to me and say this is probably pyogenic meningitis or it is most likely bacterial meningitis. And you can't really say no because these patients are often on immunosuppression. They are on steroids, they are on uh, other medications, so it's difficult to say no. Um, you say that a person has lupus headache and um, people with antiphospholipid syndrome or lupus are more likely to get migraine. They can have benign intracranial hypertension like what was discussed in the earlier lecture. They can have just hypertension and press. So um, you have lots of differentials for this. If a person with um, SLE presents with seizure, you think it is SLE related, but it could just be some scar, it could be a previous infection, it could be metabolic, it could be um, um, hypoglycemia, it could be um, hyponatremia, all of this. Even acute and confusional state. They present, like I said, with uh, an encephalopathy-like state, so it could just be a metabolic encephalopathy, a toxic encephalopathy, or a simple, not simple, that's not the correct word, or a viral encephalitis. And psychosis, of course, it could be steroid psychosis because uh, these patients are on high dose steroids as well. So um, this differentiation is what you'll spend most of your energy in. The um, first question was more or less easy to consider. The second question is where you'll do most of your investigations for most of your energy in, in the hospital setting. So there are some things that will help you. And what will help you most is your physician's intuition. Uh, so consider these two patients. I was just looking at the records for the last six months at the KEM. Um, these two patients, the, both of them had uh, seizures. So just look at their uh, clinical profile. The first one is a 13-year-old girl. Uh, in fact, I took a photograph of her because you don't really get to see this kind of butterfly rash anymore. So it was such a classical butterfly rash and then she had fever, weight loss, and um, it was just the starting of the disease, only um, symptomatic for the first two months. She had proteinuria. Um, Mm, uh, cytopenia, the whole gamut of things that you will find in SLE. Um, compare this to the profile of, a sec of the second patient. She's mm, had SLE for the last 30 years or so. She um, now has a creatinine which remains stable at around 3.5 or 4. She is on maintenance as a theoprin at a low dose. Uh, complements are always na uh, normal and now she presents with fever and seizures. You don't need fancy investigations, you don't need a um, highly trained person to come and tell you which patient has disease related seizures and which patient has complication related seizures. So it's more or less clear that the one on the right has uh, in probably an infection, a meningitis or tuberculosis, whichever, but it is less likely to be disease related. So what will help you here or what will uh, contribute to your physician's intuition is many, many other features that we consider subliminally when we are looking at a person with 
with um, NPSLE. So it's important to consider these. For example, what we've just done now in the earlier two cases is look at SLE disease activity. So SLE disease activity, high disease activity is a considerable risk factor for the NPSLE syndrome being attributable to SLE and not otherwise. For example, um, a SLADI score of more than six, you're twice as likely to get, um, or twice as likely that the neuropsychiatric manifestation is due to SLE. Um, when there's lupus nephritis, again, two to three times. SLE damage, if there's a lot of damage, um, seizure disorders, severe cognitive dysfunction, um, it is probably like, it is a risk factor for developing neuropsychiatric lupus. Um, this is very important. So a simple history can help you. So it is always said that lupus breeds true to itself. A person who presents as arthritis at onset may, if relapses, will all usually get arthritis. If a person presents with ITP at onset, they'll relapse with an ITP. So previous NPSLE, look at the odds ratio for that. If you have a history of seizure before, your odds ratio is 10 times um, to develop a seizure again. If you have a history of um, cerebrovascular disease in the context of SLE, 16 times more likely to get a cerebrovascular disease again. Um, that even extends to the less severe things like depression. So um, a simple history, um, um, that is the kind of thing that comes out on a professor's round and not on a resident's round that a professor will ask and say that at age 16 she actually had a seizure. So um, a simple history will tell you that this is more likely to be a neuropsychiatric lupus. And fourthly, the presence of antiphospholipid syndrome. So again, a very high odds ratio in cerebrovascular disease, somewhat less in the other things. So seizure mm -hmm. disorder, cognitive dysfunction, mm -hmm. less um, likely. Oh, am I out of time? So um, investigations to differentiate is that is what you're doing. Basically what you're doing is uh, looking at differentiating from other things. There is nothing too specific about investigations. I'm not going to go into the depths of all these algorithms, but just look at this. Acute confusional state, what you're doing is excluding metabolic causes. So, um, seizure disorder, you're doing a CSF analysis to exclude infection. You're doing a brain MRI to exclude a secondary cause of the seizure. So that is the kind of thing that you're investigating. The third question that I would like to ask is what is the putative pathogenetic mechanism because this is going to help you in treatment. So now we have considered or I'm narrowed down the spectrum of SLE to only primary uh, NPSLE and it is uh, useful to differentiate them into two broad pathogenetic categories. One is vascular and one is inflammatory. Vascular is basically um, people presenting with stroke. That, that is more or less focal neuropsychiatric uh, focal disease and inflammatory is where it is a more diffuse disease. So um, mechanisms will differ, there will be high um, uh, blood brain prime, uh, barrier permeability in this and um, all of these inflammatory mechanisms in the inflammatory component. So usually what we consider inflammatory when we are treating is um, aseptic meningitis, acute confusional state, very severe psychosis and many types of neuropathies. So this is basically what we are considering as inflammatory when we think of the putative pathogenetic mechanism. So how do you differentiate this? So we had a lot of things to differentiate between uh, primary and secondary. How do you differentiate vascular and inflammatory? Again, it is most likely clinical. Okay. I'll take two more minutes. Uh, it is most likely clinical. Um, many fancy investigations are available, they are associated, but they're not really helpful in clinic. For example, an anti-ribosomal NP antibodies, which was touched upon by Dr. Ganu. So uh, they do bind neuronal surface protein and you would think that they give rise to inflammatory neurological disease, but unfortunately not. Uh, they can be seen in anything. Um, However, they're associated with diffuse um, inflammatory disease. But in one patient, if you do a ribosomal P antibody and if it comes out to be negative, it's not of too much use. Um, there, uh, many people try and do CSF for antibodies. So what people do is do CSF complement levels and CF, CSF anti-DSDNA. Again, not of much use. So this was a very interesting paper in which they um, differentiate or looked at levels of many, many different cytokines, antibodies in the CSF. 
uh, in pure NPSLE, that's what they were calling it, pure NPSLE and associated in factor NPSLE, no difference in a single one. So um, that is not really going to help you differentiate between neuropsychiatric lupus and other things. So um, you can just save that investigation. So the general principles of management in neuropsychiatric lupus, again, will go on these three questions. Um, the first one is mild or severe. Um, we are trigger happy in immunosuppressing any neuropsychiatric manifestations in lupus, which we should not be. We should cease um, going directly to the steroids. And um, for example, in mild disease, all you need is uh, supportive therapy, uh, depending on the manifestation, antidepressant, antipsychotics, whichever else. When do you need um, immunosuppressants is when it is severe disease, it is uh, primary NPSLE and it is diffuse non-thrombotic and uh, you think you are attributing it to SLE disease activity. So I listed out those six or seven things and this is where you hit hard and hit fast. Uh, usually they will require pulse IV methylprednisolone, cyclophosphamide, all of these things. So high dose immunosuppression. If it is focal or thrombotic, you usually do not require um, immunosuppression. So there's um, many people think that a stroke in the presence of SLE is CNS vasculitis. Very, very small numbers, 2%, 1% actually have vessel inflammation in the CNS in SLE. Most of them are bland thrombosis, so they do not require um, immunosuppression for that. So if it's in a patient with active SLE and lupus nephritis, obviously you'll be um, immunosuppressing them anyway. But uh, for the stroke, you don't really need to immunosuppress. And if it is um, associated with the presence of antiphospholipid antibody, you need to anticoagulate. There is a great dearth of clinical trials of, uh, in neuropsychiatric lupus. In the past 50 years, guess how many trials there, there are for neuropsychiatric lupus, randomized controlled? One. Uh, there is one clinical trial for neuropsychiatric lupus which showed, I mean, it's not surprising that IV cyclophosphamide was better than plain IV methylprednisolone for neuropsychiatric lupus. Yeah. So um, that is why we usually choose IV cyclophosphamide. So take home, um, we know it is heterogeneous and there are many, many case defi uh, definitions, but one would evaluate on the basis of severity if you think you're attributing it to SLE and what you think the pathogenesis is. You'll, your main investigation goal is to rule out differentials and not to really confirm CNS lupus and the treatment depends on the clinical presentation. Um, I'll just end with an interesting tidbit that not many people know about uh, acute confusional state. So what we've usually read in our MBBS textbooks is that um, autoimmune disease is not really contagious. But uh, when a patient gets acute confusional state, a doctor quickly gets acute confusional state as well. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. We don't have time for questions, but I think Thank it's the psychiatric part of the neuropsychiatric that gets neglected. And unfortunately, the evidence-based medicine is very, very limited when it comes to neuropsych. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fatak. I request you to go to the chairperson's desk to get felicitated there. I request Dr. Leta Bichile, Madam, for her talk on lupus and pregnancy. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank the organizers to uh, 
uh, to invite me to speak on lupus in pregnancy. This, present, this presentation will cover the key issues faced during lupus pregnancy, how to plan a pregnancy in a patient with diagnosed lupus, what are the adverse events observed in a lupus pregnant and who is pregnant, assessment of lupus nephritis, most common disease in lupus patients, which they develop within first three years of lupus onset. Treatment of lupus activity during pregnancy or before she plans a pregnancy. Treatment of antiphospholipid, a most dangerous risk factor when she plans a pregnancy. Which drugs are safe and what will be the fetal outcome? Lupus is a chronic inflammatory autoimmune disorder that affects females and adolescents. Women of reproductive and childbearing age, the age being 15 to 45 years. It is often said that lupus flares are common in pregnancy and a postpartum period. And it is also recognized that lupus is a disease which is where there is a role of estrogen and progesterone. So it flares in pregnancy because of an increased levels of estrogen, prolactin, T cell, T hypercell phenomenon and cytokine surge. Whereas during postpartum period, there are decreased levels of anti-inflammatory steroid as we are, as we are, uh, as we are try, tried to, we are told to taper the steroids. Increased levels of prolactin, which is a pro-inflammatory hormone in postpartum state, changes in neuroendocrine axis, changes in estrogen and progesterone levels during postpartum state. The current focus of lupus has totally changed. One of the major current changes in lupus focuses on timing of pregnancy. That means me as a rheumatologist and patient under care me has to be responsible to counsel the patient before she plans a pregnancy. So it starts with counseling from the primary physician. In the past, pregnancy was discouraged in the presence of risk factors as lupus nephritis, use of immunosuppressants when she is planning a pregnancy, or with positive antiphospholipid antibodies and anti rho and anti la antibodies. Therefore, if a patient of lupus which, who is with me, say from the age of 18, I will have to be careful to do these days when she is planning the pregnancy and may I, I may repeat or may not repeat when she is positive, when she is married and planning a pregnancy. And I had to give all this information to this patient as to why I have made this days and put in her file so that it will be a guiding source for me to manage the patient when she consumes. Now lupus pregnancy care is multidisciplinary and I think this has to be followed wherever a rheumatologist is working, right at a taluka place or a district place. He has to find his obstetrician colleague and even a neonatologist if the mother is anti-ro positivity. Stress is given to plan a pregnancy when the disease is inactive. And I think this scientific approach starts with preconception counseling. How do I assess the patient before conception? One, I will monitor the organ involvement, target the disease remission with immunosuppressants, and I will request the patient to delay the pregnancy if high disease activity or with a slight die of more than eight, which already the previous speakers have highlighted. Here I would like to tell you that even though the, the woman is planning the baby, it's very important even to counsel the husband because many times they are in a hurry. Oh, she has got lupus, let me plan pregnancy early. It's not like that, you have to conceal the husband as well and even in-laws at many times. I will ask the patient to delay the pregnancy if heart disease activity. Number two will be to check the autoantibody profile. If she is planning a pregnancy, she does not have this stage with her. I might repeat APL or anti rho and anti la if it was not there in the patient's file. Number three will be identify the organ damage. Look for contraindications to pregnancy. 
does your heart disease, does your lung disease, does your pulmonary hypertension, which must be evaluated by each and every physician. I will look into the contraindications to pregnancy, review treatment regime, is she compliant with hydroxychloroquine or azathioprine or even antihypertensives many times. There is a concept in most of the patients, even with mild hypertension or moderate hypertension in day-to-day -day practice. Once the blood pressure comes to normal, they will give away the antihypertensives. You have to tell the patient that your blood pressure is normal because you are on medications. This is an important advice. Many times I check there, I ask them to bring their foils and show it to me. Review the treatment regime. Replace contraindication, contraindicated medicines with safer, um, safer ones. I will ask the patient to wait for two to three months when the new regime is started and I will ensure that the disease is under control. Pregnancy planning in lupus. I think that these patients fall into three categories. Category one, the lupus is in remission or stable with a low disease activity. That means I have kept a sled I score and I will go through it. And when the patient is on a prednisolone which is less than 10 milligram per day and the pregnancy is allowed. Number two patients will be active lupus disease where I will request the patient and the family and the husband to postpone the pregnancy. I will use effective medicines and then I will ask the patient to plan a pregnancy or when the disease is under remission. Number three category of patients when they come to us, because they usually come after a delay of three to five years of the disease onset, and when she has got a severe organ deficiency, definitely I will discourage the pregnancy, and most important component will be a renal lupus with creatinine more than 2.8 milligram per deciliter. I will discuss uh, discuss adoption, and I had done it in I had done it in more than five patients. That two from rural areas and they have gone for adoption. One or two patients have gone for even uh, surrogacy. This is the changing scene of having a baby and enjoy that motherhood by these two methods. Lupus assessment during pregnancy. On confirmation of pregnancy, physical examination is very important. And I think important thing that we must know is the photosensitive rash and the rash over the face doesn't cross the nasolabial fold. Oral ulcers, fatigue, blood pressure record, and important is history of previous pregnancy loss and its timing. Hemograb and the platelets, why is it important? Patient may have disease-related anemia, which may be chronic, normocytic, normochromic, to hemolytic, even iron deficiency is common. Platelets may be normal or they may be low and these will be the risk factors. Urine microscopy for active sediments. Let me say to here that many times when these patients they refer to us, I find that a patient has got nine, eight to nine reports of urine and, uh, and the physician or who has failed in interpreting the reports. So please know that whenever you find abnormal urine reports, either refer the patients to a nephrologist or a rheumatologist and we are trained how to interpret the reports. Anti-DSDNA levels by immunofluorescence method. I find that most of the time they are in the ELISA, but I think ELISA will be used when I am asked to do a survey of renal disease in the community. But anti-DSDNA by immunofluorescence is most specific and it tells me that a patient has got organ involvement, first renal, second brain, and rest of the organs later on. Anti-Rho, anti lie antibodies, C3, C4, there are always decrease in lupus. Uh, lupus anticoagulant and ACL antibodies, and these need to be monitored in the first two trimesters to pick up umbilical and placental circulation. Here, there is a, we are handling a woman, but you are also take care of the placenta and umbilical circulation. I will also monitor the fetal status, heart status of the fetus for diagnosing congenital, autoimmune congenital heart block on fetal 2D echo. Specific investigation in high-risk high pregnancy. One is ultrasound, 
screen for fetal anomalies between week 16 and 20, monitored fetal growth every four weeks. Number two for antero mothers, fetal echo every week from week 16 to 26. Number three for row positive preeclampsia, uterine RT Doppler studies week 20 and then every four week. Fetal umbilical artery Doppler velocimetry week 26 and then weekly. Please remember once, the, once a woman is high risk pregnancy, all these investigations need to be told to the patient and we are, I always ask them to make a financial arrangement, otherwise it will going to be a trauma to the mother and a wasteful exercise and we also get, uh, we also feel that why this patient uh, has not progressed to a normal uh, delivery. What are the adverse events during lupus pregnancy? Important is a maternal mortality odds ratios. I'm not going to the percentage. Lupus flare, which I covered. Preeclampsia, the ratio is high. LSCS, either planned or emergency, for which the patient has to be informed. Because once LSCS, the family feels, no, she will not have a second kid. These are some of the anxieties in the mind of the patient. Stillbirth, premature births, abortions, uh, IUGR odds ratio, neonatal death frequency, neonatal lupus, complete heart block, 1 to 2 percent uh, in row positive uh, patients. These are the differences between pregnancy and lupus and this was touched upon, but I, what I would like to tell you is that the rash is always photosensitive, so take a minute to ask the patient, do you get this rash more when you get exposed to sun? oral ulcer, nasal ulcers, if thrombocytopenia, some bleed from there, pleuritis, pericarditis, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, May, maybe one patient has undergone a gallstone that gives you a clue that it is a chronic hemolytic anemia, pancytopenia is a disease activity many times in lupus, third is proteinuria more than 300 milligram per day and active urinary sediments. In a rural setting, you have to have a reliable laboratory to ask for urine sediments and then you can interpret or even albuminuria. You can teach the patient to collect morning urine in a test tube and boil it and keep a sequence of urinary proteins on day to day basis. Lupus nephritis and pregnancy concern, it is an important concern. Pregnancy associated with lupus nephritis raises concerns both to the mother and the fetus and the care starts with optimizing medical treatment, discontinuation of phytotoxic agents when she plans a pregnancy at least three to four months prior, and treatment of active disease if the patient comes in the category two of patients. Even when the disease is inactive, recent data shows being lupus anticoagulant positive and ethnic ethnicity over the globe, Hispanic women, Asian women, and even Indian women who have not been treated, they are at a high risk of pregnancy. And those on antihypertensives, and the patient doesn't know the indication why she is given antihypertensive, have worse pregnancy outcome. Therefore, prior nephritis predicts risks of preeclampsia and HLLP syndrome. What are the risk factors for poor pregnancy outcome? One is active disease six months prior to conception, active disease during pregnancy, SLA onset during pregnancy, and this is a very difficult situation where we'll have to take the help of a rheumatologist and with specific autoantibodies, basically anti-DSDNA, C3, C4, urine, and maybe other, other parameters, antiphospholipid syndrome, hypocomplementemia, anti-DSDNA, thrombocytopenia, chronic hypertension, pre-existing renal disease, first trimester proteinuria, these are the risk factors for a bad outcome. Risk factors for flares during the pregnancy, type of flare, whether it is a mucocutaneous, articular, hematologic, renal, CNS and vascular, I think all this has been highlighted by the previous speaker. And there are risk factors like anti-Rho, anti-DSDNA, platelet, Coombs, anti-DSDNA, and all these are the uh, bad prognostic factors. Preeclampsia and lupus pregnancy. Preeclampsia and lupus uh, is very common. 
and in common in 13% of lupus, difficult to differentiate from lupus nephritis. Uh, Preeclampsia are common in patients with antiphospholipid antibodies, those with diabetes mellitus, previous eclampsia, pre existing thrombocytopenia, twin pregnancy, and uh, our multi fetal gestation during first trimester. And in all these positive uh, things in a given patient from our file, Eular recommends low dose aspirin. And those with the previous risk are with that we can even combine low dose aspirin with heparin in prophylactic or therapeutic doses. There is a new concept of angiogenic factor imbalance in early pregnancy, and this explains why a non autoimmune woman also develops preeclampsia. What does it do? It causes not only the preeclampsia, and that results in the fetal growth restriction. A promise study highlights the utility of measuring circulating levels of soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase 1 factor, placental growth factor and even endoglin. And I think these will be the future markers in the management of all eclampsias, those who are autoimmune disease and those who are without, anti anti uh, without any uh, autoimmune disease. What are the difficult situations in lupus? An active rhythm in lupus and preeclampsia may coexist. And these are the various, various lab tests like hypertension, proteinuria, decreased platelets, increased uric, uric acid, decreased urinary calcium excretion, and renal impairment. Conditions with the decreased platelets, I think uh, Ajit has highlighted that you have to rule out, am I dealing with APL? Am I dealing with TTP? Am I dealing with immune thrombocytopenic purpura? Increased complement levels uh, not always seen in preeclampsia, pre though it is mentioned in the books, as again, but low complement level tells us that this patient has definite lupus disease. Doubling of protein here is also seen during preeclampsia, but anything which is higher than doubling of basic proteinuria is nothing but lupus nephritis. What are the contraindications in the class 3 patients who want to become pregnant? These are lupus flares within last 6 months, stroke within last 6 months, heart failure, chronic renal failure created in a more than 2.8 and syndrome with aspirin like Reyes syndrome in the past and also antibodies against heparin which the patient needs and she might need uh, she might have a problem with heparin administration. These are some of the acute issues uh, in pregnancy and lupus patient. You have to defer pregnancy, pulmonary hypertension more than 50 millimeter of mercury. Defer pregnancy with current use of cytotoxic, MMF and leflunamide. Treatment of lupus flare, steroids, safe, anti, uh, safe immunosuppression, avoid cytotoxic drugs. But these can be used in an emergency situation as pulmonary renal syndrome. I had one such patient wherein you have to take the patient and the relatives in, uh, uh, in, in confidence and I had administered cyclophosphamide in this patient where the priority was to salvage the mother. However, the patient went into labor and everything went normal. <coughs> I think safe medicine, everyone has spoken about it, but EULA recommends hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligram, to be taken preconceptionally. I think it helps in conception and even placentation, right? As I mentioned, placentation is also important. It is continued throughout pregnancy and stopping may precipitate flare. So patient has to be given a thorough knowledge as to why I'm giving hydroxychloroquine. As a rule, we try to avoid drugs in first trimester. It's a rule, but it is not so in patients with lupus. Use hydroxychloroquine, glucocorticoids, cyclosporine, tacrolimus to prevent and manage lupus flares. Continue hypertensives. The choice is methyl dopa. Second line will be nifedipine. Hydrazine in few patients. Some obstetrician, they always ask me, why are you recommending hydrolazine? 
though it is a drug which will reduce drug induced but it is safe to give here the question is to manage the blood pressure not allow it to go in a phase of renal crisis none of the drugs are absolutely safe this is a rule but assess carefully the risk and benefits and take the patient and the relatives and the family into confidence to avoid the legal complications later on lupus pregnancy and thrombosis i think this yojana is going to cover so i am not going to discuss it but let me tell it here that we are very confident to use low dose aspirin from 75 81 to 150 mg along with hydroxychloroquine which are supposed to be anti aggregating drugs which are safe in pregnancy and they'll reveal and they will not allow thrombosis to go or anti thrombotic properties fetal loss in lupus pregnancy loss is is fetal loss occurs in any trimester if there is a history of first trimester fetal loss the lady says no i always uh, about during first three months keep in mind this patient definitely has aps or this patient may have active lupus disease in the first trimester which was not diagnosed what are the causes of late loss of fetal loss antiphospholipid thrombosis hypercoagulable state other than aps most of the physicians they say no acl is negative la is negative my patient is safe but that's not the case patients who are apl negative they will have congenital causes of hypercoagulable state and these are factor 5 laden thrombin mutation hyperhomocysteinemia which is correctable with folic acid and protein c and s deficiencies and i have seen not many but at least three patients and i have taken help of my husband to manage these patients along with an obstetrician lupus flare in postpartum period uh, and infections we had to delay in that but the development of what are the, what is this sign of uh, here lupus flare development of new hypertension is a word i am using new hypertension is an indicator flare identify and treat it don't take time no i will wait and let it go to 100 no assess risk of thrombosis and implement prophylaxis of aps patients in women prior to thrombosis or nephrotic syndrome patient may not show that i have thrombotic uh, nephrotic syndrome it is one of the good indications for aspirin and even in this patient uh, uh, heparin fetal outcome neonatal lupus complication to the entire role important is to recognize congenital heart block rash hepatic abnormalities take help of a neonatologist and we know that we are monitoring this entire positive mother from week 16 to 28 weeks most babies with congenital heart block can be delivered at term and the safest drug for mother and the fetus will be hydroxychloroquine 400 mg daily because it works upon uh not all antero antibodies are pathological it is antero 52 with a p200 which is pathologic and that is being taken care by hydroxychloroquine and small dose of corticosteroid for a baby to born at term summary fertility is preserved in lupus important is to take the patient in confidence assess lupus activity impress in the mind on the mind of the patient and the family identify antero and thrombotic implement the prevention and if required the therapeutic protocol compliance assurance and taking patient's care throughout pregnancy is an important commitment that a rheumatologist has to offer in a rural setting or even at uh, in mumbai many time the patient they find that this doctor is calling me every week or every 15 days i collect fee once and rest of the things i just uh, don't collect any fees for from because i think it gives me an opportunity how we can manage boldly and verify the therapeutic protocols i think uh, uh, with this positive affirmation i just conclude my lecture and thank you very much i have taken some overtime thank you ma'am uh, thank you for this uh, comprehensive talk your knowledge is very commendable on this subject and with this we conclude the sle session we are running late by 1 hour so uh, i am very sure this can go on and on talk on sle 
any questions or any queries you can meet the speakers personally uh, during lunch and get them answered so now i uh, uh, i call upon dr mrs shiv puje to felicitate the chairpersons and we finish this session and move on to the next session apra talks next lecture i call upon stage dr yojana gokhale madam for her talk on apra diagnosis she is professor of medicine and in charge of rheumatology services at ltmc sayan she has more than 30 years of experience in rheumatology and she has been panel member of indian treatment guidelines for rheumatoid arthritis in 2008 for this session i call upon We're stage chair person Thank uh, you for your kind words. Can I? Yes, uh, chairperson. Yeah, can cut short that. May, may I invite chairperson first, Dr. Gurunath Parve sir, senior cardiologist from Solapur, Dr. N J Patil sir, and Dr. Jyotsna Ok madam. Please come on, guys. So good afternoon, everybody, and thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to speak on diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. I hope I am audible. So this is going to be the roadmap of my talk. So coming to definitions and few terminologies at the beginning. So antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is a systemic autoimmune disease, an acquired form of thrombophilia, characterized by thrombotic and obstetric events in patients who have persistent underlined antiphospholipid antibodies. the thrombotic events can be unprovoked deep vein thrombosis pulmonary embolism maybe young stroke young myocardial infarction and obstetric events could be you know pregnancy losses eclampsia and few other features regarding terminologies when it is associated with you know thrombotic event it is called as thrombotic aps and when it is associated with obstetric events it is called as obstetric aps if it is if associated with other autoimmune diseases like lupus or sjogren's it is called as secondary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome otherwise primary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome in less than 1% patients the events occur at multiple sites you know three four organs for a very short period of time in less than a week and then it is called as catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome which had 50% mortality in past about 1 to 5% people in the community have no symptoms of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome but can have apl antibodies okay they are asymptomatic carriers of apl only 1% of them they really develop clinical disease we'll come to that later In 1983, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or Hughes syndrome was first described, and in 1999, classification criteria for this condition were developed. Later, 
in 2006 during international meeting on antiphospholipid antibody syndrome at sydney australia the saparo criteria that is 99 criteria were revised and they are now called as sydney criteria so one clinical criteria and one laboratory criteria suffice for diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome the antibodies have to be persistent for 12 weeks that is 12 week apart the antibodies have to be positive now what are the clinical criteria venous thrombosis like dvt pulmonary embolism or heart rate thrombosis like you know young stroke young mi sometimes cortical venous thrombosis mesenteric ischemia renal artery or vein thrombosis etc obstetric complications are basically recurrent abortions one abortion after the age of uh, after uh, 10 weeks of gestation or more than two abortions before 10 weeks of gestation without any morphological abnormality only which is a bit difficult thing in you know uh, in indian setting to every time prove eclampsia or severe eclampsia and placental insufficiency now what are the features of placental insufficiency i'll be telling in the next slide amongst laboratory criteria one of the three have to be positive like lupus anticoagulant anti cardiolipin antibody igg igm or anti beta 2 glycoproteins igg igm the high risk profile are the ones who are la positive that is lupus anticoagulant positive anti cardiolipin or uh, anti beta 2 glycoproteins in very high titers and triple positivity and associated association with other uh, and autoimmune diseases like uh, lupus now these are the features of placental insufficiency that is a non reactive nst which suggests fetal hypoxia then abnormal doppler velocity waveform that is absent end diastolic flow in the umbilical artery doppler oligohydramnios which is diagnosed on ultrasound as amniotic fluid index of 5 or less or postnatal birth weight less than 10th percentile of gestational age now the reason for showing all this is if patient has any of these features during anc visits also it is an indication for investigating the patient for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and then if the patient satisfies the criteria then the patient should be put on prophylactic dose of anticoagulants now the lab studies have to there are international actually strict criteria for performing the lab test uh, a word of caution here lupus anticoagulant is a functional assay what i mean by that is prolongation of two phospholipid dependent clotting test like drvv that is you no know, or uh, diluted russell viper venom uh, time or aptt activated partial thrombo thromboplasting time if they are prolonged then we say that okay lupus anticoagulant could be present the if a patient is on anticoagulant this test cannot be performed so if you come across a patient of dvt unprovoked dvt before starting heparin or low molecular weight heparin send lupus anticoagulants okay sometimes it happens that you know patient is treated somewhere else in a hurry the treating doctor has given heparin to the patient and then sends to an institution like say sain km nair in mumbai and then we are really stuck up like you know you treat such patient for 3 to 6 months with anticoagulants and then you can't send lupus uh, anticoagulant test the other two tests that is anti cardiolipin antibodies and anti beta 2 an uh, glycoprotein antibodies igg igm are done by elisa so these two tests can be performed even when the patient is on anticoagulants see sometimes at the time of reporting to a doctor the patient is not carrying that much money and if you to choose out of the three which one should i send send la and start the patient on heparin and then when the patient or the relatives bring more money the remaining test can be sent i mean we in municipal hospital face this issue quite often okay now coming to lupus anticoagulant 
test. The test is performed as a screening test, mixing and confirmatory test. Screening test is prolongation of two phospholipid dependent tests that is APTT or DRVV prolongation. The lupus anticoagulants could be positive. Then what is done is patient's uh, plasma is mixed with control plasma on 1s to 1 dilution. If the prolonged APTT or DRVV is corrected, that means it is a clotting factor defect. It is not APS. If it is not corrected, then the next step that is confirmatory test in that phospholipids are added to, pati are added to patient's plasma. And now if it gets corrected, that means the patient has antiphospholipid antibodies. So, I mean there are protocols, are good laboratories follow the protocols. I am just telling that this because uh, the test should be sent to a laboratory who, which follows uh, the protocols st strictly. Okay, I will, uh, how much time I have? Yeah, still have time. Now, this is a large uh, uh, cohort study on uh, uh, which is a europhospholipid project. I will just see, tell uh, in uh, the clinical features because those clinical features when they are there, one should be asking for, I mean considering the diagnosis of APS and should be asking for APL antibodies. Uh, the project was uh, performed 1999 onwards, that means they are separo criteria based where the anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibody was not included in the criteria secondly the antibodies had to be positive 6 weeks apart and actually a lot of lupus re uh, aps related work um, has these issues you know the criteria are still evolving there are i mean a next set of criteria uh, rio de uh, genero criteria which are not still accepted so uh, yeah, so coming to uh, the most common presentation in this uh, group of, you know, cohort of 1000 patients of APS was deep vein thrombosis, which was, you know, 31 percent and another 10 percent P patients. Uh, then stroke was around uh, 20 percent young strokes. Young stroke, that is for APS, it is less than 50 years of age and uh, around 3 percent patients were uh, young myocardial infarctions. Unusual site of thrombosis, like you get a patient of cortical venous sinus thrombosis, Bershiari syndrome, renal artery or vein thrombosis also uh, existed in this group. Catastrophic patients, uh, catastrophic APS was 0.8 percent. Okay, what happened to these patients in 10 years follow? Thrombotic events occurred in 16 percent patients in first of five years and another 14.5 percent patients in next five years. So, nearly 30 percent patients developed thrombotic events and uh, 24 percent patients of thrombotic events were actually on anticoagulants uh, and still they developed thrombotic events. 15 percent patients became pregnant, Th uh, 73 percent patients uh, delivered uh, a, a live fetus, live uh, neonate. And uh, at the end of 10 years, uh, around 91 percent patients survived. So, 9 to 10 percent mortality at the end of 10 years in Eurolupus group. So, just presence of these antibodies does not mean there is a thrombotic risk. It is one of the thrombotic risk. And the risk depends upon which antibodies are positive. So, LA positivity, high risk. Triple positivity, which obviously includes LA positivity, high risk. And triple positive patient, almost 45 to 50 percent of them in a year, in 10 years time would have a thrombotic event. Other thrombotic risk factors, which are coexisting with uh, APL, are also important. If the patient has, say, protein C, protein S deficiency, patient is pregnant, which is a procoagulant state, immobilization because of lower limb surgery, fractures, lower limb fractures, pelvic surgeries, coexistent of diseases like SLE and traditional cardiovascular risk factors. They increase the thrombotic risk. Now, these are some manifestations of APS which are not yet included in Sydney criteria for diagnosis like thrombocytopenia, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, then uh, uh, acute uh, thrombotic microangiopathy, then some cardiac uh, things like you know valve thickening or valve vegetations, dermatologic problems, libido reticularis or painful non-healing ulcers, especially in the lower limb, cognitive defects. There are even 
lab criteria which are yet not included in the uh, lab diagnosis uh, in them are phosphatidyl serine or anti uh, anti thrombin uh, pro thrombin antibodies then antibodies to domain 1 of beta 2 glycoproteins iga antibodies we have included igm and igg iga antibodies to anti cardiolipin or beta 2 glycoprotein like that so non Right. And these I have found to be useful in recurrent abortion patients where you know the, uh, the three antibodies which are included in the criteria are not there. But these are very few laboratories do it. Yeah, but then you put the patient on uh, prophylactic dose of low molecular weight heparin all throughout uh, pregnancy and six weeks postpartum. So diagnosis of APA should be considered in uh, any patient who has thrombosis at a younger age any patient with late pregnancy losses, severe preeclampsia, HELP syndrome that is characterized by hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelet count during pregnancy. Certain clues which are you know the non-criteria uh, clinical features like uh, existence of liver uh, reticularis or other autoimmune disease, unexplained prolongation of APTT, mild thrombocytopenia. So actually when ITP was you know called as idiopathic thrombocytopenia, yes, performing uh, antiphospholipid antibody test is a part of workup of ITP. Now of course it is called as immune thrombocytopenia. Anyway, the, they have to be uh, subjected to ANA and uh, APL antibody test as a routine. So uh, to sum up, uh, one clinical and one laboratory criteria, lab criteria should be positive 12 weeks apart as per Sydney criteria. Uh, provoke DVT, thrombotic events in elderly, low titral APL carry very low thrombotic risk and such patients should not be unnecessarily investigated and you know labeled as APS. Differential diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is wherever you know vascular events occur, multiple vascular events. So vasculitis is a DD of uh, APS, infective endocarditis, you know patient can you know throw emboli from the veg in, uh, vegetations at multiple sites, LM eczema, uh, post angiopathy, you, patient has undergone angiopathy and you know plaques which are already existing because of mechanical disruption, they embolize. So all these are uh, differential diagnosis of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, CAPS is more than three sites thrombotic uh, uh, thrombosis occurring within a one week period and confirmation by documentation of thrombosis by say uh, biopsy or an angiography. Uh, laboratory confirmation by the lab test and if all four are satisfied then it is definite caps. Uh, uh, last slide. Um, about 10% uh, in some studies, uh, you know, healthy blood donors are positive for anti cardiolipin antibodies. Only 1% of them they, uh, are LA positive and only 1% every year develop uh, the syndrome. Amongst SLE patients, APL are positive in 20 to 30% patients. In patients with pregnancy complications, APL positive are 6%. In patients with young stroke, 17 to 33% are because of, so it is worth actually investigating young strokes for uh, APS. In amongst MI, some studies, you know, it is ranging from 3% to 11% have, uh, are because of APS. And amongst unprovoked DVTs, 10% have APL. Thank you so much for uh, your attention. And I, uh, I saved some time, thanks. Thank you, madam. Uh, I request all chairperson to felicitate madam. Sir, to come on stage for his lecture on APLA management. Madam, please be seated on this.
Dr. Anirudh Tempe sir, he is consultant rheumatologist at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Aditya Birda Hospital, Pune. He has training in rheumatology at PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai and has done clinical fellowship of rheumatology from Singapore. Good evening, good afternoon everyone. I thank the organizers for inviting me to this conference and giving me an opportunity to speak on the management of antiphospholipid syndrome. Now, APS is certainly not a rare disease, although it is not as common as rheumatoid arthritis, but still, all practicing physicians, at least once or twice in their lifetime, will be faced with such a difficult patient. As you can see, it follows a general one in five rule. About 20% of DVTs, 20% of young adult strokes, and around 20% of miscarriages will be due to the antiphospholipid antibodies. And to make things worse, more than 50% of these will have a recurrence without treatment. Very important to diagnose on time to prevent uh, long-term morbidities. And although it's an antibody-mediated disease, the treatment is anticoagulation and not immunosuppression. So that sets it apart from the other antibody-mediated diseases. So in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll plan to cover uh, the vascular APS, there is a dichotomy between vascular versus obstetric APS and the dreaded rare complication of CAPS. Yojana Madam has already uh, spoken in detail of when to suspect APS and how to diagnose it. Uh, so I'll straight away move on to the management part. Now with this, in this era of screening, lot of health checks, Many patients do come to us with asymptomatic APLA positivity. Just like serum uric acid level, unfortunately, this is also becoming a part of the screening package. Now, what to do with this asymptomatic APLA carriers? Usually, these asymptomatic APLA carriers have low titer transient IgM antibodies. They make up about 1 to 5 percent of the normal population. And Less than 1% of these will have these antibodies in moderate to high titers. They may occur de novo or they may be associated with other rheumatological illnesses, chronic infections, medications and malignancies like lymphomas. About 10 to 25% of these so-called asymptomatic carriers have a risk of developing a future uh, vascular or obstetric event. And how do we predict that? So this is the most important slide. Whatever we decide in our patients with APS depends on the risk stratification. What is the risk of getting a future event? So we have this so-called high risk pro APL profile. Uh, positive lupus anticoagulant is the best independent predictor of a future vascular or obstetric event. Uh, other antibodies, cardiolipin and beta-2 glycoprotein, if they are present in high titers or if triple positivity, all antibodies present and also present consistently, not on just one occasion. By definition, they have to be positive on two occasions, 12 weeks apart, and if they continue to remain positive, then these patients are definitely at high risk of a future event. So what do we do with these asymptomatic APLA carriers? Uh, obvious choice was aspirin. The first study was conducted in 2007 when aspirin was used to treat these patients who are APLA carriers but have not had any event in the past. Unexpectedly, the result was aspirin did not prevent the occurrence of the first event. This study has been controversial. It had flaws in its design. Uh, but one of the take-home messages was not all patients with the low-risk APLA profile need aspirin as an profile axis. So we need risk stratification. Those high-risk profile are the ones who should be offered this aspirin treatment. To clarify the matters, the European Forum on Antiphospholipid Syndrome carried out a ma major meta-analysis which involved a lot of international uh, collaboration to study uh, the role of aspirin in this group of patients. And what they realized was aspirin definitely reduced the incidence of vascular and obstetric events. And not only did it reduce the incidence of arterial event, which was expected, but it also reduced the incidence of venous events. So aspirin is definitely useful as a, for primary prevention of uh, thrombosis. 
this group went on to study the effect of aspirin plus low dose aspirin low dose warfarin combination to prevent the first event in this group of patients but they realized that there was no difference in the incidence of thrombosis which was observed in patients with low dose aspirin versus patients who were on low dose aspirin plus low dose warfarin so there is absolutely no sense to add warfarin to this group of patients in the primary prevention in fact the as expected the patients who were also on warfarin had more bleeding episodes so to conclude the primary thromboprophylaxis part all asymptomatic apla carriers with the high risk apl profile should receive low dose aspirin 75 to 150 mg that is strongly recommended and apart from giving aspirin we should also address the other risk factors of the metabolic syndrome uh, compel the patient to quit uh, smoking treat the hyperlipidemia hypertension diabetes uh, encourage mobility and avoid birth contraceptive pills sle is a special group of uh, patients who not only uh, need aspirin but by adding hcqs also reduces the risk of thrombosis and this landmark study in 2006 just hcqs reduced the risk of thrombosis in patients with lupus by as much as 68% so all patients with lupus who are apla positive should receive low dose aspirin along with hcqs and this high group apla profile patient if they plan to undergo any surgery be it general surgery or orthopedic surgery should receive full anticoagulation in prophylactic dose starting about 12 to 24 hours before the surgery and continued at least 7 days post operatively or postpartum even if they had uh, had no such event in the past but the high risk profile not the ones with the low risk profile so after moving from primary prevention to secondary prevention treatment of acute thrombosis follows the general guidelines of initial parenteral anticoagulation depending on the resource uh, settings we can use either unfractionated heparin uh, but it carries a higher risk of heparin induced thrombocytopenia and osteoporosis uh, better option or safer option is low molecular weight heparin but it is more expensive Uh, but has the lesser risk of heparin induced thrombocytopenia and osteoporosis but one caution in uh, enoxaparin is not dialyzable and dose should be modified in patients with renal impairment a small subset of these patients may develop heparin induced thrombocytopenia for these patient the option is fondaparinux which is available in india and should be used wherever it is indicated after having treated the acute thrombosis the next uh, step is prevention uh, long term treatment to prevent uh, venous thrombosis so as we have seen as madam has discussed all the studies most of these patients uh, will require lifelong lifelong anticoagulation but because the risk of recurrence is more than 50% so majority will require lifelong anticoagulation drug of choice is warfarin a small subset of these patients where physician has some discretion is a provoked dvt a single episode of venous thrombosis with a low risk apl profile where was where there was a definite provoking factor like recent surgery postpartum or immobilization there you may consider withdrawal of anticoagulation after repeating an ultrasound doppler after about 6 months if the clot has dissolved d dimer is normal there you may take a chance of withdrawing anticoagulation telling the patient the risk of future thrombosis is less but definitely there so very small subset can get away with just 6 months of anticoagulation otherwise majority will require lifelong anticoagulation Uh, there is a problem we know that lupus anticoagulant prolongs the aptt uh, so monitoring of anticoagulation might be difficult so while during the acute stage heparin levels can be measured directly or thrombin time can be used uh, lupus anticoagulant usually does not disrupt the pt inr and that is uh, that can be used to monitor the adequacy of anticoagulation in these group of patients so after treating uh, the venous part now we move on to the arterial uh, vascular event the most common is stroke due to aps as opposed to the venous thromboembolism part there is lack of consensus of how to best treat patients with uh, stroke due to aps the controversy is always uh, antiplatelets versus anticoagulation during the in 
so all patients with acute stroke should be offered the thrombolytic therapy as per the expert guidelines in the first 48 hours low dose aspirin plus heparin in prophylactic dose can be given which can be extended for another two weeks to prevent the hemorrhagic transformation of the stroke subsequently to prevent future episodes of stroke in patients who have a medium risk of recurrence can just get away with combination of antiplatelet agents aspirin plus clopid clopidogrel there is a general consensus among experts that combination of antiplatelet agents is more effective than warfarin based therapies for all arterial thrombosis so patients who have a medium risk of reference just antiplatelets but in combination not a single agent but those who have higher risk of getting a recurrence in future there we may consider adding warfarin in low intensity range between 2 to 3 but those who have had cardioembolic stroke there the they need full scale anticoagulation uh, aiming for an INR between 2 to 3 and sometimes up to 4 if there is a recurrence. Even in, as like in venous thrombosis, the risk of recurrent arterial thrombosis is over 50%. So most of these patients will also require lifelong anticoagulation and when we offer this kind of treatment, we need to explain the risk of bleeding associated with it. So it's less than 1% for antiplatelet based therapy around 2.5% for warfarin based therapy and 4% for combination of antiplatelets with warfarin. So this is, there is a real risk of bleeding, but since the rate of recurrence is so high, we have to accept this rate of bleeding because patient has to be on lifelong anticoagulation. So uh, now moving to non-cerebral arterial thrombosis, usually follows the same guidelines. The low risk patients, low to medium risk, will only get antiplatelets in combination. The higher risk will need addition of warfarin. Uh, if the medium risk is medium in the range of INR between two to three, or sometimes in up to four, if the risk of reference is very, very high. Despite doing everything correct, there is still a small subgroup of patients who will continue to clot despite giving full intensity anticoagulation. So there some uh, changes can be done if the patient is only on warfarin, you may consider adding uh, platelets, either a single agent like aspirin or aspirin plus clopidogrel if uh, the, in cases of arterial thrombosis. For venous thrombosis during the episode, uh, you can use uh, low molecular weight heparin as a bridging therapy to tide over the crisis and then try to manage at a higher INR. But having done all this, or even before this, most important thing is to check compliance. As happens with any chronic illnesses, compliance definitely becomes an issue and that is, that is where the role of motivation comes. The, the risk of recurrence is lifelong, the patient has to be on therapy lifelong. I still remember doing about 20 years ago when I was in first year MD, during one of the emergency days, my associate professor got admitted with altered sensorium. She died within six hours of a massive intracranial bleed. Uh, she had undergone valve replacement surgery, was on warfarin, very sincere, but had gone to visit her daughter in US where there she did not have access to the lab so easily. She, she skipped monitoring PT INR for just two months and she paid the price for it with her life. Since that day, I fear this drug the most, more than the immunosuppression, the highest of form that we have used. And always wondering whether, when we'll have a safer alternative to warfarin. So when these direct acting anticoagulants hit the market, they started showing success in other diseases. So it was hoped that this will, the same will be replicated in APS. But unfortunately, the biggest trial which was done to see the effect a non-inferiority trial of rivaroxaban uh, compared to warfarin had to be discontinued prematurely because there was an unusual increase in the risk of vascular events. So the jury is out. Direct acting anticoagulants are not recommended for APS. This, these patients have to be on lifelong warfarin only. Small exception can be made if you read the fine print. Those who have had just one episode of venous thrombosis, otherwise a very low risk profile, you may offer direct acting anticoagulants, explaining the risk that the risk of reference is high and any further, any single recurrence, the patient has to be switched from direct acting anticoagulants back to warfarin. So moving from vascular APS to obstetric APS, about, about 
two percent of normal pregnant females will have APLA positivity and about 20 percent of these will have recurrent pregnancy losses and the pregnancy is usually lost below before the tenth week. Now the pathogenesis is different for early pregnancy losses. It is postulated that the early pregnancy loss is due to complement mediated thrombosis while the late pregnancy loss is due to actual infarcts uh, causing uh, placental insufficiency and this has a bearing on the treatment as well. All these patients who are APLA positive obstetric APS have to receive aspirin to be started preconceptionally. Along with low, uh, low molecular weight heparin to be continued throughout pregnancy and up to six weeks postpartum if the APLA profile is very high risk. Uh, warfarin, as we know, is contraindicated during pregnancy uh, but can be re restarted after delivery. There is still a def difficult category of uh, APLA obstetric APS who continue to have pregnancy losses despite aspirin and low molecular weight heparin. My personal experience, I can tell you, adding HCQS and prednisolone in doses of about 5 milligram per day has achieved good pregnancy outcomes uh, in collaboration with good infertility physicians. So those who continue to have pregnancy losses can be uh, offered these two other drugs. So moving from obstetric AVS, last is the CAPS, the dreaded the rare complication, less than 1% will have it, but those who have it, very high mortality, more than 50%, has to be treated on an emergency basis. Unlike the obstetric and vascular APS, CAPS is both a cytokine and a thrombotic storm, and that is why the treatment is triple therapy, which has been proven beyond doubt. These, all these patients from day one have to be on a combination of high-dose steroids, full dose anticoagulation and either plasma exchange or IVIG depending on the uh, renal environment. If there is renal environment, you can offer plasma exchange or IVIG if there is no renal environment. The, this combination and this study from the CAPS registry has shown that this triple therapy has reduced the mortality by as much as 50%. A refractory caps can be offered rituximab, but it is not the first line treatment. First line treatment is standard triple therapy. The last slide, there still remains a lot of area for research. We don't know what to do with the non-criteria manifestations like the headache, superficial thrombo, uh, thrombophlebitis or thrombocytopenia. One thing we can know that thrombocytopenia does not prevent future thrombosis. So even in the presence of thrombocytopenia, all patients with APS should receive anticoagulation unless the platelet count drops too low, which will not happen in primary APLA. Headache can be managed with ecosprin. Seronegative APS is another area of research which will require a different session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for such an elaborative session. Uh, anything to add from chairperson or any faculties on this? Hello. Uh, a question to uh, both the speakers. Uh, you mentioned antiplatelet, especially aspirin therapy, as a primary thromboprophylaxis in APLA. Uh, whom do you screen for APLA? Should the, it should be screened routinely, like diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and start aspirin? So, so these so-called asymptomatic APLA carriers will be very rare in routine practice. Most of these patients will have an underlying CTD and they will have been worked up for lupus or other related illnesses. And during the workup, one of these antibodies may be positive. As I said, fortunately, we are not reached a scenario where it is being tested right, left and center like serum uric acid level. So they, these are a rare group of patients, but they will def we definitely encounter these patients having worked up for something else and they come to us with a positive APLA uh, titers. So, so younger this, patients with a vascular events like arterial event, younger patient with arterial events like young stroke, what they have said is less than 50 years stroke should be investigated. Less than 50 years of MI should be investigated. We generally would say 40, but it has been mentioned 50 years. And unprovoked DVT should be investigated. Your question was, I think, no, the, who should uh, be my, investigated? No, madam, no. My question was for primary thrombophlexis. That becomes secondary thrombophlexis. Primary thrombophlexis. Uh, when so he prime. said that you give aspirin patients, for primary thrombophlexis. Yeah, patients who are 
you mean to say carriers right yes yeah. yes so uh, in them during high risk period like such a patient a carrier is you should be telling the carrier to stop smoking you know uh, no no who should be investigated with apla that's my question a primary thromboprophylaxis no see what see yeah. these studies have actually found out in blood donors incidentally okay. as a part of academic work up whether it is the antibodies are there or not they have to be persistent to you know qualify for the diagnosis right generally they would not be persistent in younger patient especially in children during infection a lot of them they form the antibodies which are transient they will not last for 12 weeks yeah yeah I, during no, covid no. so many patients no, no, uh, madam why i am asking this question yeah. uh, i am a cardiologist uh, why i am asking this question is we have been encountering especially in india a very high incidence of myocardial infarction and most of them are thrombotics okay and many of them don't have a conventional risk factors like diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia that's a routine in fact i have one patient just 22 year today admitted here with and we have not been able to find out any cause so i am just wondering whether we should like lipids diabetes whether we should do routinely apla in for indian population for all young patient definitely no that is a secondary i am not saying after the event i am saying before the event No, for, that, that, we, that, we, so, for, for that we for that we should do for that we need population based about. studies yes yes for well, that we need yeah. after the event it is no use or if he suffers from a infarction there is no he has already had a damage so for that we need prospective population based studies what happens to this group so this will be a research setting yeah it, it yeah. should be with yeah. so because the incident that's, that's one question the second question which you said is the direct oral anticoagulations should not be used in apla who had a dvt or pulmonary embolism right yeah, because warfarin it is inferior to warfarin it is safer but less potent than yes. warfarin now it is a now in our practice it's a general now we have following we have replaced virtually uh, oral anticoagulation with direct direct oral anticoagulation and here we are not working them for uh, apla because they are already on oral anticoagulation so in this when we are switching over to direct oral anticoagulant rivaroxaban or uh, apixaban then we are i think we are making a grave mistake here because we are not working them up for apla we are shifting them to direct oral anticoagulation we are in which are inferior to warfarin so couple years so we are yeah. uh, exposing to a risk of future thrombotic so, events so any patient who is having a recurrent event first this is this Uh, indication or this uh, guideline is for diagnosed APS patients. If you feel that a patient has had acute uh, young MI, who has the event has recurred on your standard treatment, definitely uh, APLA should be screened. But not as a blanket for every patient from why, why, when you want to switch to direct anticoagulant. This this uh, guideline this is only for confirmed But APS. But I am not talking about MI. I am talking about DVT pulmonary embolism. Now it is a general practice. So, Most of us are no. now. If it is a case of antiphospholipid syndrome confirmed, then it is yeah, warfarin. But, Treatment is warfarin. Uh, unfortunately. after the diagnosis as madam had said that most of them are already either on low molecular heparin or on heparin so we cannot do apl in them you can and do. we switch over to you can do the uh, antibody based test you cannot do lupus anticoagulant but you can check for you can do the anti cardiolipin yeah yeah other antibodies cannot be done because which is a functional assay Yeah, but lupus, you say, is the most specific and the most diagnostic here. It is most uh, one of the most antibodies. likely to have a thrombotic event. Thrombotic event. Other, I mean, positive LA is most likely to have a clinically um, thrombotic event than the other two okay. antibodies. But that is why it should be sent first and then uh, start heparin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I ask uh, chairperson to felicitate Dr. Tembe sir. I can. I ask Dr. Vittal Darke sir to felicitate the chairpersons, please. Dr. Vittal.
with this we end apla session our next session will be on monoarthritis i request dr gayatri ekbote madam for her talk on how to evaluate monoarthritis she is consultant rheumatologist at dinanath mangeshkar hospital and sasun hospital pune and she has published many papers in national and international journals for this session i request uh, chairpersons to be on dais dr suhas pujar sir dr dinesh verma sir and dr parikshit sadev sir good afternoon everybody this does feel like a mathematics paper because i am in extremely tough situation i am speaking right after bichile ma'am yojana ma'am and tembe sir so uh, anyway so thank you organizers first of all for giving me this opportunity and uh, i also want to thank you uh, thank you thank you all because uh, because making this program program a huge success so today i am going to deal with approach to monoarthritis so this basic definition is for pgs uh, or budding rheumatologists who are undergoing uh, rheumatology training so as we all know arthritis just does not mean joint inflammation i mean it of course does mean a joint inflammation and it can involve bursae muscles tendons ligaments skin fascia around it but we as physicians understand the importance of systemic inflammation associated with arthritis and uh, arthritis is not just a single condition or situation so there are 200 plus odd situations and probably that is the reason we have such a big community of rheumatologists now so just in brief uh, uh, this is just a, a simple diagram of knee joint we all know a joint consists of uh, of course bones then cartilage synovium synovial membrane so this is uh, the inflamed synovium and we all know the functions of hyaline cartilage it does act as a shock absorber it allows friction free movements and it is not innervated the synovium or synovial membrane which secretes the synovial fluid it nourishes the cartilage and cushions the bone so whenever we are dealing with arthritis we are dealing with these structures mainly so whenever we approach any arthritis per se uh, especially a mono arthritis the most important question is uh, is it articular or non articular because trust me in my 4 or 5 years of practice i think mono arthritis is one of the very toughest situations whether it is acute onset or it is chronic less than 6 uh, weeks or more than or equal to 6 weeks is it inflammatory or mechanical then we need to look at the point of joint involvement whether it is upper limb predominant or lower limb predominant etc and then as i said since we all are physicians we need to look at other associated symptoms so uh, articular structures i've discussed there are non articular structures around the joints so in articular pain the pain is both in active and passive movement whereas in non articular uh, in non articular pain it presents only in active motion so the limited range of motion or painful rom will be in both active and passive motion in articular pain swelling could be seen in both but it is most commonly seen with articular pain so as our famous robin uh, robins pathologist said there are five signs of inflammation there is ruber caller dollar erythema loss of functions etc at least two signs of inflammation should be present when the patient comes with articular pain to call it as inflammatory arthritis and we all know that inflammatory pain is usually after a considerable amount of rest so it is usually an am pain or it's a morning pain and we call it famously as morning stiffness or morning pain etc so these signs of inflammation are obviously predominantly seen with uh, inflammatory arthritis synovial fluid could be inflammatory esr crp could be markedly raised in inflammatory arthritis so again uh, for pgs or budding rheumatologists around history taking is very important which is taught to us in our mbbs days only so this is duration is very important then again pattern of joint involvement whether the pain or the joint involvement or arthritis is intermittent or continuous we need to look at aggravating or relieving factors whether patient has excessive early morning stiffness young male sometimes come to us with axial involvement with some knee pain or excessive morning stiffness in low back then swelling noted by a patient then a very important uh, 
is drugs history then we need to look at history of fever whether it is preceding or accompanying then we need to look at preceding loose stool history any history of uti or iv drug abuse etc so as i said uh, the duration is again very important if it is abrupt in onset we probably have to think about fracture septic arthritis some internal derangement rheumatoid arthritis or some degenerative arthropathy like osteoarthritis or non inflammatory conditions like fibromyalgia can have insidious onset the acute duration uh, whenever you have acute arthritis the dds are less it could be infection it could be septic arthritis it could be gout etc it could be reactive arthritis then again any uh, ctd associated arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis sp etc uh, will have chronic arthritis so since we are dealing with monoarthritis today uh, what are the examples of acute onset monoarthritis so gout being the most common monoarthritis acute monoarthritis followed by pseudo gout then we have septic arthritis gonococcal arthritis then any inflammatory polyarthritis initially can present as acute uh, acute monoarthritis like rheumatoid arthritis sle etc then we have certain situations where you can have chronic monoarthritis like tubercular arthritis fungal arthritis other infections like brucellosis then immuno inflammatory arthritis crystal induced arthritis so crystal arthritis even gout repeated attack of gout can give rise to chronic monoarthritis then as i said any chronic inflammatory polyarthritis initially can just manifest as acute monoarthritis or chronic monoarthritis then we have some uh, examples of non inflammatory chronic uh, monoarthritis like single joint osteoarthritis neuropathic uh, arthropathy then osteonecrosis etc so this is just a, a diagram of hand as i said any uh, a pattern of joint is very important so say if you have initially just wrist involvement we need to look at the uh, look at person's history so rheumatoid arthritis is quite notorious to uh, cause wrist arthritis then gonococcal arthritis can give rise to wrist tenosynovitis etc then if you get to see just dip arthritis our differentials do narrow we can patient can have sarcoidosis psoriatic arthritis etc so in clinical practice especially young males they come to us with predominant lower limb arthritis so we have specific group of arthropathies we can have spondyloarthropathy uh, we have actually spondyloarthropathy group like we can have psoriatic arthritis ibd associated arthritis and differentiated sp etc then uh, these patients also can have sarcoidosis then degenerative arthropathy like obviously osteoarthritis Uh, intermittent arthritis is again very important and i think we see many of such patients in our clinical practice so you can have palindromic rheumatism like there are attacks patients uh, get, patient gets attacks of arthritis feels better again gets attacks of arthritis then gout patient uh, the somebody who has had gout will never forget the history of gout and they can have honeymoon period absolutely in between two attacks then reactive arthritis uh, then pseudo gout the pseudo gout uh, course is quite similar to gout but it is less inflammatory then migratory arthritis uh, i think in ug we have been taught about this uh, patients with rheumatic fever they can have one joint involvement uh, uh, at one day then the wrist involvement in uh, on for day one then elbow involvement on day two etc then sarcoidosis whipples infective endocarditis sle are few of the examples of migratory arthritis so as i said age is very important so anything uh, any arthritis which presents in less than 16 years of age is juvenile arthritis so we can have juvenile inflammatory arthritis like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis also so we have separate nomenclature juvenile uh, enthesitis uh, related arthritis then as dr sanat presented we have many juvenile sle patients also then we have to be little careful in children or adolescent because most of these could be forerunners of hematological malignancies then sle or vascular arthritis are diseases of lit young or middle age people so whenever you have uh, little elderly patient we need to think about degenerative arthropathies also or sometimes if they have excessive morning stiffness or some low grade fever we need to obviously think about malignancy but pmr or gca could be few of the causes young patients especially young women uh, can have disseminated gonococcal arthritis or other viral arthritis 
So basically whenever a patient comes to us with any articular pain, we have to look at the history. If it is an abrupt onset, we have to obviously think about fracture, internal derangement. If a young male has come to me with knee arthritis, has history of uveitis or some skin rash, obviously we have to think about spondyloarthropathy group. Then somebody who has got uh, chronic knee arthritis, chronic ankle arthritis, has some EN-like rash. And if, if you just look at patient's chest x-ray, if you see hilar lymphadenopathy, I think it's obviously a great clue to sarcoidosis. So everything depends on our history taking and uh, clinical examination. So uh, coming to a little interesting part, so uh, there is this 70-year-old male which came to us with painful left ankle which started suddenly two days back. On examination, the ankle was hot red and swollen so it is obviously uh, a two days history so it is acute ankle monoarthritis and rest of the joints were okay he gives history of two episodes of pain redness swelling of his right big toe which settled over two to three weeks with NSAIDs and rest he is a known hypertensive and he is on telmisartan and hydrochlorothiazide so this elderly hypertensive male basically has come to us with acute monoarthritis so obviously we need to think about septic arthritis because he is an elderly patient, he could be having underlying diabetes. Crystal is again very important, very high on the cards. Patient can have history of trauma, there, is, there could be hemorthrosis, fracture or it could be just a initial presentation of rheumatoid arthritis. But whenever patient comes to us in OPD or IPD, we need to really think, we need to really focus on the whole scenario. So whenever you have septic, crystal or fracture, these as DDs, we need, to have, uh, we need to look at them very carefully. So I want to ask you all, would you do RF and anti-CCP in such patients? So I think I wouldn't, but it again depends on individual scenario. So apart from basic investigations, we will go for serum uric acid, radiograph. But if possible, I would personally go for joint fluid aspiration for a definitive diagnosis. So synovial fluid aspiration indications, obviously monoarthritis is very important indication. So somebody who has got trauma with joint effusion, some, a monoarthritis patient who has had history of chronic inflammatory polyarthritis or we, when you, are, you have high index of suspicion of septic arthritis. So we uh, know about synovial fluid analysis, we need to look at the appearance whenever we aspirate. If it is septic arthritis, I think the appearance only will give us the clue. The viscosity, WBC cultures, then crystal identification by polarized microscopy. So this is how we do synovial fluid analysis. So uh, in gout uh, or CPPD, we have special scenarios, I am coming to that later. So basically when we aspirate the joint, we need to think about two most important DDs, first being septic arthritis and second being gout. So obviously in this patient we were dealing with gout and as I said it, it was known as diseases of kings which is not true anymore. So it is most common type of inflammatory arthritis, the second most common being rheumatoid arthritis and most common joint to get involved is MTP, then you can have ankle involvement or knee involvement etc. So it's generally associated uh, triggering factors are sudden lowering of serum uric acid and I think uh, most of the times that's a mistake we do. We rely on uric acid in uh, diagnosis of acute gout which should not be done. If patient has history of excessive alcohol intake, if there was history of prior trauma or surgery, especially in men more than 40 years. So the clinical features are sudden onset excruciating pain associated with uh, iridema and uh, very bad swelling. I have discussed about the investigations. So this is the typical feature of podagra or acute gout and if you can see these are proper rad bite erosions. So uh, there is this cousin of gout which is known as CPPD disease and it is a disease of usually elderly patients. So the other risk factors, if at all CPPD is associated with younger uh, people, then other risk factors are primary hyperparathyroidism, hypomagnesemia, hemochromatosis, Gittelman syndrome, then chronic gout itself uh, can be an idus for CPPD disease. The most common joints are knees, then wrists, then shoulders, elbows, ankles, etc. So precipitating factors are trauma, osteoarthritis, rapid increase in serum calcium. Then Apart from the usual labs, we can look at serum calcium, serum magnesium, phosphorus, then radiograph of joint, which can, uh, if especially of knee joint, that, uh, so this is a typical chondrocalcinosis or CPPD disease. Then synovial fluid analysis with polarized microscopy. 
So just a, a brief difference between gout and pseudo gout or CPPD disease. So gout is a disease of middle aged people 40 to 60 and CPPD happens in little elderly population. So first MTP is very commonly involved in gout. Then you see negatively birefringent crystals uh, which are monosodium monohydrate crystals under polarized microscopy in gout whereas you see positively birefringent rhomboid these are blue in bluish in color under these are CPPD crystals uh, calcium pyrophosphate crystals under polarized microscopy. So usually the treatment of gout includes colchicin, NSAIDs or in refractory cases we go for steroids etc. The treatment is not very much different in CPPD patients. So I think the red flag about the monoarthritis is always septic arthritis and most common root of septic arthritis is hematogenous because usually joint uh, fluid or synovial fluid is sterile. So somebody to have a septic arthritis there has to be some disseminated infection in the body or a patient has to be really immunocompromised. So patients who already have some inflammatory arthritis or CTDs those are on long term immunosuppressive therapy they are at increased risk. If you don't treat them properly, uh, it could be very destructive. So special conditions include after surgery, if it is the if antibiotics are not giving properly, if there is some penetrating injury, after say implants or arthroscopy, cons is very coagulase negative staphoreus is very notorious organism to cause septic arthritis. So non gonococcal septic arthritis, the most common ar common uh, organism is staph aureus and most common single joints involved are knees followed by hip. Then in IV drug abusers you can have some atypical joint involvement like spine, SI joint, sternoclavicular involvement etc. So clinical features again these are usual uh, pain, effusion but the effusion will be very high it will be uh, a lot more, there will be decreased range of motion, patients will have associated fever, the routine lab will show leukocytosis, synovial fluid will show some positivity in culture, although the yield is not very good, but the WBC uh, uh, white cell blood, white blood count will be very high in synovial, blood flu in synovial fluid analysis. So I think whenever we are discussing about acute monoarthritis in young patients, gonococcal arthritis has to come in picture. It is caused by gram-negative uh, bacteria, Neisseria gonorrhea, and it is an infectious arthritis of young people who are less than 40 years of age. And women are at much higher risk as compared to males, and they are mu at much higher risk during menses and during pregnancy. And they are also very, they are very much at high risk to develop disseminated gonococcal infection and arthritis. So this disseminated gonococcal infection presents with fever, chills, some articular symptoms like migratory arthritis, some tenosynovitis of knees, wrist, hands, feet, ankles, etc. These patients will have typical rash of uh, uh, hemorrhagic, there will be hemorrhagic pustules and most commonly there will be tenosynovitis. So this, uh, this is about DGI or disseminated gonococcal uh, infection. The true gonococcal arthritis is little uncommon and DGI is much more common than true gonococcal septic arthritis. Unfortunately, synovial fluid analysis or synovial fluid culture or blood culture, they, do, they are very much inconclusive in uh, the setting of uh, gonococcal arthritis or DGI. Mm -hmm. So this is another case. So young female came to us with painful swelling of second toe which came spontaneously seven weeks ago. Examination of other joints is okay. When we examined her, she had this scaly, whitish rash, lace-like rash on her elbows. Obviously, this is a chronic monoarthritis because it is more than six weeks. It is of seven weeks duration. There is absolutely no brainer here. We are dealing with psoriatic arthritis. It's a chronic monoarthritis. So whenever, if we did not have this picture and if patient has come to us with chronic monoarthritis, we obviously need to, uh, especially being in excuse India. Excuse me, uh, we need to stick to time I and mean, you have overshot the time. So can Sorry? you do it fast? Yeah. So we have very few DDs of chronic monoarthritis like few infections like TB, brucella, fungal infections, etc. So I'm, as Dr. Parikshit warned me, I won't get into details of psoriatic arthritis. So again, uh, Dr. Chopra sir yesterday covered about mimics of inflammatory arthritis and the 
commoner being uh, commoner ones are uh, infections and tb arthritis is again uh, very important though it is not very common in uh, these days but it is important it is chronic granulomatous monoarthritis and most common sites apart from a single joint are spine followed by peripheral tubercular arthritis so routine investigations again synovial fluid and synovial tissue if culture is done it will it will be very good and the sensitivity ranges from 80 to 90% but synovial biopsy is really helpful in such cases so this is famous famister triad in cases of uh, tubercular arthritis you see joint space narrowing subchondral cyst formation and ju juxtaarticular osteopenia so fungal arthritis uh, i'm just going to take 2 minutes okay yeah so fungal arthritis not uh, uh, very common it's a rare entity but especially when we had this recent pandemic when there was uh, inappropriate usage of dexamethasone or we in the era of transplant organ transplant i think we do get to see fungal arthritis and candida being one of the most common species and since it's not just an arthritis it can even lead to osteomyelitis patient needs to be treated aggressively with cyanfotericin so other uncommon arthritis are syphilitic arthritis lyme's disease lyme arthritis especially uh, patient who comes to us with monoarthritis if there is history of unpasteurized milk uh, uh, then you need to think about brucellosis etc then pvns uh, this is very uh, very very rare disease it is a non inflammatory proliferative disorder of the synovium and whenever you aspirate synovial fluid it the blood flu the synovial fluid is very much gross red and it is bloody so take home message monoarthritis acute or chronic especially acute needs a prompt evaluation acute inflammatory monoarthritis Uh, at least we have to think that it is septic then only we will uh, evaluate that patient uh, quickly so it is always septic uh, unless proven otherwise synovial fluid investigation evaluation is very important so septic arthritis can also be superimposed on gout and pseudo gout gonococcal arthritis again which is a separate and special entity is usually seen in young population most of the ctds or chronic inflammatory polyarthritis initially can present as monoarthritis in india we need to think about indolent infections and obviously whenever we are dealing with these monoarthritis we have to think about degenerative arthropathies or rare other rare conditions so thank you thank you madam i ask chair person to felicitate dr uh, ekbuti madam I ask Dr. Nisar Sheikh sir to felicitate chair persons please. Monoarthritis session. Our next session will be CTD ILD session. By Dr. Lakshmi Kanth Yenge sir, for his talk on CTD ILD and particular reference to pulmonary sarcoidosis. He has done MD and medicine and DM pulmonary critical care from PJ Chandigarh. He is consultant of respiratory medicine at Vidyanath Mangeshkar Hospital, Pune. For this session, I ask chair persons to be Dr. Shirish Patel sir. डॉक्टर शुभदा कलके मैडम एंड डॉक्टर रोहित आमले सर गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबडी वाइल चेयरपर्सन आर कमिंग वी आर एक्चुअली रनिंग वेरी शॉर्ट ऑफ टाइम एंड एज यूजल लंग्स आर लिटल इग्नोर्ड ऑर्गन इन मोस्ट ऑफ द प्रैक्टिस आई वुड से आई एल स्टिल ट्राई टू be very very brief what i'm planning is uh, to have conclusions first and then discuss if time permits so that we can have actually meaningful discussion 
uh, and uh, whatever I'm going to present possibly is going to incite more questions than uh, uh, the take home messages because the evidence base is very very sketchy so we'll skip so uh, I had some of the apprehensions uh, coming into this uh, talk uh, this is what uh, I felt or imagined myself being one in uh, uh, a lonely land uh, surrounded by rheumatologists and uh, astute uh, internists and I was asked given the task of describing this tree each branch each leaves how they go and uh, how uh, they actually behave. So it is like a gamut of CTDs which can lead to interstitial lung diseases. And then uh, on top of that I was uh, uh, expected to describe sarcoid which I felt is going to be very very difficult task. And this is what you have been listening to over last one and a half days and this is what is to be followed after this talk. So considering all these scenarios uh, I knew what I had to avoid. I had to avoid these four important topics that would be a complete uh, repetition and this is what I felt I can focus on but again uh, one day before uh, I came to uh, Solapur there was a conference in uh, Mumbai which uh, focused on only interstitial lung diseases and the one day conference was not considered to be enough for discussing interstitial lung diseases so only four or five of them were uh, discussed in the entire day. So with this uh, I have some questions for you to keep uh, you interested. So this is the first question, what comes to my mind when I read a CT report which is reported as ILD uh, or uh, okay what comes to my mind when I see a CT which is reported as ILD or DPLD I will come to that uh, little later but just mark your answer I will come back to the answers eventually at the end of uh, presentation. So why uh, should we call actually ILD or uh, DPLD? Uh, I would prefer DPLD because most of these diseases are not restricted to interstitium. Some diseases have infectious triggers. So by definition when you say ILD you tend to ignore the infectious part of it. Uh, so you have ruled out infections which is not the case. Some uh, diffuse parenchymal lung diseases actually we could be part of uh, infection. Uh, diffuse parenchymal lung diseases involve interstitium, vasculature, alveoli and even small airways for that matter. Uh, so interstitial lung disease is something which is uh, misnomer I would say and it uh, so DPLD will include all these, this forms a good starting point and it ex excludes only the pure airway disease as well as pulmonary hypertension. So why do we group them together? If we know the individual entity very well, why do we group them? What is the advantage of grouping them? These are the advantages because they share common clinical, radiological, physiological and even pathological features. So the NSIP of CTD origin or NSIP of idiopathic origin is, uh, looks the same on pathology. Organizing pneumonia of CTD origin or uh, idiopathic one, cryptogenic uh, uh, organizing pneumonia looks the same on pathology. So DPLD is my preferred term nowadays at least at the time of working diagnosis because you don't have to go back and change your diagnosis retrospectively. You can just add on to the subsequent uh, uh, added entities like DPLD, NSIP plus OP pattern eventually I get a myositis panel positive with some features of uh, uh, arthritis uh, that becomes antisynthetase syndrome and whether it is active or in remission this becomes a complete diagnosis I don't have to go back and change my initial diagnosis or working diagnosis. So with that I will come back to the real life scenario because the conference says the grassroots rheumatology for the grassroots so the grassroots for us is patients and patients in rural areas with a lot of resource limitations which we have discussed yesterday. So 57 year old female uh, had presented to emergency on uh, 20, August 22 with breathlessness of class 3, class 4, uh, uh, class 4 with dry cough fatigue about, uh, of about a month's duration and she uh, gave history of uh, some uh, uh, why is it changing on its own? Okay, so uh, it gave, uh, uh, she gave history of fever on probing only. So she was referred for second, uh, my opinion on 13th of September, just three days before uh, this conference. Uh, after extensive evaluation for about uh, two weeks, in, including an hospitalization. On examination, she had saturation of 93%, chest had bilateral repetitions. How do we proceed in this particular scenario is the question. 
So how do, how do you approach a DPLD in a patient without uh, known rheumatological disorder uh, presenting first time? So HRCT test, inspiratory, expiratory and prone. Uh, once DPLD has confirmed ANA by immunofluorescence uh, uh, and uh, all these tests to be done and if there are any specific pointers, uh, we can do the extended workup. I will not go into the details of that uh, for the lack of time now. So uh, there will be a question, why should the all patients with DPLD undergo such an extensive evaluation? Uh, so these are the common rheumatological disorders which we look uh, at. Uh, the, you may, not, may, uh, may or may not agree with the sequence. Uh, these are the, uh, the, this is the prevalence of DPLD in individual uh, DPLDs and this is the proportion of patients who can present even before uh, uh, the diagnosis of CTD is made. So uh, considering all these proportions, I think uh, it is uh, mandatory for us to uh, consider uh, uh, evaluation for CTDs in patients who present with isolated interstitial lung disease as a first presentation. So that was the point number one. Uh, uh, so what are the most common CTD related DPLDs which we encountered? This depends on individual to individual based on the practice setting and the, uh, the group of patients you cater to. If you are primarily looking at referral patients, then that proportion will be completely different which is usually a referral bias. So in my practice, I think interstitial pneumonia with atomine feature is something which forms the large chunk of my interstitial lung disease patients. May or may not be true for all the, uh, uh, the settings. So the most common CTD DPLD encountered by us uh, may be different. So uh, there has been an evaluation of uh, prospective evaluation of patients with uh, interstitial pneumonia with attitude immune feature who eventually will develop uh, CTD or definable CTD and uh, over about 5 years or uh, even extended follow up uh, only 7 out of 52 uh, were classified as CTD and the most common one among them was uh, Jogren syndrome in 4 patients and rheumatoid arthritis in 2 patients. Uh, so moving to the scenario 2, which is 34 year old female, progressive skin tightness, Raynaud's phenomena, painful dysphagia, GERD and breathlessness of class 2, how do we proceed? I will allow my rheumatologist colleagues to uh, some time at crease and let them evaluate. I will just advise patient about vaccines and some baseline investigations to be followed uh, for objective evaluation. I would ask them to review after 3 months. If time permits, we will come back to the details of these scenarios later. So the third scenario is 56 year old female had a pulmonary tuberculosis in 1989 treated for 3 years details of which are not available. Rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed in 2018 for which she was not taking any, any allopathic medications and following allopathic Ayurvedic treatment. And uh, in January 20 she came with fever, cough, breathlessness, initial evaluation suggested possibility of uh, MDR tuberculosis and that is why she was referred to us. So on examination she has had breathlessness at rest, resting saturation was 87, desaturated on minimal exertion, tachycardia, tachypnea and decreased based on some left hemithorax which was consistent with the fibrocavity disease on the left side. However, she had crepitations on the right hemithorax. So uh, what are the goals in this particular scenario? The immediate goals are to look for infections aggressively, keep disease activity in mind, she has not been treated for rheumatoid arthritis and look for other unrelated causes of worsening and uh, evaluate accordingly. Okay, so let us visit these uh, uh, subsequently and this is what I would uh, keep as a uh, take home for these three scenarios. So presenting without CTD features, complete autoimmune workup at baseline is must for all patients who are diagnosed as ILD. The second scenario is presenting with CTD features, allow rheumatologists to have look and evaluate accordingly. And the third scenario is a patient of known CTD who is presenting with uh, interstitial pattern. So this is for all of us to uh, cater to. Everybody of us should keep an internist within us alive, even if we are practicing a very, very sub-specialized area. Still we have to uh, take into consideration all the possible aspects of the, uh, the diseases which can affect the patient and we will have to evaluate. Uh, we will come to that if time permits subsequently. So baseline evaluation, what are the baseline evaluation which should be done for most patients with or all patients with interstitial lung disease? There are two goals. One is to try and cement the diagnosis. So the additional investigations will be targeted at that and the subsequently uh, uh, functional assessment of the patient uh, for uh, sequential monitoring. So the first and foremost test for this is 6 minute walk test, very easy to be done. Though the, uh, the methodology is not standardized in Indian languages but still it is 
very useful for sequential monitoring especially if the patient can walk if patient is not able to walk or limited by orthopedic or neurological dis uh, disabilities then it cannot be uh, a reliable guide but if patient can walk any ambulatory patient with interstitial lung disease the first test or if i had to choose only one test possibly six minute walk test will be the only test the gold standard for disease monitoring is pyrometry with fvc sequential fvc measurement DLCO, if accessible, uh, is uh, desirable and CT fibrosis score is something which is coming up. I will not go into the de details of that for the lack of time. So what is the treatment that must be there in the prescription of a patient with DPLD? This is the question and I want all of you to mark the answer. We will come back to the questions. The question part definitely I am going to come back at the end of presentation even if I am not able to elaborate on other aspects because of lack of time. So, uh, perifenidone, nintadanib, either of these, both of these, none of these. these. These are the options and which of the following drugs are FDA approved for treatment of systemic sclerosis uh, associated interstitial lung disease? Again, mark your answer, we will come back and this is, uh, mind you, a PGI type question where you can have multiple uh, uh, options correct. Pharmacotherapy for CTD, DPLD, I, uh, India, not all patients with uh, CTD, ILD require treatment. That is the only take home message I would like you to uh, take from this. What exactly are the indications? I will skip for the lack of time. And these are all trials. I will not go into details of them. Uh, most of you are aware of these trials. Only one trial I, I actually wanted to go into detail just for the sake of clarity how one should go about reading the evidence. However, since we are already running out of time uh, or uh, already overdue, so I will not go into the details. Though the results of this particular study suggest extremely good uh, diversion of uh, uh, the graphs uh, and they look fancy, they, they, everything looks very, very dramatic, but there are a lot of flaws in this particular study. And just because this is published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, I would not accept because of these two facts. The, the publication was August 2020 almost ascending curve of the COVID times where everybody was afraid of COVID and lung fibrosis and second thing the drug involved in the study was tocilizumab, Actemra. So anything if in that time was sent for publication with COVID or Actemra as a name I think it would have been published in any of the journals uh, and if they did not find the adequate space possibly they would have published as a supplement and this trial was also published as a supplement and not in the main journal. And uh, fascinatingly, based on these uh, two uh, trials, one trial which included 87 patients and the other trial included only 100 and 210 patients, the FDA has granted approval for this particular drug to be used in systemic sclerosis ILD. The same FDA did not approve the uh, pyrfenidone uh, for treatment, despite a data of more than 1,500 patients published five years before. They took five years to analyze data, data and they did not approve grant the approval till 2014. They asked for two more extra trials to be conducted in US population and it was granted approval along with Nindedanib, which is the American molecule. So these are the some of the finer points. I would have loved to go into details, but yes, because of lack of time, I will not go into that. And uh, this is the summary which is given by Dr. Handa, recently published uh, in 2022. So this is small article about uh, five, six pages. All of you can go through, but again, nothing is cemented. Uh, you can choose any of the agents, which patient to select, which patient to be treated is very gray zone at this moment. There are no concrete answers, but these are the preferences at the max. And even Dr. Handa keeps uh, tocilizumab as a second line agent in systemic sclerosis ILD. However, till some time back, we felt that RAILD and myositis uh, ILD does not require treatment, but uh, it is still uh, uh, the treatment is recommended for that and myositis uh, uh, as all of you know is can have a devastating ILD and it needs to be treated very aggressively. So uh, non-immunomodulation therapy, antifibrotics, I will not go into uh, details of that now, I will come to the conclusion at the end. Uh, pulmonary sarcoid not very rare in this country is what I wanted to uh, tell. Diagnosis requires biopsy or at least uh, FNA from the lymph node. Manto is usually negative, indication for therapy are very few, not all patients diagnosed with sarcoidosis require treatment and they need to be uh, followed carefully. Prednisolone at present remains the mainstay of therapy, pulmonary involvement, large size of lymph nodes are only soft indicators, so just lung involved, so we need to treat uh, sarcoid is not the correct logic. 
progressive pulmonary involved merit treatment, prednisolone, methotrexate, uh, prednisolone is mainstay, methotrexate is the second most studied and as a, has, is equally efficacious now. And Dr. Dheeraj Gupta who was, uh, who has had very keen interest in sarcoidosis and uh, the PJ was the uh, highest volume centre for sarcoidosis, continues to be the highest volume centre for sarcoidosis. Uh, I think uh, all, all the controls you have taken over, even slides you are changing, it's okay. So why, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so uh, methotic set uh, is most studied. He used to say that I am yet to see a patient uh, even after 15 years of practice who has required anything more than steroids and methotrexate in sarcoidosis. So most of the times agents beyond that are not required and even steroids are likely to be replaced by methotrexate. This is a trial which possibly will give us the results. Uh, moving on to the very contentious topic of antifibrotic in DPLD, I have uh, already taken only conclusion points, I have not gone into the details. Pirfenidone and Nintadanib both have approved for IPF alone. Nintadanib is approved for systemic sclerosis associated DPLD. Nintadanib has reasonable data in progressive fibrosing DPLD of any other etiology, uh, however not approved yet. Now progressive fibrosing ILD or progressive fibrosing DPLD is being called progressive, uh, now being called progressive pulmonary fibrosis. This is a different entity. Pirifenodone is on the way to produce data for most indications where nintadanib is approved and there is hardly anything to choose between these two agents. So for antifibrotics, uh, IPF, yes, systemic sclerosis, yes, others not very uh, uh, good database and it is not absolutely required. Only if there is progression documented on serial functional assessment, just not because I feel patient has progressed, I will start on pirifenodone or nintadanib is not valid indication. We have to document objective progression. The criteria is defined, I am not going into details of that. Monitoring of CTD DPLD, this is what uh, is uh, usually followed or should be followed, depends on which tests are available to you, which tests are not available. Frequency also depends on what is the underlying diagnosis, but this is roughly the framework which we can go with. Management of advanced DPLD, rehabilitation, supplemental O2 transplant can be considered for even for CTD ILD. Don't go by the perception that somebody who has had atomic inflection of the lung should not be considered as a candidate for transplant. Because uh, the median survival post transplant is roughly 5 to 7 years now, it is evolving, going to towards 7 and the primary killer is bronchiolitis obliterans and not the primary disease. So uh, this was considered a relative contraindication for transplant when the transplant program began, but now it is not no more so. Timely input of the palliative care is something which I would uh, recommend you to consider. So coming back to the answers, scenario 1, how do we proceed, uh, that particular patient finally turned out to be uh, anti rho 52 positive, other markers negative, she discharge rated about 5% on uh, 6 minute walk test, she has been started on mycophenolate, uh, CPK has been sent and she has been advised uh, rheumatology opinion and come back for follow up, objective assessment will be done after 4 weeks and then based on that uh, intensification or uh, de-intensification of immunosuppression may be considered, but yes, mycophenolate, I agree, don't, doesn't work in four weeks, but uh, over a uh, few months time. Scenario two, uh, the patient is still following with rheumatologist, is yet to come back for follow-up. Let's uh, see after three months what will happen. And the third scenario is, I would have liked Excuse to go me, into sir, the details. Excuse me, sir, we are really running out of time. We yes, are sir, very sir, late. Sir, and I'm I done. think if you have finished with the uh, main talk, I am done sir, I am done yeah. sir, just the, the, the third patient is still alive and doing uh, good. So uh, coming to the answers of the questions which I have asked, so this is uh, the first one, what comes to my mind, I want to see the CT, what is the treatment that must be there, none of these are not mandatory for any ILD, just because ILD is reported or fibrosis is that they don't need not be on antifibrotics. And finally, which of the following drugs are FDA approved? Nintadanib and tocilizumab are the only drugs which are approved for uh, treatment of systemic sclerosis ILD. Others are used, they have reasonable database, but they are not yet approved uh, by FDA. With this, I think uh, we can... Thank you, thank you, sir, for such a laboratory session on ILD. May I request all chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Yenge, sir.
I request Dr. Firoz Sayed sir to felicitate all chairpersons please. session on vasculitis i hand over mic to my colleague dr amay vidya he will be anchoring hence forward to all dignitaries and delegates uh, i know everybody might be waiting for the lunch break i thank dr yogesh veerapurkar sir for conducting sessions till now very tedious and long sessions uh, with utmost grace so continuing today with same pace to our next session we have uh, vasculitis uh, which has two components. The first one is suspected vasculitis and how to evaluate it by Dr. Nachiket Kulkarni sir, uh, who is a renowned rheumatologist whose academic and professional expertise has earned him a niche in rheumatology on local and national platform. Uh, his training and work experience expanses for more than a decade and he is also secretary of MRA conference. For this session, I request our chairpersons, Dr. Rizwan ul sir, Dr. Rajesh Patil sir and Dr. Pravin Patil sir. So in interest of time, probably I'll start. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, dear colleagues, I understand your predicament. It's Sunday and we are discussing rheumatology, the most tedious of topics. And top it off, uh, we are trying to keep you away from lunch, which seems to be sumptuous. Uh, but I'll try to do my best and take you to that lunch hour at the earliest. So I've been, can we, can we change the slide though? So I've been told to talk on how we evaluate uh, and suspect vasculitis. Before we go and embark on that, we need to understand how we are going to unravel that. We are first going to understand the concept of vasculitis, then go on to know when to suspect, then go on to know when not to suspect. The tools that are going to under make us understand these two perspectives and then design an approach on how we have understood in these earlier next only 10 slides. So what you understand about vasculitis is inflammation of blood vessel wall. And with this inflammation, the blood vessels are taking all the conduit everywhere. So you have that blood inflammation in the blood vessel wall and going to every organ of the body and hence you are going to have this right sided constitutional features. Because the blood vessel was inflamed, the lumina of the blood vessel is going to get compromised gradually and gradually and hence you are going to have ischemic features. Now it's not only constitutional and ischemic, because of the inflammation of the blood vessel wall, the blood vessel wall becomes leaky. And you will have, have those RBCs blood leaking out into uh, the tissue leading to hemorrhagic features as we see in hemoptysis or hematuria in a glomerular nephritis. Or you might, and we also see the inflammatory cells going into the tissue and hence you would see CNS vasculitis or we would see cardiomyopathies that come with anka vasculitis. Now the concept of vasculitis has to be understood in concept of which blood vessel it gets involved. So Chapel Hill in 2012 came up with a classification and this is a very good pictogram which could help us understand that uh, though not by watertight compartments but by general uh, rough understanding the vasculitis can be considered those which involve only the large vessel, those which involve the medium vessels and those which involve the small vessels. Uh, some understanding concept is when we are talking of vasculitis we are taking the arteries and veins together. So there would be middle vessel vasculitis, uh, medium to small vessel vasculitis that we see in Anka, where you would have arteries, capillaries, venules uh, and capillaritis venules also involved. Now why this differentiation is to be done and then this chapel head realized that apart from vasculitis which predominantly involves small or medium or large, there are quite a bit of etiologies which can involve all vasculature. So you would have Bechet's and Kogan's which can involve practically every known vascular bed. You have these connective tissue disorder related vasculitis which can probably also involve patchy in some organ small, in some organ large and this variability needs to be captured. 
we feel now it's very difficult. You have some diseases which can involve all blood vessels. We feel that some uh, diseases are involved only f fixed blood vessels. And how are we going to diagnose them? Believe me, it's only clinical deductive skills that are going to help us make that diagnosis. So, so let's take one step at a time. When you suspect a vasculitis, is when you have unexplained ischemic involvement of organs. We knew that one pathophysiology of vasculitis is ischemia. We know that multi-system involvement with systemic features is there because they are going to be constitutional features. There is a single in organ involvement sometimes which is typical of that vasculitic involvement or a secondary cause having rapid single or multiple organ involvement. Just keep in mind and all these lines would make sense in next two, three slides. To embark on unraveling the earlier four questions, how let us understand how a typical small vessel vasculitis, how a typical medium vessel vasculitis and how a typical large vessel vasculitis may behave. So small vessel vasculitis involves the vascular beds of lung, of the skin and of the renal uh, tissue. And hence you would have glomerular nephritis with active urinary sediment. You would have hemoptysis because the blood would be leaking out into the alveoli and you would have palpable purpura because of the inflammation as well as leaking of blood in the cutaneous vasculature. The medium vessels uh, have tender nodules, skin and mucosal ulcers, mononeuritis multiplex, organ ischemia. But there are some vasculitis like Anka associated vasculitis where small and medium might co-inhabit and hence Basic understanding of these clinical physiology is to be known, but they are never watertight. The large vessel vasculitis would predominantly either be headaches which are inflammatory or constitutional symptoms related or ischemic symptoms like claudication or loss of pulses. So now we know small is organ involvement, medium is cutaneous and uh, systemic involvement and large is inflammatory or uh, ischemic involvement. So when we mix the anatomical structure that Chapel Hill classification gave, put in them the basic understanding of clinical physiology of small, middle, large and then add some more demographic features which is exactly what a clinical examination and clinical deductive skills are, we can then make it very easy. So you have uh, elderly gentlemen with headaches, with some uh, uh, with constitutional features and with large vessel vasculitic like symptoms and that makes you probably think of giant cell arthritis or you have a young lady or a young man uh, with headaches and constitutional features and loss of pulse and there it goes takayasus no blood test required only clinical deductive skill so if you have typical features of middle vessel vasculitis and you have skin and mucocutaneous and lymph nodes then you go towards kawasaki or even the uh, multi-system involvement of COVID behaves in that way, where you had skin lesions, where you had neuropathy, where you had lung involvement and then mucosal involvement too. And when there is all of middle vessel vasculitis, but none of skin and lymph nodes, and then there is where your polyarthritis nodosa is being diagnosed by. In small vessel vasculitis, this is a, though a subgroup among vasculitis is very heterogeneous. Many few, many diagnoses would come within that composite, but essentially, if you have uh, features of small vessel vasculitis and then uh, you have systemic features which are out of proportion or significant systemic features, the possibility that you are dealing with an Anka vasculitis or Anka associated vasculitis is high and when there are very typical features of let's say henoch Shanlin, you have skin involvement, you have joint involvement and you have renal involvement but the constitutional features are not that great, the possibility that this is Anka goes down and the possibility that it's just henoch Shanlin goes high. So understanding the disease understanding how different vasculitis roughly present and understanding demographies and how they present would make us give us 70 to 80 percent of that diagnosis. How do we further finalize it? So if you have a large vessel vasculitis to confirm, you depend more on imaging and angiogram. And if it is small or medium vasculitis that you have to confirm, you depend on serologies or biopsy. So ankas are going to help you deduce those small vessel vasculitis of lung, uh, pulmonary as well as uh, pulmonary and renal but basic understanding of that as opposed to ANA where IF stands to be a more better uh, specific test IF or immunofluorescence in ANCA would be a screening test because it captures a lot of noise along other antigens also give a cytoplasmic or a perinuclear pattern but ELISA would help us understand directly the pathogenic antigen which is required for that vasculitis and that is PR3 and MPO. You combine both and you increase the specificity but decrease the sensitivity but still combining both might be a better option when you are in doubt. But behold, an ANCA negative vasculitis can also exist 
and exists to the tune of following values of about 20% of active untreated wageners, that is GPA, 30% of limited wageners, and 30% of MBA to that is mild, uh, and 50% of Scholz Ross syndrome, that is eGPA. So significant number of patients would be suffering from Anka vasculitis, but would be negative for Anka when you are trying to examine. At that time, you have to go back to your clinical detective skills and understand how vasculitis really presents itself. A false positive Ankas are known in many infections as well as secondary connect as as of association of secondary connective tissue disorders. So about small vasculitis, we understood that it's serology. About large vasculitis, we understood that there was imaging. Now, though this is a very uh, summarized slide of very exhaustive recommendations that ULAR came in 2018, and I would not recommend everybody just to take this slide as sine qua non and use it in your clinical practice. But let this be a starting point, and you go through those classic classical features, uh, through those uh, uh, recommendations. But roughly. US, uh, when we talk of giant, uh, large vessel vasculitis, they are essentially distributed between those which involve the cranial, extracranial involvement and those which involve the outer and below. So the cra cranial, extracranial arteries are a part of giant cell arthritis, the outer and below are a part of Takayasu's arthritis. So the giant cell arthritis is better diagnosed by USG, the disease can also be monitored by USG, it can be well diagnosed and monitored by MRI. Uh, and CT angiography, PET CT and conventional angiography minded are not recommended. But the same differs significantly when you are dealing with an aortic pathology. So if aorta is inflamed, the USG comes out to be of no consequence because it is not going to penetrate deep below and identify the aortic inflammation. There is where you have the CT angiography, the MRI angiography and the PET CT which would have, uh, which would give a diagnostic, uh, sometimes in some cases predictive, in some cases monitoring tool also. The conventional angiography probably in a case of Takayasu's might, should never be required, if at all required only when you have an intervention in mind. We have understood the clinical phenotype, we have understood the tools, but we need to understand what are the other mimics that come and might be wrongly diagnosed with us as vasculitis. So, there are infectious causes, atherosclerosis, congenital clauses. Essentially what you see out here is those disorders which have a predominant multifocal thrombotic tendency. But the diff classical difference that we can understand that, though in a case of atherosclerosis you might have a peripheral vascular disease and a thrombosis of a digital tip, there will be no constitutional features. There will be no other systemic involvement. So again a clinical perspective of reading the context of whether that digital gangrene exists with other systemic involvements makes us differ that we are probably dealing with mimic and not uh, with a actual primary vasculitis syndrome. Even so, when you are dealt with, with a doubt about what we are dealing with, uh, in a suspicion doing these evaluations for mimics might help us better than doing specific evaluations for the vasculitis. So the mimics are mainly infections uh, and uh, uh, cardiovascular causes and secondary are dominantly connective tissue disorder related. So summarizing, uh, we have read, when, uh, we have understood the concept of vasculitis, we have understood how small, middle and large vessel vasculitis tentatively behave, we have understood that the tools are clinical detective skills and lab and imaging, and imaging for large vessel vasculitis. Let us summarize this approach. So in a patient of suspected vasculitis, you try to identify whether it is small, middle and large based on clinical reasoning. The small are those which involve the skin, lung, renal. The middle are those which are skin, nerve, organ ischemia and may or may not have cutaneous or mucosal involvement. And large would be dominantly ischemic like claudication like syndromes. And then if you have large, you will go with the correct imaging for a cranial, extracranial, GCA type, phenotype, USG for an aortic type involvement, MRI. For middle, it's clinical plus biopsy or imaging as required for that case. And for small vessel vasculitis, if it's a single organ involvement, let's say renal or cutaneous, a biopsy might help or doing a correct autoantibody profile to identify which form of vasculitis might help. Now, these are not watertight, these are suggestive and probably every case is a different mimicker among, even among vasculitis for us to consider. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, explaining such an expansive topic uh, that is evaluation of vasculitis in such a concise manner. I request our chairperson to felicitate uh, Dr. Nanjiket Kulkarni, sir.
now for second subsection in vasculitis that is management of vasculitis i would like to request our next speaker that is uh, dr jyotsna ok ma'am uh, renowned senior rheumatologist from mumbai with over 25 years of experience uh, and was head of department of rheumatology at sian hospital the chairperson for this session will remain same yeah i would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here i'm sure uh, i'll try to listen my lecture as much as possible so that i don't stand between you and the lunch so uh, dr nachiket has actually made my life very easy because he has already told you various ways of examining the patient as well as coming to a right conclusion regarding what is the size of the vessel which is in, which is uh, involved in case of vasculitis go to the second slide Ah uh, yeah. So as he had said already that the large vessel vasculitis, which is a uh, topic for today, is a group of disorders where there is inflammation and necrosis of the vessel wall, and because of this, it really leads to ischemia as well as loss of integrity of the vessel wall, leading to hemorrhage. Now, presence of the leukocytes in the vessel wall is important on the biopsy. You know that many times after the thrombosis, the leukocytes are seen in the histopathology. but you must see that there are leukocytes in the vessel wall with the reactive damage to the mural structures and secondly it's a multi system disease we know that most of the vasculitis are multi system he has already given you the classification i'll straight away come to this different case is a 63 year old male patient with a type 2 diabetes and he had a fronto parietal headache with constant dull aching feeling for one month which was moderate to severe intensity and that is how he came to the hospital he had a sudden painless loss of vision in the left eye when he had come and the patient had a past history of recurrent low grade fever which was very important and these episodes were running for almost 20 days he had some uh, time once only a jaw claudication but not much significantly there his vitals were stable he had systemic examination which was normal peripheral pulses were felt there was no carotid bruy over there but the fundus examination was also normal the left eye he was complaining of loss of vision it was non reactive to light and the mr showed brain vessel wall imaging with the optic nerve cuts we had taken to know what is the cause of blindness and that was suggestive of tortuous bilateral superficial temporal arteries so this case was actually diagnosed because of very high suspicion in the mind elderly individual headache followed by visual loss and on examination we found that the esr and crp were very high and ana was negative so this is typically a presentation of giant cell arthritis where historically it was referred as temporal arthritis but now also called as giant cell arthritis it's an inflammation of medium size vessel as well as large size vessel and most commonly it involves the extra cranial involvement of the carotid it's closely associated usually with polymyalgia rheumatica but not always so so you can get upper limb involvement in the form of myalgia arthralgia and patient can have extreme fatigue as well as pu like type of reaction and you know that one of the diseases which you have to think in pu is vasculitis and the polymyalgia rheumatica as well as gca now when we saw that there patient can have diplopia patient can have arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy which is very important to be known they can also get posterior ischemic optic neuropathy seen in less number of patients or they can have central retinal artery obstruction you can have patchy choroidal non perfusion on fluorescent angiography and can be seen due to inflammation of retinal and optic nerve vessels so a good ophthalmologist is required to come to the final conclusion this pathophysiology i will not go into the details because not that every time you will get tortuous temporal artery if you get it and if you have a doubt in the mind you can do a temporal artery biopsy and he has already told you what the biopsy significance is you have to take a large segment for the biopsy because after the formalin fixation you require at least 1 cm length of the temporal artery so you can either do ultrasound guided biopsy so that you know which section is to be biopsied and then you can get perhaps almost 85 to 87% specificity so biopsies sometimes do not always correlate to the clinical scenario and another thing is you may not be able to see if there is a prolonged glucocorticoid therapy up to 15 days of glucocorticoid therapy you can still get patches of inflammation and the formation of 
giant cells which can be seen in this slide. Now, what are the goals of treatment in the large vessel vasculitis? One is a rapid diagnosis. You do not want the patient to have any visual loss. Reduce the risk of complications such as blindness in giant cell arthritis. In other large vessel vasculitis, which I will come to it little later, and that is aortic aneurysms and vascular stenosis. So many times we can get an overlap of GCA with aortic involvement. So that is why this slide also mentions the aortic aneurysms. Now, what are the key symptoms which I have already told you? The terms which are used for describing the pattern of vasculitis in GCA have just changed in 2018 and they no more use the term flare of a disease. They say it is a relapse of a disease. And the major relapses are really characteristic with recurrences of active disease with the clinical features of ischemia including either limb claudication, upper limbs and the lower limbs both. They can have visual symptoms. They can have scalp necrosis in a very bad patient and evidence of active aortic inflammation which can be seen either on CT aortogram or by doing the MR angio. Evidence of active aortic inflammation, it results into progressive aortic and large vessel, vessel dilatation and aneurysm formation. The minor relapses do not show any of these features of major relapses. So what is the treatment? The first thing is the correct diagnosis of an active giant cell arthritis. Then you can start glucocorticoids in a dose of 1 milligram per kg and you give almost 60 milligram. The main problem with glucocorticoids is the side effects like infections, hypertension, diabetes and so on. But still the relapses of GCA are always dependent on termination of glucocorticoid therapy. So as you try to reduce very fast, you can get more relapses. So that requires to be kept in the mind of a rheumatologist. You can consider the use of intravenous methylprednisolone whenever there is problem of blindness. Here you cannot be treating with oral steroids. In patients who already have contraindications for giving glucocorticoid therapy, then you have another option that is a phase 2 where you can start tocilizumab in these patients. Tocilizumab or methotrexate both are advised to be given in patients who have got contraindications for GC. Whenever you have got major relapses, either you can go to 40 to 60 milligrams of steroid or you can go to the just prior dose of the steroid. You require to give prolonged treatment at least for a period of 6 months to 1 year before you try to establish the fact that the patient has got a quiet disease. So these are 2018 ULAR recommendations for the pharmacological treatment. IL-6 antibody that is tocilizumab has been tried not in very large number of patients but yes it has got good efficacy and the way it is to be given is not always uh, in refractory cases sometimes in severe cases as well and you can give monthly infusions of tocilizumab 8 milligram or 4 milligram per kg and after 6 months of the tocilizumab maybe you can have a least possible dose of glucocorticoid to be used as a maintenance therapy. So most of the published reports, almost 24 patients of tocilizumab are treated which are having GCA. Other immunosuppressants, the data is not very convincing like ustekinumab, azathioprine, leflunamide. These drugs are used for the maintenance therapy. The randomized clinical trials wherein methotrexate has been used are again there but not a very convincing thing. But all of us are using methotrexate to reduce the dose of uh, steroid. Findings from a small series of the patient where leflunamide was given, again it's a very small series and I don't think we are using. Mycophenolate is another drug which has got a very promising result and you can use up to 2 to 3 grams of mycophenolate as a continuous therapy after you are trying to reduce your dose of steroids or some patients can be given both uh, glucocorticoids as well as methotrexate and or MMF together. So you can use even other drugs like cyclosporine or tacrolimus in these patients where you want to reduce the dose of steroid. The second case is of large vessel vasculitis that is aortitis where this was a 21 year old female patient with no comorbidities was first time seen with a past history of episodes where she had come with sudden and painless blood, blurring of vision for just one day. She had a past history similarly once before and when we saw her, the blood pressure was extremely high, 200 by 130. The lab parameters showed ESR was high. Lipid uh, profile also showed that she had a very high cholesterol. 
and she had bilateral peripheral pulses which were very feeble. The systemic examination was normal and there was no bruit heard on the abdominal aorta, renal artery or even the carotids. Imaging which was done on ultrasound and renal color Doppler I will be showing you in the CT renal angiogram was done and it showed that she had a normal left kidney whereas the right kidney was completely dysfunctioning. So she had very severe renal artery stenosis, this is the left kidney which was normal and the right kidney was absolutely non-visible. This is one of the manifestation of Takayasu's, we are al always taught that Takayasu is pulseless disease and you can get brui, carotidinia, headache and so on but sometimes the patients can really uh, come with such kind of emergencies and because of renal artery stenosis they can have malignant hypertension as well. So generally speaking, this is a mistake in this slide that female to male ratio usually is 8 is to 1 and involves mainly the aorta. There is a difference between the childhood aorta arthritis and the adult. Usually in the adult you get more of aortic arch syndrome where all the tributaries coming from the aortic arch are involved where a childhood takayasu is mainly the lower abdominal aorta and they, can, they are the ones who are getting this kind of renal artery stenosis. The treatment depends on two things, what is the disease activity and what is the extent of the involvement of aorta. So every time when you see a new patient of Takayasu, please see all the aspects of the patient. You can do the CT aortogram, you can do the PET scan, you can do multiple investigations as suggested by Dr. Nachiket and then try to form a therapy wherein you are going to answer what is the organ involvement and what is the immediate problem that the patient could be having. Again, 2018 EULA recommendations is to diagnose the active Takayasu disease. One small thing which I realized while reading about this topic is pre-pulseless phase of the Takayasu. If you can actually demonstrate that the patients have got active inflammation in aorta or its, or its branches in the pre-pulseless stage, then maybe you will be able to reduce all the components of complications of Takayasu in the form of aneurysm, dilatation or complete stenosis. So I will come to the last few slides of mine. The clinical course here was 602 patients and here this group of Dr. Danda who has done enormous work in aorto arthritis and we all should be proud of the fact that the most data is coming from India because we know that Takayasu is the one which is mainly seen in the Asian uh, group of the con continent. Herein they have showed how the difference between the childhood Takayasu and the adult Takayasu would be and that is definitely telling us how to see for complications in individual patients. Uh, now the treatment is of course anti-hypertensive management but also the lipid management like in our patient who had very high cholesterol. Antiplatelet drugs, some, pe some people do not advocate antiplatelet drugs but there are multiple trials which have shown that the complications of CVA with hypertension are definitely reduced when you are using antihypertensive drugs. Is there any role of surgical treatment and what is supportive treatment and immunosuppression? So this is something atherosclerosis which is also seen in Takayasu disease and this is a uh, study wherein they had found out that in patients of SLE as well as in Takayasus both you can get very enhanced atherosclerosis and that is the reason the stroke problems as well as the myocardial infarction problems could be seen much more in Takayasu disease as well as in SLE with vasculitis. Antiplatelet therapy for the prevention of arterial ischemic events in Takayasu disease and this is again an article wherein they have shown that hypertension is one of the major risk factors. If the patient has got hypertension with Takayasu, please do not hesitate to use antiplatelet drugs because they are the patients in the long run would be going into either CVA or myocardial infarction. Immunosuppressants definitely have a role to play to reduce the dose of steroids like methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate and cyclophosphamide in resistant patients IV IgG also has been tried. Now the treatment of steroid resistant or the relapsing Takayasu disease, we always are using the term relapsing and not the flare. Methotrexate is a good drug to be used to reduce the dose of steroids and can definitely prevent side effects. What is classically term as refractory disease in Takayasu. Uh, one is that there was a Turkish Takayasu arthritis study wherein they have shown that angiographic and clinical progression 
if it is seen in spite of giving steroid treatment or immunosuppression, the presence of any of these following characteristic that is prednisolone dose which is required for more than 6 months treatment and that too as high as 7.5 milligram per day. If there is a need for surgery due to persistent disease activity, frequent flares which are seen in more than 3 per year and the death of course is considered as a one of the uh, refractory takayasus and biological agents which are reserved for the patients for refractory takayasu. So whenever there is refractory takayasu, right in the beginning, suppose you come across refractory takayasu who has this kind of a prior history, do not hesitate to use uh, better drugs or which are uh, more potent. Biological agents which have been tried is infliximab, rituximab, tocilizumab, abatacep and of course tacrolimus. Mizoribin, there are some trials which are there. Yes, I'll be finishing. This is my last perhaps. So, Mizoribin is one of the drugs which has been again seen in the literature and has been as much uh, potent as azathioprine and action is almost similar to mycophenolate and we may get more literature. Indications for surgery is critical cerebrovascular ischemia, coronary artery ischemia, extreme extremity claudications and severe renal artery stenosis. If you have progressive aneurysm enlargement with a tendency for dissection or the rupture. This is one of the things which I have seen in one of the patients where we always teach the students that in Takayasus we do not get gangrenous changes mostly. Why? Because there is always collaterals because it's a very slow process and we do not get gangrenes. But some of the situations where you can get gangrene is thrombus formation in aneurysm and that thrombus can lead to gangrenous changes. So you please try to understand that this is something that you are always sitting on a peak of a volcano of your aortoarthritis patient. When they come, you have to really, really carefully palpate all the vessels. And I want to say something about Dr. Hasse, who was our mentor in uh, Sion Hospital, who always used to teach in the clinic that please palpate all the vessel and vascular territory is the sixth organ which you are supposed to see. So he used to say not only the cardio, cardio uh, examination but palpate all the vessels and majority of the takayasus we have identified by just palpating all the vessels in the patients of hypertension. So critical arterial stenosis if it is short segment you can do the balloon angioplasty and if it is a long segment then you can do the bypass surgery including PTCA which is done in stenotic renal arteries. Pregnancy I am not covering because I think many people have already covered it. The last slide is the Takayasu activity index which has been validated by again our people and that is Dr. Ramnath Mishra and Dr. Danda. This is the only validated index which has been accepted in the world literature and this is ITAS 2010 wherein almost 44 domains were used and they have done the validity of almost 600 to 700 patients and this thing is now including the literature whenever you want to come across about any improvement in this thing. Lastly, this is the comment which I want to make that whether sustained remission is any time possible in Takayasu or large vessel arthritis and the answer sadly is not so much. Only 20% of the patient in spite of all the treatment can achieve remission which can be called as remission and now they have advocated that you have to use steroids for the long duration almost for one year or two years do not try to reduce steroids jumping fast you give sustained therapy and always give combination therapy of either mycophenolate methotrexate with steroids and keep on assessing the patient I am sure we cannot do the PET scan but we can do the CRP ESR and one of the other things which I realize is that you may not get completely low activity like ESR low and CRP low and we used to wait during KEM days that when the ESR becomes less than 20 then only you can do the stenosis uh, angioplasty. But nowadays the recommendation is not that if there is a stenosis you, you can do the angioplasty. The recurrence rate of re-stenosis, recurrence of the uh, dilated vessel is again very high than atherosclerotic plaques or fibromuscular dysplasia. That's why many people do not like to do intervention, but whenever there is organ damage or critical ischemia, we require to do angioplasty or balloon angioplasty. So with these words, I thank you all for the patient hearing. Hello. Now there is a
interesting case presentation and I that… We, will, we can skip it. It's not my case. Uh, it's not the case of Dr. Josna Oak. Madam, it's the case of Dr. Shirish Walsankar and uh, she has gladly agreed to discuss the case. Uh, I have not seen all the slides but I'll try yeah. to… Huh. I'll try to accommodate. So, this patient was a young boy who was seen with a facial pain. Again, telling that it is not my case, uh, it's by Dr. Shir Shirish. It's the case of Dr. Shirish Walsankar. Yeah. He okay. or his uh, uh, doctor physician, Dr. P. R. Doshi, could not con come because of the emergencies. Uh, so, he was a young boy with facial pain. He was seen here on 9th of April, but the history wouldn't be incomplete without his recent past history of medical treatment. Uh, so, there is a narration for this case. The 13-year-old boy with a resident of Pune, previously healthy with no past medical history. And in Jan 22, he was, he was seen with right temporal pain, took antibiotics for 7 days, not associated with vomiting or blurring of vision no fever and the pain continued. In February 22, he had a right ear tinnitus, pain and purulent discharge from the right ear. Cultures were negative. On 14th of February, he had a severe jaw pain, slurring of the speech, difficulty in swallowing and he was uh, treated with IV antibiotics as well as analgesics. He developed some new symptoms in the form of diplopia on looking on the right and he also had epistaxis once, so the MRI was advised. And the MRI had shown that there was a kind of granuloma which can be seen here. Change it. Yeah, again March 22, he was admitted elsewhere with the cultures were negative and he underwent mastoidectomy. Histopathology had shown non-specific inflammation, continues to have pain in the ear and the discharge the facial pain over forehead and the beneath the right eye. He also had double vision and uh, it was quite troublesome. At this juncture, I think it would be better if he had a diplopia to see the orbital cuts and to see whether there is any mass at the orbital cuts and whether he had any proptosis at the same time. But at this stage, I would like to say that if the patient has got a running mastoid and a kind of uh, epistaxis and pain in the right ear, it would be worth seeing whether the patient has got any infection which they have tried to rule out after doing mastoidectomy. And uh, culture should be done for any tissue which is given for TB of course and for the fungal culture. And at the same time, anchor should be done because he has got involvement of eye as well as the mastoid. And the other differential which comes to my mind, I am doing it spontaneously, so I may be wrong also, is a Kogan syndrome because the patient has got ear involvement and uh, this. So, ANCA PR3 to be done, VDRM should be done. So you should ask about scleritis and episcleritis because you can get non-erosive scleritis in these patients of Kogan's and they can sometimes be just admitted as sudden deafness. So, they have to be treated, uh, they have to be seen by the ENT also by ophthalmologist also and then a CT scan of the chest should be done to see whether there, there is any presence of pulmonary nodules. So the examination, uh, I think he has the right palatal weakness, he had bilateral deafness now, the corneals were normal and the right lateral rectus palsy, fundus was normal and he seemed to be distressed because of the pain. A non-healing ulcer which was there on the right uh, right shin of few weeks duration, maybe that non-healing ulcer was a part of vasculitis and examination marred by deafness and distress from the pain. Yeah. Yeah, so he doesn't have a seven. He has definitely some squint and the lateral rectus palsy. Go ahead. Yeah, so this was a summary which I have already sent. They have done the cultures and they have done gene expert and they were all negative. The CSF was not done. Histopathology had shown inflammatory changes and he had a bilateral deafness. So I think the di differential diagnosis of either Kogan's versus uh, GPA. Yeah, he had 
nose perhaps also involved and this is showing the nodularity in the CT thorax. So clinical features to note that he had non-infective pathology, so they had thought of vasculitis. The Chuck Strauss syndrome, I don't think that uh, there is no eosinophilia mentioned and usually a disease of the elderly individual. In, eosin in Chuck Strauss generally you can get peripheral neuropathy, you can get severe eosinophilia more than 500 and you can get sometimes myocarditis. So if you have got elderly individual with eosinophilia, with involvement of the heart, with peripheral neuropathy, ataxia, then you think of uh, EGPA and past history of bronchial asthma. So he doesn't have any of this thing. It could be uh, midline granuloma, granulomatosis with polyangitis like Vejnas or polyarthritis SLE, no, though these features are not there. Sarcoid, what do you think about IgG4? We have to ask Dr. Yojana whether the tissue should be stained for the IgG4. And this one was, ANA was negative, C3 was low, uh, C ANCA was positive and ANCA PR3 is positive. So as I had thought, uh, it is looking like a Vaginus only. So this was a uh, final diagnosis, there is a Vaginus granulomatosis and this is what he has said. Yeah. I am sorry, I have uh, tried to read and come to some conclusions because this was first time I am seeing this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Madam, just a minute. Felix. Rizwan will be felicitated by Dr. Nishikant Maske. Madam Chika. We have two more sessions which are remaining uh, for today. Now we are breaking up for lunch precisely for 20 minutes. We will be meeting in 20 minutes and then we will be completing the sessions as well as quiz. Thank you. Students, if you have appeared for poster or paper presentations, kindly come and check your names. They won't be changed after uh, getting fixed, please. everyone and welcome back. Uh, I hope you have all enjoyed our lunch. Uh, for our next session, we have a very important topic that is scleroderma. Introducing this topic with its evaluation will be our next speaker, Dr. Parikshit Sakya. He has completed his training from prestigious Hinduja Hospital under our patron Dr. V. R. Joshi sir and he is the first rheumatologist with DNB certification. I request uh, our chairpersons for this session, Dr. Satyasham Toshniwar sir, Dr. Sailesh Patil sir and Dr. Vaseem Kazi sir.
Okay. We'll start. Uh, so good afternoon everyone, uh, I'll be talking about evaluation of a patient who uh, has scleroderma. So systemic sclerosis or scleroderma is a connective tissue disease which affects skin, blood vessels, heart, lungs, kidneys, GIT and musculoskeletal system. Involvement of internal organs results in significant morbidity and mortality of patients with systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis encompasses a spectrum of related disorders, most of which share a clinical, uh, characteristic clinical feature of skin thickening due to an excess of collagen containing extracellular matrix within the dermis. The simplest division of uh, scleroderma related disorders is into localized and systemic forms of the disease. Localized scleroderma is generally termed morphe to avoid uh, confusion with systemic disease. So uh, this is a uh, classification of scleroderma. Uh, localized scleroderma uh, has uh, three entities, morphe, linear scleroderma and scleroderma in coupe de sebe. Scleroderma, linear scleroderma, this is a thickening of skin over sing like a single line over a particular part of body. And scleroderma in coupe de sebe is, is on the like a uh, half, half part of the face. It is also called as hemifacial atrophy. Uh, but today I am going to talk about systemic sclerosis and uh, it is further subdivided into limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis and diffuse cutaneous systemic sclerosis because uh, it is associated with internal organ involvement. So systemic sclerosis is predominantly a disease of middle age so it is seen in uh, age group of between 25 to 40 years and it has got a female preponderance. So uh, coming to clinical features, Raynaud's phenomenon uh, is seen predominantly, almost 95% of systemic sclerosis patients presents with Raynaud's phenomenon. To uh, describe Raynaud's phenomenon, Raynaud's phenomenon is a, uh, is a sort of a uh, feature of patients where uh, their extremities like fingers and toes, they, uh, they turn, uh, they turn uh, white uh, initially on exposure to cold and later on they turn blue and once the blood flow establishes, they, uh, it, uh, they turn red. So that, that is triphasic uh, color change in typical Raynaud's phenomenon. Sometimes you can't, you won't get all three changes, but uh, you, you had need to ask patients whether they get uh, blue fingers or white fingers whenever they are exposed to cold, cold water, cold atmosphere, or sort of going into mall or, or theaters where they are exposed to cold atmosphere. It is one of very early features of systemic sclerosis uh, and uh, it is seen in most of the cases of systemic sclerosis. Apart from that, uh, uh, the vascular features of uh, systemic sclerosis include digital ulcers. So patients who patients present with recurrent digital ulcers. So digital tip ulcers are pretty common in patients with systemic sclerosis. Apart from that, uh, patients may present with digital pitted scars. So you need to really examine uh, their fingertips for the presence of pitted scars. They are usually healed digital ulcers and that's why you get those pitted scars. Uh, many patients may land up with dry, uh, dry gangrene because of uh, uh, vasculopathy and associated vasculitis and some patients may get auto amputation as well. So uh, this is how uh, the fingers of uh, systemic sclerosis pay people, uh, patients look uh, if they get gangrene, they can get multiple digital gangrene which is usually dry. So skin thickening is another typical feature of systemic sclerosis. Uh, skin thickening initially affects fingers, uh, that's why it's called sclerodactyly, and then it progresses proximally uh, beyond MCP. Limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis skin changes are limited to face, neck, and distal extremities, that is distal to elbows and distal to knees. Over time, uh, skin thickening uh, may involve face and patients may get a reduced oral aperture, so they have reduced mouth opening, uh, their teeth may protrude. Uh, over time, uh, skin may become hypo or hyperpigmented, so they, they may have some patches of hypopigmentation and some patches of hyperpigmentation and this gives rise to a typical salt and paper appearance of skin. Other skin manifestations include telangiectasia, so the patients may have uh, that they are dilated vessels which can be seen on face and body. Uh, digital pits and calcinosis. So calcinosis is uh, deposition of uh, uh, calcium like uh, calcium uh, in the uh, soft tissue uh, in the soft tissues. So uh, this is uh, this is a typical feature where you can see there are hypo and hyperpigmented patches uh, in a patient of systemic sclerosis. This, this is what like a, a, a salt and paper appearance. 
So coming to GI manifestations, uh, uh, patient, uh, uh, the whole uh, GIT right from mouth to rectum and anus may be involved in patients with systemic sclerosis. A dry mouth due to secondary Sjogren's may occur. Patient, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease is a typical feature of systemic sclerosis. Then patients may also get dysphagia due to either uh, esophageal stricture or uh, esophagitis. GI bleeding may occur due to erosive esophagitis, esophageal ulcer, malrevistia, and mucosal telangiectasia. Bloating, cramping can occur due to intestinal dysmotility, and uh, even rarely pseudo obstruction may occur in these patients. Uh, coming to pulmonary manifestations, interstitial lung disease is, 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 a, is a very uh, prominent and uh, life-threatening uh, manifestation of systemic sclerosis. Uh, these, uh, those patients who get interstitial lung disease, they present with dry cough and exertional dyspnea. On examination, they have late inspiratory bacillar crackles. Uh, uh, other feature is pulmonary artery hypertension. Isolated pulmonary artery hypertension more commonly occurs in limited cutaneous uh, variant of uh, systemic sclerosis. It presents with dyspnea and fatigue. On examination, they usually have a loud, loud P2. Apart from that, uh, these patients may also get pericardial disease, that is pericardial effusion, dilated cardiomyopathy, and uh, arrhythmias. Scleroderma renal crisis, uh, so that is uh, the renal manifestation of patients with systemic sclerosis. 10% uh, of patients with systemic sclerosis will develop SRC. It occurs predominantly in diffuse variant of, uh, diffuse cutaneous variant of systemic sclerosis. Risk factors for SRC include diffuse skin involvement, new onset anemia, pericardial effusion and use of steroids. SRC classically presents with new onset hypertension. Other signs and symptoms are similar to malignant hypertension and include dyspnea, headache, visual disturbances, seizure, and pulmonary edema. Musculoskeletal manifestations are arthralgia, myalgia, uh, full-fledged arthritis. Apart from that, patients may get joint flexion contracture due to progressive skin thickening, proximal muscle weakness, uh, which may be due to a bland myopathy and of, of, uh, sometimes due to an overlap of myositis with scleroderma. So these are clinical features. Now, how to evaluate a patient with scleroderma or suspected patients with scleroderma, those who, has, who have presented with skin thickening and has features of Raynaud's. So uh, coming to investigations, uh, basic investigations like CBC, ESR, LFT, KFT, and urine routine need to be done at baseline, uh, uh, just to have a baseline assessment of patients. Uh, ANA by immunofluorescence is positive in 80 to 90 percent of patients with systemic sclerosis. The pattern could be speckled and or nuclear, although nuclear pattern is specific for diffuse variant of systemic sclerosis. And then uh, you can all, uh, once ANA is positive, then you can go ahead and test for a separate antibodies, so anti uh, SL70 antibodies associated with diffuse variant of systemic sclerosis and increased risk of ILD. Anti centromere antibodies generally seen in patients with limited variety of systemic sclerosis. So once you have a patient who is clinically suspected uh, scleroderma, then you need to do at least these tests, so C uh, CBC, ESR, LFT, KFT, urine routine, and ANA by IF. And if that is positive, then you can go ahead and check for anti-SCL70 or anti-centromere antibody. Then clinical features and autoantibodies in systemic sclerosis. So these are the two antibodies uh, which are uh, seen in patients with systemic sclerosis. Anti-centromere is associated with limited cutaneous one. It is common in the limited variety. While anti-SCL70 is more common in the diffuse variant. ILD associated with anti-SCL70. Then SRC is uh, seen more with SCL70 antibody. And PH is more common in those who have anti-centromere antibody and a limited variant of systemic sclerosis. <coughs> Then coming to organ-based evaluation. So once you have seen a patient with systemic sclerosis and made a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis by doing basic tests and seen that ANA is positive and going ahead and uh, doing a SCL70 and once either of SCL70 or anti-centromere antibody is positive, uh, you need to have an organ-based evaluation because as I have already told, it is connective tissue disease which involves multiple organs and uh, just making a diagnosis is not enough. We need to check for uh, various other organ manifestations and uh, see where the disease is active or, or what uh, manifestations are, uh, organ manifestations are predominant. So those who have predominantly GI symptoms, uh, you need to do, uh, you can get a barium esophagography uh, which may demonstrate esophageal dysmotion. So those who have reflux problem or dysphagia, you can get a barium esophagography which is easily available. Apart from that, uh, upper GI endoscopy is performed to assess for sources of bleeding, strictures, metaplasia or malignancy. 
esophageal manometry to document lower esophageal involvement and reduce lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So some of the patients who have severe dysphagia or uh, difficulty in swallowing, there you can get an esophageal manometry to look for uh, distal uh, esophageal involvement. Then for pulmonary manifestations, we need to get a PFT with uh, spirometry measurement of lung volumes and tests of gas exchange. It is, it is one of the best screening methods of interstitial lung disease. Uh, in patients who have interstitial lung disease, the total lung capacity is reduced, FVC is reduced. X-ray chest is a very simple and easily available test to screen for uh, detection for ILD, but then it lacks sensitivity so to detect early ILD. Uh, in those cases where you suspect clinically uh, interstitial lung disease, HRCT is of uh, use and uh, getting a HRCT of chest uh, may reveal uh, interstitial lung disease. In fact, uh, almost 70-80% uh, patients uh, of systemic sclerosis may have a, uh, a mild interstitial lung disease once we do a testing. Uh, HRCT reveals ground glass opacities uh, which are suggestive of uh, active alveolitis or active inflammation uh, if it shows uh, on, on chest CT. Other findings in CT include thickening of interlobular septal thickening, honeycombing appearance and traction bronchiectasis. <coughs> Occasionally bronchoscopy with bowel uh, need to be done to rule out infection uh, especially where CT findings are atypical or uh, there are some findings which may suggest infection. Reduced dual CO in the presence of normal vol uh, lung volume suggests pH. So for uh, screening of pH, uh, uh, isolated reduction in the uh, uh, dual CO is, uh, ca can suggest pH. Uh, or in general, uh, on, uh, on routine screening on uh, serials monitoring, declining dual CO may be an early predictor of pH. Uh, ECO is a very uh, easily available non-invasive screening tool to detect pH. Uh, but we need to remember that it lacks specificity. So many of the time if you get a raised pulmonary artery systemic pressure on repeat uh, scanning, uh, it may be normal. So yes, it is easily available and can be done, but uh, it lacks specificity. Elevated BNP level has a sensitivity of 56% and specificity of 95% for detection of pH. Right heart catheterization is a test which is confirmatory for pulmonary artery hypertension and rules out other causes like diastolic dysfunction. A mean pulmonary artery pressure of 25 milliliters of mercury uh, or more with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, or normal uh, pul uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is consistent with pH. Six minute walk test is used to follow up uh, patients with pH because it shows <coughs> the exercise and effort tolerance but uh, it may be difficult uh, in patients with systemic sclerosis because they also got musculoskeletal manifestations and uh, uh, with ulcers and all uh, the interpretation may be difficult. <coughs> Apart from that, uh, for musculoskeletal involvement, uh, if patient has definite arthritis, it can be tested clinically. Apart from that, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound is helpful to detect inflammation. Then um, getting muscle enzymes like total CPK uh, is essential uh, uh, if a patient presents with proximal muscle weakness. Uh, muscle biopsy is uh, rarely required, but uh, if, if done, uh, then it usually does not reveal inflammatory infiltrate in typical, ca typical cases of systemic sclerosis. But inflammatory may changes may be seen in where uh, patients have a polymyositis systemic uh, sclerosis overlap. So uh, my take home message is it is essential to do <coughs> holistic assessment of patients with systemic sclerosis. ANA is positive in most of the patients. And uh, serial monitoring with PFT, HRCT chest and ECO is essential to detect early ILD and PH which are uh, the life threatening manifestation of systemic sclerosis. Thank you. Thank you very much sir for uh, this very informative lecture on this complicated topic. Uh, I would like to ask our chairperson to felicitate Dr. Pr uh, <coughs> Prakshit Sagdev sir. Another thing, there is a special announcement for students in this premises. Uh, uh, this is an announcement for students. For those who are going to participate in quiz, kindly contact Dr. Salil Ganu, sir, uh, seated here. I request Dr. Gundeli sir to felicitate our chairperson.
हेलो रविंद्र प्लीज जॉइन हिम एज अ चेयरपर्सन इट 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 वॉज अ इट इट वॉज अ एरर एक्चुअली ऑन आवर पार्ट वी वी अपोलॉजाइज I think this was a post lunch error. Ha. <laughs> For our next session uh, which within same heading of scleroderma Uh, and its important association that is pulmonary hypert uh, hypertension uh, speaker is dr asmita more she has honor uh, ma'am is renowned rheumat rheumatologist hailing from nasik uh, she has honor of being first female rheumatologist in northern of maharashtra with fellowship in adult and pediatric rheumatology and 8 years of experience in this branch yes thanks for the nice introduction yeah we'll move to the slide so uh, uh, to the students here uh, it's a announcement that you should hear the lecture proper with the most of the question which are asked in the quiz are lying in the slide so please see the slides properly that's a hint you know so my topic is very crisp uh, it is related to scleroderma but only one aspect which is pulmonary hypertension and digital also so you already have seen that scleroderma affects most of the organs but when in cl a clinical scenario we should actually pick up the patients who are going to into major uh, problems so scleroderma my uh, talk will be divided into definition incidence risk factors symptoms and how to screen these patients how to diagnose them and treat pulmonary hypertension so by definition pulmonary hypertension actually is divided into five groups uh, which is idiopathic secondary to the heart disease lung disease chronic pulmonary thromboembolism and multifactorial so in scleroderma if you ask me there are multiple things which can cause pulmonary hypertension it can be because of the lung disease that is primary ld causing uh, scleroderma it can be heart disease secondary to the connective tissue disorder and uh, primary idiopathic pulmonary hypertension is also important thing so what to treat that you should diagnose first so uh, coming to the definition of pulmonary hypertension so pulmonary hypertension arterial hypertension more than 25 mm of hg at rest is very important that's the definition and with exercise is 35 and what is the pulmonary artery wedge pressure now generally this cannot be calculated unless you do a right heart catheterization where the catheter is inserted into the right atrium right ventricle and then it goes to the pulmonary artery, uh, artery and then you dilate a balloon and then you can actually get the uh, pressures and this is very important test so that any heart disease has to be ruled out so pulmonary artery wedge pressure if less than 15 denotes it's a uh, primary pulmonary hypertension so what is the incidence among the scleroderma patient it's almost 11 to 13 percent of the patient which is high so again coming to the terminology ph is pulmonary arterial hypertension it should be less than 25 pulmonary artery systolic pressure it should be less than 35 which can be calculated by echo by tr velocity and okay the lights okay so there was one study uh, which included all the scleroderma patients almost th more than thousands and then they uh, found that the incidence was almost 7% in that study in that uh, primary pulmonary hypertension was only 4% but otherwise the other uh, comorbid con conditions lead to pulmonary hypertension so why it is important to assess for it because as the disease progresses as the years progresses uh, there was one studies which were done by pulmonary uh, hypertension assessment and recognition of outcomes in scleroderma in that study we understood that per year the incidence of new pulmonary hypertension increased so yearly screening is one thing which is advocated in current guidelines so each and every patients once when they are investigated once diagnosed always has to go back and again after one year we have to investigate whether patient is developing new onset hypertension 
What are the risk factors for pulmonary artery hypertension? Yes, one is the age of the disease. So if the patient comes again, you have to evaluate whether he has to be evaluated further again by sequential 2D echo. Second is telangiectasia. So when, when you examine the patient, whether the patient has started having telangiectasia, which, which are more than 5 mm, matted or square, even uh, digital ulcers is very important. And that's because of the uh, vasculopathy which is there in scleroderma. That is a very important risk factor to develop of development of pulmonary artery hypertension. The other risk factors are uh, investigations when, when you do. So DLCO, what is DLCO? It is basically a diffusion capacity when you know, when you give carbon monoxide to the patient, then how much diffusion is occurring at the level of interstitial that you know. So whether the problem is with the vessel or whether the problem is with the interstitium, we will have a reduced DLCO in these patients, right? So when the DLCO is less than 50%, right? So that means there's some problem with that there, th when the ventilation perfusion is not occurring properly. So that increase the risk of PAH by 10%. So mind well, X-ray will not show anything. Even the CT scan will not show anything. But this is a functional assessment. Here, if the DLCO is less than 50%, it is increased risk of pH by 10, per, uh, 10 times. And by PFT, when you do a ratio, that is FVC by DLCO, if it is less, more than 1.6, again it increases the risk by 11%. 11 times, sorry. So, if you do serology, generally when during investigation, we do these tests. And if anti-centromere antibody test is positive, it is very important thing that patient may develop pH in future. What is the biomarker? If currently patient does not have pH, but early signs of RV failure, that can be just seen by this biomarker, which is pro-BNP or anti-bro-BNP, by which we will, we can correlate that patient is progressing to uh, pH. So almost more than 97 percentile increase in the uh, uh, levels of pro-BNP increases the risk by of pH by 10 folds in next three years. So, and also it correlates uh, with the right heart catheterization. So this is a very important non-invasive test which, when, which can we do in follow-up so that we can trace the patient and early detection of pH can be done. So by evaluating these things, you can have a risk stratification which will identify whom patient, what treatment has to be given, given. Whether a patient is low risk, whether intermediate or high risk patient. Accordingly, we can decide the therapy of the patient. Yes, not all patients of scleroderma having pulmonary artery hypertension are symptomatic. So these, these are to be uh, screened. What are the other symptoms they develop? They develop dyspnea, fatigue, palpitation, <laughs> exercise. Uh, problems. So, exercise induced abdominal distension and nausea. This is very vague complaints, but yes, they can develop this. So, screening of pulmonary hypertension uh, should be done in each and every patient of scleroderma uh, when they are diagnosed. And sequential repeated tests like pulmonary uh, function test and 2D echo has, and pro BNP has to be done annually. What the guidelines say? So, the European guidelines say that if the 2D echo is suggestive of PASP more than 41 mm of SG, if the 2D echo PSP are uh, with in intermediate like 35 to 41 and with symptoms, you should treat these patients, right? So recommendation is that all patients of scleroderma should be screened for PAH and right heart catheterization is mandatory for diagnosis of PAH. But what about Indian scenario, okay? So we'll go to that. So is it feasible right heart catheterization in our setting? Yes, in European thing, they have referral system. When we don't diagnose, uh, the generally right heart catheterization is been done. But we have other problems, economic problems, only few rheumatological referrals, few cardiologists doing uh, right heart catheterization. So what? So uh, here was a paper published by Dr. Pravind Jadav sir and uh, Rohini Savant madam to 
assess the role of right heart catheterization and by the literature review they, 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 they found out that there was a study uh, of right heart catheterization done till date. So almost 7,000, more than 7,000 patients would have gone through this and then diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension but the complication rate was high and uh, mortality up to uh, 0.05%. So in Indian perspective, is a right heart catheterization gold standard? No. In our setting, generally the practices, what our seniors follow is to do 2D echo, uh, it has a good sensitivity of 90%. If you're suspecting and patient starts having symptoms, you can again repeat the 2D echo after three months period. Whether there is a change in the value of PASP, or is the TRZ changing? So that will indicate and whether the pro BNP is increasing. Uh, how is the six minute walk test? So sequential analysis will help in our setting. But if you are not identifying the reason of pH, yes, then only patient has to be uh, further sent to uh, right heart catheterization. Going to the therapies which are available, we have three pathways which are involved in pulmonary hypertension. So basically, primary it is the pulmonary vasculopathy which is causing the problem and other thing is right heart failure. So we have to rule out uh, right heart failure before and then for pulmonary vasculopathy we have three therapies. One is endothelial pathway, the other is nitric oxide and the third is prostacycline pathway and we have drugs for the same. Endothelial pathway we have bosentan. Ambricertan and Mastercentan is which is the newer added drug but Bosentan uh, there were side effects like liver function dis dysfunction happening. Ambricertan is well tolerated but again giddiness can happen so we have to monitor this patients. Uh, nitric acid pathway we have sildenafil and tadalafil. Patient has to be started with lower doses initially because they can have symptoms secondary to vasodilatation. Uh, they have headaches, giddiness uh, and uh, hypotension secondary to this drug. So combination has to be given with uh, proper understanding to the patient whether really the patient is required, what is the risk stratification for pulmonary artery hypertension. Uh, Prostacycline uh, pathways, yes, there are newer drugs which are coming which is oral but before Ipoprostenol, Ileoprost and these drugs are not available in India. They are given by the IV drug, uh, IV uh, administration and ileo process by uh, inhaled administration but they are not available in India. But now we have uh, Selexipaz which is an oral uh, derivative selective prostacycline receptor antagonist if in an emergency situation and it's a third line drug. So what is the recommendation say? This is recent uh, 2022 uh, guidelines. The recommendation say that in patients with pH associated with CTD, treatment of underlying condition according to the current guidelines is recommended. Means what? If the patient is having lung disease, you treat the lung disease. If they have cardiac problems, then you treat the cardiac cause. But if it is an isolated pulmonary hypertension, then you have to start with the algorithm of the, uh, so this is the algorithm they have discussed. So in general, you have to stratify the patient according to whether it is mild, moderate or severe. Low to intermediate risk patient have to be started with ERA and or phosphodiester inhibitor class 1 and on follow up you see the how the uh, there is improvement regarding uh, the echo. So see this is one important condition scleroma where we can actually reduce the pulmonary artery hypertension. Once the pulmonary hypertension has set in, patient has developed moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension it is irreversible. So this is very important that when patient comes early you have to detect the condition early otherwise the patient will have long standing effects of the same thing. So I have seen so many patient of uh, connective tissue disorders when, when we start the treatment with immunosuppression for the disease per se and for pulmonary hypertension then there is a lot of improvement in the rat uh, in RV failure. So I'll just uh, put my one patient of SLE who was diagnosed with moderate pulmonary uh, hypertension. He had also uh, RV dysfunction and he had bilateral avian, okay. And so the pain for avian, bilateral hip avian was terrible. 
but because of pulmonary artery hypertension we could not go for the surgery so that is a contraindication to the surgery so things are complicated in such patient but when we started immunosuppression we had to give uh, we had to give uh, era and phosphodiesterase inhibitor in this patient titrated do doses and slowly the pulmonary hypertension regressed over the period of one year so treatment can be done and sequential echoes will suggest improvement in this patient and now the patient has undergone bilateral hip replacement so we could give consent and then uh, disease was uh, brought to the lower side and everything got control must last two slides this is regarding digital ulcers so the treatment is calcium channel blockers in these patients we have to actually tell the patient that cold protection is the most thing uh, important thing that they don't follow and then patient will come to you with digital ulcers so cold protection is the most thing and then followed by calcium channel blockers and then if they are refractory to treatment then ganglion block can be tried in refractory painful uh, digital ulcers thank you i finished in time thank you <laughs> any questions thank you very much ma'am for such an illustrative lecture i would like to ask our honorable chairpersons to felicitate dr asmita mori ma'am for our last and best session for today for our last but best session uh, we have our uh, just uh, the speaker for today's session is dr smita sakwa sakwa ji ma'am uh, she is renowned dermatologist from our own city with over 25 years of experience uh, in dermatology she is head of department of dermatology department in vaishampayan medical college uh, a doctor by profession yet philanthropist by heart uh, with gold medal in dermatology and a youtube channel Uh, for this session i would like to ask dr vijayanti lagu ma'am to join the panel of uh, chairpersons and the single bird outside this whole uh, birds of same feather i am a different feather here and i would like to thank dr rai sir and all the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity to share my little knowledge on dermatology now dermatology is purely basically photographs so i'm sure i will not allow you all to sleep yes next okay to at the outset frankly i want to tell you that i haven't seen any references of rheumatoid arthritis which have been you know called for from dermatologist so i have not seen any opds or references of ra but yet i thought probably i will club all the different disorders or you know differential diagnosis and this is how we will discuss this whole scenario now classification is primarily skin is a manifestation to any disease possible so even if you have cholesterol high your skin will speak if you have anemia your skin will speak if you have rheumatoid arthritis your skin will speak if you have sle skin speaks vasculitis skin speaks so skin speaks love skin speaks disease how does the skin speak so it could be just generalized manifestations it could be ra related it could be ra specific or it could be the adverse reaction now what are the generalized manifestation if i ask in this panel how many of you all have hair loss so i am sure 90% will say yes i have yes yes if you say yes probably you all are not sleeping 90% yes men and women together but that is a non specific sign that doesn't mean that you all have rheumatoid arthritis isn't it dry skin pale skin this is very common discussion among the women why are you looking so pale or else if you go to your mother's house invariably if, even if it is son or a daughter the mother says why are you looking pale your wife doesn't feed you is that so satyashyam teshniwal definitely such answers do come when the mothers say the next is easy bruisability generalized hyperpigmentation erythema nodosum so there are many list of 
you know, non-specific skin manifestation and not to forget the nails. See, now we cosmetologists, we, you know, we apply artificial nails, we make our nails very beautiful, but actually nail also speaks a lot about the cutaneous manifestation in systemic disorders. Now let's go with different things. As we said, dry skin. See, the moment you see a dry skin, it could be ichthyosis, it could be psoriasis, it could be atopic dermatitis, or it could be drug-induced, that is lipid-lowering drugs. So any of these things can cause dryness. So no sooner you have a patient with dry skin plus arthritis, what are the differential diagnoses you would come up? You would come up with most common, what you see in this particular case is psoriasis. So invariably they present to you as psoriatic skin lesions, but definitely if you ask an additional history, they will say that we have arthritis as well. Now, how are these scales? They are silvery white. Now, as I was listening to this, not only this forum, overall, everywhere the word used is rash. What is rash? There's nothing called as a word rash. Basically, these are cutaneous manifestations. So, if we go back to our basics as a MBBS, we have maculopapular lesions, you have plaques, you have nodules, you have got exanthems, you have got purpuric lesions. So this is how we need to describe the lesion, but not as a single word, rash. Now what are the lesions you are seeing here? They are multiple white silver colored plaques. Yes, so this is a case of psoriasis, which could be a non-specific sign even in RA. Pachan corn which is the first slide. Can I have the answers coming from the postgraduates? What are these lesions? Erythematous flared up lesions. They are plaques. So that is nothing but urticaria. So urticaria can be a manifestation of uh, SLE can be a manifestation of drug rash, uh, 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 drug reaction. It could be a manifestation of rheumatoid arthritis as well. Dry skin, which is the commonest condition in India where you get dry skin. Hansen's, clofazamine induced, you know, dryness is very common. So no sooner you see a dry skin, you will have to look in for nerve thickening and that is how these non-specific findings will definitely make you reach to a clinical conclusion. We cannot forget that we are in a country where tuberculosis and Hansen's still are prevalent. Though we are into non-leprosy eradication program, but yet we are seeing cases, so we should not forget it. No sooner you see a dry patch, you see a hypopigmented patch, you see a sensory impairment, just go for nerve examination. Nail. Nail speaks volumes about what is happening, whether it is clubbing, whether it is splitting, whether it is splinter hemorrhages, whether it is onycholysis. So, these are the manifestations which also can be seen in rheumatoid arthritis. So these are all non-specific. Now let's move on to some related manifestation. What are these? They could be due to neutrophilic infiltration, that is sweet syndrome, pyodoma gangrenosum, not very commonly seen. Granulomas, yes, definitely there are so many plethora of granulomas, which is the commonest one is tubercular granuloma, leprosy granuloma, then granuloma annular, sarcoidosis, so these are very commonly seen. Next is erythema, elevatum, diuchinum, libido and sicca. So just let's see what are these, how do they look like, how does a pyoderma gangrenosum look like. It's a very deep ulcer, it's a huge, its size is huge. So this is how pyoderma gangrenosum presents. Granulomas, granulomas invariably present to us as like a plaque and if you see the borders, you can feel the granules like, you know, you can see like a nodule like feeling. So this could be presenting again in leprosy, it could be present in tuberculosis, it could be present in rheumatoid arthritis, it could be seen in palisading granuloma. So there are multiple conditions where you can see these conditions. So you have to correlate, it is not just one single finding, you need to correlate with multiple things history, examination and this is how you come to a conclusion whether the person has arthritis. Now all of us have been speaking libido, libido but until you see it you will never understand it. So what exactly is libido? It's like you know marble like pattern which you can see 
anywhere on the body. If you go to a neonatal ward, newborn babies, you will see invariably because of the temperature, the whole back is like livido. It's like, you know, uh, what you can say, marble-like appearance. So that is livido. Yes, when you give vasodilators, this libido will definitely recite. Let's move on to the specific cutaneous manifestation. What are they? One is rheumatoid nodules, nodulosis, accelerated nodulosis, rheumatoid vasculitis and neutrophilic dermatosis. Vasculitis has been very beautifully covered with one of our colleagues and I understood so many points because whenever I read vasculitis, I just go off to sleep. So it was a very wonderful lecture uh, of vasculitis. Now let's go in for nodules. What are they? They are solitary, hard, skin-colored nodules, which is usually seen in the recurrent traumatic area, primarily forearm, elbow, finger, heel. But because of the latest evolution of DMARDs, definitely I am sure you all, all must not be seeing this kind of nodules. So this is a actually borrowed Google picture because it is not seen nowadays. I am not seeing it. So nodules again should raise a suspicion of Hansen's. So you can see very classically, there's a hypopigmented patch, you can see a nerve, you can see nodular lesions. So whenever you see a nodule, you need to suspect a case of Hansen's as a differential diagnosis. Now nodules are seen in dermatology, plethora of them. This is a case of hypertrophic lichen planus. So the, again, this is like nodules. I want you to answer this. This was a 32-year-old male who came to us with this eruptive lesions. What is the diagnosis? And no sooner my physician, we diagnosed, we did some blood test and my physician, Dr. Shardul Kulkarni, gave the treatment and it started residing and it is totally vanished. Yes, quick, my time is running. Eruptive xanthomas. So these are theoretical part, I'll skip it. Vasculitis has been beautifully covered, I'll just show the photographs. So it can be presented as a palpable purpura. So very classically when you do a test called as dioscopy. What is dioscopy? You just take a, a slide and press it. When you press the lesion, when the red color doesn't vanish, that is what is called as dioscopy test. So that is positive. So no sooner dioscopy is positive means it is a purpura and it is a palpable one. So that's a classical sign. This is a case which I have seen yesterday, which I was discussing with our uh, nephrologist. Uh, case of SLE, uh, Dr. Vag sir would be seeing it again. Young boy, you can see small pitted ulcers. He had uh, lupus nephritis, which has been really managed beautifully with Holker sir. He has got oral ulcers as well. So now I would like to start on rituximab, but I'm skeptical, I need your guidance as a rheumatologist, if you all say yes, I would go ahead with this particular molecule in this case. Digital infarct, again, as ma'am has already so told, calcium channel blocker is the best way and avoid cold. This is again a case of scleroderma, uh, which we have seen in government hospital setup, which she has, she couldn't open her mouth, she... Uh, luckily, uh, her, uh, she did not have any pulmonary hypertension, but she had GI disability. She couldn't eat properly. So we have given her uh, infliximab and she has improved in her score, but her disease continues. We have put her on uh, immunosuppressives, but she is doing well. This is again vasculitis. Many a times patients present to us either with arterial ulcer or venous ulcer in rheumatoid arthritis. It's a long term. So how do we manage these ulcers? Very simple, beautiful test which can be done in any government hospital setup also. This is called as PRF, platelet-rich fibrin. So you just take the blood, 10 cc blood, you uh, put it in a centrifuge, you allow it to settle down, a coagulum forms. The coagulum has to be just taken and put it in the ulcer area and it totally heals. It, this patient, it took around uh, eight sessions for us to heal this ulcer. So any non-healing ulcer, PRF is the beautiful answer. Now vasculitis, the mortality is pretty high. So I think we always need to take an opinion and start them on immunosuppressives. Sweet syndrome. So sweet syndrome is actually not sweet. It, 
it is a name given by the scientist who has discovered it so you see multiple plaques so again i i would request all the honorable forum to not use the word any more rash because we are not rash drivers we are dermatologists and you are the best physicians uh these are multiple plaques and nodules and invariably it responds beautifully to dapsone so this is very common association with rheumatoid arthritis these are some syndromes where you can see digital infarcts petechiae this is eed small vessel vasculitis mondorff disease again on anterior thorax this is very rare by water again you see small infarcts now here we have got a small instrument called as dermoscope wherein you can diagnose at very early stage small infarcts so this is how you could prevent this further progression of vasculitis adverse reactions definitely you all must have encountered much more because we dermatologists give a very low dose of methotrexate azathioprine and all these drugs but one adverse reaction which i would always like to take home back is dapsone induced reaction which is erythema multiforme lands up with steven johnson syndrome so always be very careful before you begin with dapsone just ask them are they sensitive to sulfa group otherwise you may sometimes lose this patient but this patient fortunately we could recover with cyclosporin so these are the side effects which is theoretical part i am not going to encounter okay now this is again a autoimmune disorder femphigus vulgaris why i am talking about it because i always like to spread a word of mouth as to what i am doing this is autoimmune disorder why am i presenting here because left and right i have been using rituximab i have given more than 100 cases rituximab uh, till now in government hospital setup without any icu backup so it's very uh it's not very scary situation when you try to begin with biologics so start giving them would be my request to all the youngsters please go ahead and this is how a makeover journey of this young boy which has happened in just 3 months this is his back he could not sleep obviously you cannot expect him to work also and is not married even and right now he is on azathioprine will taper it and he'll get married also this is a young girl who wanted to commit suicide because of amphigus and she is already married now we have stopped her drugs we have kept her on, under observation this is a lady again of amphigus vulgaris wanted to go to kedarnath gave her rituximab has been to kedarnath the prasadam has come back to me so we need not go anywhere we have to sit here and just do our divine job and in the mid age of my 40s my undergraduate student forced me to begin my youtube channel and it has helped me to grow leaps and bounds because there is one specific work if you are doing in a particular thing which is your area of core of interest if you could just present that to the world i have international patients from mauritius from pakistan from bangladesh from africa people call me to you know treat them only because i have reached them so my earnest request to all the youngsters here not only youngsters all are young here uh, please choose a area of your choice and start presenting it to the world in a different way use social media platform not for your photographs but use for your work because i would even ask uh, bichle madam to you know present her work on a social media platform because we could help enormously right now i always say that i am in a divine circle to heal the femphigus patients with lowest possible rituximab dose so this is my youtube channel and this is you can see 24000 views sometimes 7000 views so whoever really wants it will reach you when it comes to arthritis there are non medical people talking about arthritis giving some oils which is not responding and taking the patient to a pathetic picture why not we we have the knowledge why can't we present to this world all the knowledge on a platform because i am sure even if i die this is going to stay this is going to help people i am on a mission called as mission beauty sundarmi honarats so i wo i work in two worlds one world is of disease and other world is of beauty so definitely i would love all the rheumatologists to please send me a video as to what beauty means to you because in next three years i would like to make 1 lakh women beautiful thank you so much wonderful presentation 
Thank you very much, ma'am, for such an illustrative and beautiful lecture and excellent any, oratory skill. Any questions? Any anything from the audience? Thank you. I would like to ask our chairpersons to felicitate Dr. Smita. Smita Zakotu. I would like to ask Dr. Asim Saifan and Dr. Shreya Arade to felicitate our chairperson's panel. I would like to announce uh, the end of the scientific session. Uh, I would like to request all respected dignitaries and delegates to hold their position for upcoming quiz, uh, which will be conducted by Dr. Salil Ganu sir and Dr. Asmita Mori sir. Thank you. And I have a very good evening. in Nashik and third is now Solapur. I think this is the last session but uh, quiz is held for the first time in MRACon and uh, the purpose behind holding this quiz is to generate uh, interest in rheumatology. Rheumatology is in Harrison also there are just 50 pages devoted to rheumatology but I think rheumatology touches each and every subject, it touches uh, lungs, it is touches uh, the heart, skin and everything. So your basic medicine should be well worse and then a uh, rheumatologist uh, can detect and hi can hire an eye to detect such common uh, things. So we are going to have a quiz which are four contestants in each team. One team is from Solapur, Latur and one from Mumbai is okay, right? So, we'll, I'll ca call upon the three teams which are there. Yeah, can you just... Yeah, yeah. Poster presentation prizes. Poster presentation prize announcement. The third prize goes to Dr. A. Harish Chandra Prasad. <laughs> jointly with Dr. Dr. Sopnil Sapre. <laughs> Just kindly come on the stage. The second prize goes to Dr. Harshad Jain, Ashwini Kumbari. It was a tie. The first prize goes to Dr. Vaipo Bandari. Thank you. Team one uh, from Latur Medical College, Dr. Amit, Dr. Pranav, 
डॉक्टर पगार डॉक्टर शुभम टीम वन सेकेंड फ्रॉम सोलापुर मेडिकल कॉलेज सोलापुर मेडिकल कॉलेज अच्छा अच्छा सॉरी सो जी एम सी सोलापुर थर्ड विल बी फ्रॉम डॉक्टर वैभव डॉक्टर स्वप्निल निधि दे आर अगेन फ्रॉम मेडिकल कॉलेज सोलापुर राइट थर्ड टीम वैशंपा मेमोरियल अच्छा अश्विनी रूरल मेडिकल कॉलेज टीम फ्रॉम भारती विद्यापीठ मेडिकल कॉलेज पुणे दे आर एक्चुअली डीएम स्टूडेंट बट वी हैव अरेंज स्पेशल क्वेश्चन फॉर देम डॉक्टर श्रीलक्ष्मी एंड डॉक्टर दीप्ति हाँ दिस इज टीम फाइव वी वॉन्ट अ टेबल योर given 30 seconds to analyze an answer if you don't answer in that 30 seconds the question will be passed to the second team right so you be on time otherwise the question will be passed to the second team and if the second team cannot answer the question will not be passed further right so you can get a bonus mark for this okay so in round 1 you will each team will give get two questions to answer okay and if you get bonus marks again 10 marks will be added to that right so each question will uh, will be marked for 10 uh, marks okay two uh, two per team that means 20 marks and if you get a bonus then it will be added okay sanil are you ready bonus also 10 marks yes yes so uh, we have two score keeper so that the marks will be given properly so don't worry so everybody is ready can you introduce yourself हेलो सो वेन द क्वेश्चन बी रीड यू टिल द एवरीथिंग फिनिशेस यू डोंट आंसर अदरवाइज देन यू विल मिस द बस ओके सो एवरीबडी रेडी सो यू आर ऑल अवेयर ऑफ 
overall uh, pattern and rules, uh, we will conduct four rounds. Those rounds are as described there. At the beginning of each round, we will tell specific rules for those rounds. <coughs> and all this is okay. Final rule is scorekeepers and quiz masters are always right. So we'll start with that. So round one, I'll be conducting. It's a case scenario. So in this round, you will uh, you'll be shown one round which describes a case scenario uh, that may include clinical information, lab information, plus a question. Question will be asked on the second slide. First slide will be for the case description of case scenario. With, for each question, you will have four answer, uh, four options, out of which one of op answer will be correct. If a team answers that wrong, that question will be passed on to the second team. There is no negative marking for this round. And uh, there will be two questions per team. So total 10 questions. So per question you will get 10 marks. And approximately 30 seconds is the time that will be given to you to answer. So shall we start with team 1? Ready? So here's the question. A 32-year-old lady came to rheumatology clinic with a three-year history of pain in both knees and small joints of hand, along with a weight loss of 5 kgs over these three years and a photosensitive skin rash that was there uh, on multiple sun-exposed areas. This sun-exposed areas included the dorsum of fingers, fingers but not knuckles. She also had diffuse hair loss. So on this, the question is, in this patient, which of the following antibodies would you indicate, uh, would indicate a decreased risk of proliferative nephritis? This option A, anti-UN SNRNP, option B, anti-DSDNA, option C is anti-ribosomal P, and option D is anti-SL. Ready? Hello? Uh, uh, answer is B, anti-double standard DNA. Okay. DSDNA. Are you sure? Lock kiya jai? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I will be describe. I will be telling answers at the end of each question. So uh, that is not you, your own option is option B, right? DSDN. So that is not a correct answer. The t, uh, question passes to team B. Uh, answer is C anti ribosomal P anti. Uh, no, no, only once it can be passed. After that, uh, will be. <laughs> so, if audience is interested, we can pass it on to audience. <laughs> so, answer is C and T R No. So uh, that answer is wrong. So I'll, anybody from audience wants to tell? Uh, no, the question is decreased risk of proliferative nephritis. So UNRNP, UNRNP is the answer. That's answering. So the next question goes to team two.
Yes. So the answer uh, I was we will be uh, explaining these answers at the end of the session because of lack of time. But th for this particular answer, I'll tell uh, this UNRNP is uh, a protective factor from proliferative leukonephritis. It is it is known to be associated with protection from proliferative leukonephritis. Okay. So, second question goes to team two. We have a 30 year old lady who comes with a three year history of uh, discoloration of fingers of both hands with uh, paresthesia in these fingers uh, on exposure to cold weather. She also has started getting progressive breathlessness on exertion since last one year. Her test reports are as shown there. So this is a spirometry report. You can see. This is a DLCO report. And third is an ANA immunofluorescence. So based on this information, we have a question, which antibody is most likely to be present in this situation? On uh, uh, your uh, options are option A, anti-Rho, option B, anti-Me2, option C, uh, anti-RNA polymerase 3 and option D, anti-CENPB. So, your time starts now. Option is uh, C, anti-RNA polymerase 3. Okay. So, uh, is this your final answer? Yes. Yeah, sure. So, actually that is not a correct answer. The answer uh, goes to team uh, 3. Uh, answer is D, anti-CNP, D antibody. D. D. Is that your final answer? Yes. Yeah. So that's a correct answer. That is anti CNPP. So I'll quickly, because this is little tough question, a little uh, difficult question. So uh, I will uh, ask you, what was your diagnosis here? Crest syndrome. So we do not have, this patient did not have any specific skin lesions as is shown. Uh, but yes, this patient had a pulmonary hypertension because normal volumes were there, but DLCO was increased. Okay, so now the next question goes to question uh, team three. Here is a 56 year old lady who came with a two month history of progressive difficulty getting up from sitting position and squatting position. Uh, she also has a photosensitive skin rash that is present over bilateral cheek and nasolabial folds. On examination, her MMT8 score was 40 out of 80 and she had a weakness in her proximal muscles of bilateral upper limbs. Her lab report showed LDH of 12, 1200, SGPT of 710, SGOT of 396. So based on this information, the question is, which of the following is a pathognomonic, that is, highly, that is highly specific skin lesion in this situation? So your options are, option A, Raynaud's phenomenon, option B, Malar rash, option C, Heliotrope rash, and option D, uh, Palmoplantar keratosis. Your time starts now. Answer is C, Heliotrope rash. Yes, that's a correct answer. <clears throat> okay. So next question is for audience. So we have a 34 year old lady who is a clerk by profession who came to rheumatology OPD with pain in her right forearm and right hand after writing. She had a stroke uh, with left sided hemiparesis one month ago. She lost 4 kgs weight over this last uh, over last one year and was treated empirically for suspected TB. Although the diagnosis of TB was never uh, subsequently confirmed. 
on examination there was a uh, right subclavian in brewing uh, blood pressure was 100 by 60 in uh, right arm whereas it was 140 by 70 in left arm in supine position so based on this uh, your question is uh, which of the following is not a typical feature of this condition so option a renal artery aneurysm option b stroke option c limb claudication and option d is glomerular nephritis so anybody from a So the question is which of the following is not a typical feature of this condition? No, the, uh, what uh, may I ask you sir, what is your diagnosis in this situation? Yes, correct. Your answer, uh, your diagnosis is correct, uh, but uh, renal artery aneurysm, stroke and limb claudication, all are typical features of a tachyosarthritis. So you get half mark, yes. <laughs> okay, so next question goes for team 5. So question reads, there is a three-year-old uh, boy who has a history of episodic fever. Episodes of fever are often prolonged and persist for more than one week. Each episode is associated with migratory articarial skin rash, uh, worsening of right knee pain and swelling. Symptoms started at the age of 11 months and on examination he was found to have bilateral papilledema. Rest of the uh, examination was normal. So based on this uh, information, your question is which, of the, uh, which condition best describes the above scenario? Your options are option 1, Blau syndrome, uh, option B, traps, option C, stills disease and option D, nomad. Yeah. Uh, Uh, is that your final answer? Yes, your answer is right. I, I must confess this was quite tough. <coughs> so, uh, can you elaborate? How did you come to that conclusion? Destructive joint pain and knee swelling and the age of onset of 11 months. Papilledema. And yes. papilledema, and papilledema. bilateral papilledema. Yes, yes. Correct. It's quite good. All right. Big cheers from audience, please. Okay. So, next question goes to team A. This is a 64-year-old retired school teacher who is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis since last, uh, for last 25 years. Uh, she has a past history of recurrent episcleritis. Uh, she was on treatment for uh, initial 15 years for same with which her medications were tapered and eventually stopped uh, in view of persistent low disease activity. She developed a non-healing ulcer over a left shin three months ago and she also developed a fever with sore throat almost one week back. So on examination, uh, she was found to have moderate splenomegaly, a non-tender synovial thickening over second MCP and following are, her, uh, following are her clinical findings. So this and this. So based on, the, based on this information, your question, uh, yeah, you, there is some more information there. Her laboratory evaluation showed the following findings. First is, uh, her hemoglobin was little low, 10.2. Total count was uh, 1100 out of which neutrophil 10%, lymphocytes 80%, platelet count uh, was 1,40,000 and peripheral smear showed pancytopenia uh, pan that included leukopenia with some atypical lymphocytes. Her rheumatoid factor was 210 and anti-CCP was 126. 
So based on this information, your question is, which, which malignancy resembles closely uh, with the above condition? For this, your options are, option A, large granular lymphoma, option B, multiple myeloma, option C, small cell lung cancer, and option D, maltoma. Your time starts now. Last nine minutes, nine seconds. Uh, option yes. is D, Maltoma. Oh, that is not a correct answer. Question passes to team B. Uh, sir, answer is A, large granular T cell lymphoma. Yes, that's a correct answer. Big, give a big hand for team B. So, we'll go to the next question, which is for team 2. So, we have a 50 year old male who came to our hospital with complaints of weight loss, bilateral lower limb paresthesias and a recurrent skin rash. This recurrent skin rash leaves behind skin pigmentation. Her skin uh, biopsy from the active skin rash is suggestive of leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Her lab reports show, uh, uh, his lab reports show that rheumatoid factor is 150 and serum cryoglobulin level uh, in that we see monoclonal IgM and polyclonal IgG. So based on this information, your question reads, which of the following conditions uh, have strongest association uh, for a probable pathogenic role with the most likely diagnosis based on the above description? Read the question carefully. It highlights a part in question. Your option is option A, hepatitis C. Option B, uh, primary Sjogren's syndrome. Option C, hairy cell leukemia. And option D, hepatitis B. Your time starts now. So can we see the question again, please? Yes, just a minute. So please options. Yes. Sir, hepatitis C. A. C is hairy cell leukemia. No, no. Option A. Option A, hepatitis C. Yeah. Is that your final answer? Yes. Sir. Yeah, that answer is correct. Give a big hand for team B. <laughs> nice. Till now, this race seems to be quite tough. The next question goes to team 3. So we have a 36 year old lady uh, who came to the hospital for assessment of recurrent pregnancy loss. She had an abortion at 7th week of gestation without any obvious cause. Preeclampsia and IUGR was present in her second pregnancy and a pregnancy loss was there at the 17th week of gestation in her third pregnancy. So she had total three uh, events. She did not have any history of malar rash, photosensitivity or Sika symptoms. She did not have any past history suggestive of a thrombotic event. Her labs read that hemoglobin was 11.8, A, platelet count was 1,8,000 and total uh, leukocyte count was 4,100. Her ANA was negative. So based on this information, your question is, which of the following antibodies uh, is associated with uh, above described manifestations of the disease? And your options are, option A, anti-annexin 5, option B, anti-Rho, option C, anti-SM, and option D, anti-beta-2 microglobulin. So your time starts now. Uh, option D, anti-beta-2 microglobulin. That is a wrong answer. So this question will not go to audience. This will be passed on to the next team, that is team 5. So yes, that's a correct answer. So this was a trick question. You 
although your thought process was correct, that is anti beta 2 GP1, glycoprotein 1. Okay. So, yeah. So, next, for, uh, next question for audience. We have a 5 year old male who came with 10 day history of fever, bilateral red dyes. Uh, there was no uh, pus discharge from there. Uh, there was a swelling over dorsum of her hands and feet and skin rash. Oral mucosa and tongue redness was there and it was significant. Skin and mucosal findings started fading by day 10 uh, as shown in picture uh, and fever subsided. Uh, he was, uh, all, he was also found to have right-sided cervical lymphadenopathy. All infectious causes for same were ruled out and uh, with appropriate tests. Her labs show uh, investigations of TLC of 20,000, platelet count of 6 lakh, uh, RF and anti-CCP were negative. So based on this, uh, your question is, what is long-term complication associated with this disease? And options are? Uh, option A, chronic kidney disease, option B, conduction block, option C, myocardial infarction and option D, uh, cognitive dysfunction. So, anyone from audience wants to answer? They already... Yes. <laughs> sure. Okay. So we go to our last question. So question uh, ten goes for team five. We have a thirty-eight year old lady who was referred to rheumatology OPD for evaluation and counselling for suspected rheumatological cause of. Uh, immediately after a fetal loss that happened at 24 weeks of gestation. During the pregnancy, uh, <clears throat> a complete heart block was detected on a screening fetal echo which was done in view of fetal bradycardia. Patient herself was, uh, has a history of gritty sensation in eyes with redness and occasional painless, uh, painless uh, persistent parotid gland, uh, gland enlargement since many years. Her labs show ANA immunofluorescence of fine speckled pattern, rheumatoid factor of 56 and uh, anti row 2 positivity on immunoblot. So based on this information, your question is, uh, if the patient asks you uh, about the risk of compli... Uh, can you move that? Uh, if the patient asks you about the risk of same complication in subsequent pregnancy, based on available literature, what would you tell the patient? Your options are, option A, the risk of complication in, in subsequent pregnancy is higher than what it was in, the previous in this pregnancy. Option B is the risk of complication in subsequent pre pregnancy is lower than, the, uh, than what it was in this pregnancy. Option C is there is no risk of having same complication in any of the subsequent pregnancies and option D is pregnancy is contraindicated in, in this patient. Uh, option, Your time starts now. Option A, the risk of complication is higher in the subsequent pregnancy. Yes, you, are, you have a right answer. So give a big hand for this team. Congratulations team 5. So what do you think is the condition here? Uh, congenital heart block secondary to uh, row 52 row positivity. 52 positivity. Mm -hmm. and so risk is around 20% in the subsequent pregnancy and first pregnancy it's around 2%. Correct, correct. Very, very well done. So with this, our round one ends and I hand over mic to Dr. Asmita. Before that, before that we will have a score for the round one. Uh, so, so our uh, score keepers are ready? Yes, yes. So at the end of round one, uh, so team uh, one is yet to open up, all the best, you have few more rounds to go. Team two is at present at 20, team three is at 20 and team five at 30. So team one, you are not going to be getting a passing answer from team five I think so. So beware. Now, uh, 
uh, we'll go to the rules of second round. So the round basically is I see what your brain knows, okay? So it's an image-based round, okay? So an image will be shown to you, to the each team, and a question uh, with a single answer will be asked to the each team, okay? In case of a wrong answer, it will be again passed to the next team, okay? So it will not be passed to the other team afterwards, right? The total, uh, there are two questions per team and 10 marks per question, okay? So maximum possible score per uh, team can be 40, okay? So time allotted per uh, question again is 30 seconds as previous, okay? Okay, so are you ready team one? Yeah. The slide is not moving. Achha. So, this is a, what is the closest differential diagnosis? In this 61 year old British gentleman with elevated serum alkaline phosphatase, this nuclear medicine based scan is given above. Okay. So, the question is here. What is the closest differential? So timer starts. So what is the closest differential? What is the diagnosis in this uh, the thing? Picture. So your time starts now. So team A. What is the closest differential diagnosis in this patient? So you have to diagnose this condition. So there are no options to this. Sir. Multiple myeloma? Yeah. Multiple myeloma? That is your final answer. So the answer is wrong in this, uh, uh, this thing. So the question passes to the second team. Team two. Your start ta time starts now. Yes, only eight, eight seconds left. Spondyl arthropathy uh, would be the closest diagnosis. No, the time up. So it, this question is not going to be passed. So I'll just answer this question. So the answer is very, uh, see it's a 61 year old British gentleman. Alkaline phosphatase is high. And there are in uh, nuclear scan, you can see the lesion C. So what it is? Audience? Yes? <laughs> yeah, ma'am? Yeah, it's a Paget's disease. Okay. Cookie for ma'am. So, uh, the next team is ready. Team 2. Here's the question. Identify the investigation. Your time stops now. What is the investigation? There was a whole didactic lecture yesterday on this. So, if you have attended CME well. Only one team. Yes, eight seconds. Next team, team three. Spect. Yeah? Spect. Why do you so say so? What is spect, by the way? Yeah? Yeah, your time is up. Uh, team 5 wants to answer, but they will not get the marks. DCT, yeah. ma'am. Yeah? DCT. What is that? Can you uh, dual explain? Energy con <coughs> dual energy contrast scanning just done for looking for crystal deposition in gout. Yeah, so this condition is gout. A simple disease, yes. But whatever this, it is seen in green color, they are uric acid crystals. Whatever seen in pink color, that is calcium deposits. Okay, so question for team three, are you ready? Sorry. 40 years old, 
multiparous lady with insidious onset mechanical back pain. What is the diagnosis? See the x-ray properly. Your time starts now. Eight seconds. It's a mechanical back pain. Fibromyalgia? No. Time up. Question is passed to team five. Yeah? It's OCI, osteochondritis eyelid. Yeah, the answer is right. So it is osteitis condensa. That's the answer. Yeah. So, uh, question to the audience. Are you awake? It's not moving again. Question number four. She's a ca known case of SLE with a complaint of new onset breathlessness. There is no pleural effusion on USG, thorax. But what is the likely diagnosis? The arrow points to it. Anybody from the audience? Yes. Yes. So again, just now I'm gets a cookie. It's a shrinking lung syndrome in SLE. Team five, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So a young adult comes to your OPD with a complaint of newly developed swelling over both feet and a history of repeated hospitalization for multiple episodes of fever with joint pain, chest pain, cough, skin rash due to a disease that started in early childhood. What is the stain used for the, so the question is what is the stain used for detection of this long term renal complication? Time starts now. This is Congo red stain amyloid ma'am. Yeah. So can you just explain why? Uh, this, uh, uh, this picture is that of a uh, periodic fever which has a complication of amyloidosis in the later dates and most commonly it's seen in familial Mediterranean fever. Yeah. So the stain used is Congo red. Congratulations team 5. So it's still around second and we have more questions left. So are you ready team 1? Yeah. So identify this investigation. Time start now. Nail fold capliography. Yeah? Nail fold capliography. Okay, can you explain it? And what's the use of it? It's uh, used ma'am in uh, scleroderma. Right. Uh, to uh, detect the uh, uh, presence of, uh, there are uh, stages of involvement, there are three stages of involvement and uh, it is around stage two. Congratulations. Yeah. Stage one. So you are right, the investigation is nail port capricorn. So uh, good opening for team one. Team two ready? So here is the question. In uh, 1908, uh, an ophthalmologist at the annual me meeting of Japan of Ophthalmological Society reported this finding in the eye which led to the way to the diagnosis of a well-known rheumatological condition. So the question is, what is the disease? And it's name after him, right? It's time starts now, yeah. So you see the eye, you get the diagnosis. It's there pointed in the slide. Four seconds. The question is uh, uh, shifted to the team three. Giant seal heart disease. Yeah? Giant seal heart Achha, you're close too, but no, time up. So the answer is Takayosu arthritis. You are close, but yes, yeah, there is an aneurysm which can be seen in the fundus and it is Takayosu arthritis. So uh, question 8, again audience question, identify this condition. 
ऑडियंस आर यू अवेक सलील कीप कुकीज रेडी येस वॉट्स द कंडीशन There is no negative marking for this, so you can attempt. No, it should be for team three. No? Audience round, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the condition is called as calcinosis cutis, and it can be present in juvenile dermatomyositis. Right. Team three, the other question. No, no. Yes, yes. There okay, this question. next question will ask. Okay, okay question well, number. Next question will come. Then. Yeah. We'll Don't worry. Thing. Okay. So what is this condition? Question number uh, team three gets the question. Yes. Easy one. Yeah, team three. Levido reticularis. Yeah. Levido retic reticularis. Okay, levido reticularis. That's the correct answer. Yeah. Okay, team five, are you ready? Yes. So the image here is a epidemiological linked to a rheumatological disease. Name the disease. Beche. Hmm? Uh, silk root disease. Beche. Okay. Can you explain it? Um, the description was in the original silk root, so Mediterranean belt. So this is that belt which is describing, and the disease is Beche's disease. Yeah. So it's a very tough answer, and really a question. And silk root, and purpose we had equipped for you only. <laughs> so team five, yes, good. So at the end of uh, no. we have questions left okay so team uh, time keeper and uh, score keeper are you ready yeah so congratulations to the team uh, one which has opened up the score now they are at 10 uh, uh, at the end of round uh, round 2 the team 2 as uh, still at 20 Sorry. team 3 uh, is at 30 and team 5 is at 60 oh congratulations team 5 yes i'll start so we'll go to the next round yes so this round is called true and false rapid fire round so rules for this round each team will get a set of five questions uh, which you have to answer as either true or false yeah so uh, there will be no passing on allowed in this question and uh, five team five questions will be asked for each team and a total of 25 questions will be there each question will get 10 marks so this is a place where you can actually catch up uh, with your scores maximum score for uh, each team will be uh, five uh, 50 plus 50 100 marks uh, time allotted per set of question is for total five questions it will be around 2 minutes approximately uh, so yeah 10 10 seconds per question will get okay so everybody clear with rules yeah that okay so and they don't have anything writing material yeah. yes i think they need we'll it give the writing material ah. and we will not tell you uh, the correct answer image or we can tell you the uh, correct answer immediately no issue with that
So everybody is ready? Yeah. So I'll start this round. For team one, your first question is regarding scleroderma, presence of a tendon friction rub is an indicator of impending renal crisis. Your time starts now. True. Yes. Answer true is correct. Second question. SLE can be a monogenic disease with uh, Mendelian inheritance pattern. Your time so, starts now. False. Uh, that is a wrong, yes, wrong answer. So we'll go to third question. In dermatobiositis, surveillance for malignancy is not required after three years from onset of muscle weakness. Is it true or false? Your time starts now. Quick. False. 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 Yeah. False answer is correct. So, uh, question four. Sjogren's syndrome often presents with deforming arthritis. Uh, your time starts now. False. False is correct. <coughs> uh, question five. Uh, in 2010 classification criteria for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, first, carpometacarpal joint is considered a small joint uh, while counting the number of joints. Your time starts now. False. Yes, false is correct. Okay. So, give a big hand for team one. So, team two ready? I will go on to team two. For team two, uh, First question is, vasculitis is the commonest cause of skin ulcer in uh, scleroderma. Uh, your time starts now. True. Uh, that's a false answer. That's a wrong answer. Answer is false. Uh, second question is, IgA2 is an isotype considered to be pathogenic in IgA vasculitis. Your time starts now. A false. Yes, false is a correct answer. Uh, question 3. In steroid myopathy, there is a predominant involvement of type 2 skeletal muscle fibers. Is it true or false? Your time starts now. It is true. Yes, true is a correct answer. Next question is, adverse pregnancy outcome due to preeclampsia is one of the important uh, non criteria manifestation of antiphospholipid syndrome. Your time starts now. Excuse me, what is non criteria manifestation? Yes. Is it true or false? False. Okay. Just a minute. No, that's, uh, that's a wrong answer. It's, answer is false. You have given false answer? False. 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 Yes, false. that's correct. Sorry. Uh, question 5. In the classification criteria for psoriatic arthritis, that is CASPER, the patient reported history of skin psoriasis is given two points. Is it true or false? Time starts now. Oh, it's false. Yes, false is a correct answer. So, give a big hand for team 2. So, I will go to the next team, uh, team 3. So, anti -centromere, uh, centromere antibody is associated with development of a positive int uh, progressive interstitial lung disease. Is it a true answer or false? Your time starts now. False. False. False is a correct answer. In case of uh, ISN RPS 2003, uh, 2004 modification of WHO classification of lupus nephritis, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, FSGS, is considered under class 4 lupus nephritis. Is it true or false? False. False is the correct answer. In GPA, a granuloma is required for diagnosis in a renal biopsy. Is it true or false? False. False is the correct answer. Uh, then in mixed connective tissue disorder, M uh, uh, MCTD, mixed connective tissue disease, uh, the coarse, uh, coarse granular pattern of ANA is the most common pattern on ANA uh, immunofluorescence. Uh, is it true? True is the correct answer. Uh, Five, in an antiphospholipid syndrome, 
vasculopathy that is no prominence of inflammatory cells rather than vasculitis is a predominant pathology is it true or false the time is ending uh, false uh, so that is a true that's a correct answer uh, sorry that's a wrong answer true uh, is the correct answer so next round this will not go to audience i'll go directly to team 5 so for team 5 uh, fulfillment of new york uh, modified new york criteria is not mandatory for classification uh, as an axial spondyloarthritis according to sas criteria Answer. true true is correct anterior cruciate ligament of knee is assessed by anterior drawer test is it true or false, false. Uh, that is true then uh, proliferative glomerular nephritis is the commonest type of renal involvement in mctd is it true or false 5 seconds false false is a correct answer we go to next one in the case of oligoarticular jia early initiation of methotrexate is mandatory in all patients uh, to prevent long term complications like limb length discrepancy is it true or false 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 is the correct answer majid syndrome is characterized by a bimodal distribution time starts now Uh, false false is the correct answer yes so well done so yeah uh, we have only one set actually here so we'll conclude this round here uh, can we get the score at the end of round uh, so all teams have secured 40 marks in this round so at the end of this round uh, Team one is at fifty, team two at sixty, team three at seventy, and team five is at hundred. Now this is the last round. Okay. Uh, so don't uh, get worried even this round uh, you can have nice marks so it is fastest finger first okay but not finger but we have given you bell the team after the question ends you have to buzzer okay otherwise it will not be considered as right so ha uh, please don't keep your hand on buzzer otherwise then so let me finish my question process is and then only answer right Yeah. No, no. There are separate. So the team will be going to get different uh, prize altogether. So this is exceptional. Other, other thing. <laughs> okay fine so the uh, okay so in this dilemma the thing is if they don't answer then question, uh, team 5 uh, will get the question okay so are you ready huh no negative marking is added but you don't negative marking I just sorry. Uh, I'll just read the round uh, the thing. There is some negative marking given. Okay. So uh, question. So total ten questions will be asked. Ten marks per uh, question of correct answer and five negative marks. So unnecessary buzzing if you don't know. So it will give five marks. Yes. So scorekeepers five negative marks if there is a wrong answer. Possible score per team is hundred marks. Maximum possible loss of points is hundred marks again. so it's a win win situation maximum 30 seconds per question okay expected to total time is 10 to 12 minutes okay are you ready so all team should be ready this question is directed to all teams so 54 years old gentleman with insidious onset proximal muscle weakness with the following rash on the hip 
so you are disqualified you get a negative mark so you i have not completed my question yet so a uh, team 3 gets negative marks okay question is name this sign okay question so you get 5 marks negative yes yes it's a horse okay so yes it's what what does what did it spell okay so yes it's a, a correct answer but they get minus 5 for the same thing yeah so next question minus 5 not for this question name this complication of rheumatoid arthritis yes team 3 you have to speak in the mic yes scleromalacia Sclero Malaysia. Malaysia. Okay, because of what? Uh, sclerosis. Uh, sclerosis. So sclerotis. it is a complication of sclerosis. So impeding, uh, you can have a rupture of eyeball. Yeah, it's a right answer. So Sclero Malaysia perfora is the answer. Right. Uh, next question. A 22-year-old student with a history of high-risk sexual behavior presented with arthritis, painful oral ulcer, dysuria, and this lesion. What is the name of this finding? Skin lesion. So, team three again. Yes. Right answer. Very good. It was a difficult answer uh, question actually. Yes. Already is. All teams ready. So she is 60 years old lady on treatment with drug A. We don't know what, but for seven years for severe osteoporosis, developed an incidence onset boring pain of the thigh. There is no history of fall or trauma. X-ray is having something. So what? Which drug could it be? So again, team three, and then team two. So team three, yeah. Steroid. Negative marks. Bisphosphonates, bisphosphonates. Yeah, so team two gets ten marks, ten th minus five. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Forty-eight years old lady with chronic cough, dyspnea, fever, and weight loss for two years, with a rash over face, non-photosensitive for six months. What is the diagnosis? Team three. Yes. Uh, sarcoidosis. Why do you say so? Lupus pernio. Huh? What about the city? Uh, ILD. Round loss opacity. Is it like ILD? So your answer is right because what is the diagnosis I have asked? So sarcoidosis. So there is lymphadenopathy. Yeah. And granuloma. Right. So, question number six. Are you ready? This is a scientist who received a Nobel Prize in Physiology Medicine, year 2016. What was the discovery of which, for which the Nobel Prize was awarded? Time starts now. What was the discovery? We don't want the name, but the discovery. Team five. No, no. Okay, fine. So you are not answering. So Salil will answer for this. So the discovery was uh, autophagy. Okay, yeah. So we'll go to the next question. Elderly lady with a shoulder pain and swelling over shoulder joint. Okay. Following is a X-ray. What is the likely diagnosis?
इट्स अ गाउट एल्डरली लेडी या गाउट इट्स एल्डरली लेडी आई थिंक टीम सेकेंड ऑल्सो बजर्ड राइट नो नो बजरिंग नो बजरिंग सो इट्स अ रॉन्ग आंसर एक्चुअली टीम फाइव एक सेकेंड एक सेकेंड टीम थ्री Do you want to try? Okay, team five. CPPD arthropathy, arthritis mutilans. No, the answer is uh, something else. Anybody from the audience? Yeah. No, it's uh, calcification at the shoulder. So. So, milk walkie shoulder milk walkie shoulder that yes. was what is cppd arthropathy and uh, no, this is milk walkie so that will not be given it's okay what is the finding shown by the arrow yes team 3 Asha, why do you say so? Swollen finger, right? So they get it right. So that is psoriasis with dactylitis. Very important sign when you see a patient, you will not miss diagnosis. Yes. Question number nine. A twenty-five-year-old man, um, man was recently diagnosed with uh, peripheral spondylopathy on the basis of inflammatory oligoarthritis. Enthesitis and HLA B27 positivity, and he was started on uh, sulfasalazine. After which he developed the skin rash. What is the name of this complication? Yeah, team A, a buzzard first. For the end of the question. No, I completed my uh, question. I completed my and then they buzzard. So team A. T N. Toxic yes? burden of necrolysis. Uh, no. So uh, we have not this. Huh? Actually, the. Um, Steven Johnson syndrome. S J S. Steven yes? Johnson. Steven Johnson. Yeah. SGS. So Steven Johnson syndrome is the correct answer, but it starts with T E N. Yes. So. Start. Yes. So we we give uh, team A as a correct answer. But Steven Johnson is area. We have not described the area. Yes. So if it is more than thirty, uh, yes, it will be Steven Johnson syndrome. Ma'am, excuse me. The following celebrities associated with relief and research work on rheumatological disease. Which is that disease? A. S. L. E. Okay. The answer is right. So she is Selena Gomez and she is suffering from S. L. E. yeah that's the end of uh, the round 4 we will have the scores if there is some tie weaker among the three teams then we will have again questions right I think all the questions were uh, brainstorming, and thanks to Salil, he has uh, really uh, made this slide so nicely. And uh, thanks, audience, for listening it patiently and uh, participating in the quiz. So there is anxiety among the students who is uh, the winning team. I'll call upon uh, Dr. Ray on the dais and Dr. Mohini Ganu, ma'am. You write the final result in this thing. Just write the names of the team and we'll give it to them.
the team didn't participate na only one answer the oh. so it's up to you so you can just uh, tell the scores so first of all all participants have really performed well and i must appreciate also the quiz master for uh, <laughs> it's a nice and wonderful very interesting quiz i think this is one of the best session of this conference uh, which many people have missed but uh, this was the uh, uh, very nicely arranged and uh, very nicely compared quiz so final scores team 1 you are at 65 Team two, you are seventy. Team three, he has one not five, and <laughs> team five at ninety-five. Okay, so congratulations to the team three for securing the highest score. You, uh, you did very well in the last round, so that really helped you to jump up your positions and secure the top rank. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. will call team 3 for yes to sportsmanship good <laughs> so we call team 3 for uh, receiving their prize so the first prize goes to team yeah. 3 first yeah so first uh, first come prize stage. comes to uh, goes to team 3 please come on stage this was the best session of the whole conference because it was interactive session and everybody was awake even after meals having meals and i congratulate all the teams who have participated in this winning and losing is not important but participation was very important that has generated डॉक्टर प्रणव देवधर फ्रॉम विलासराव देशमुख गवर्नमेंट मेडिकल कॉलेज लातूर मैसेल शुभम चतरकर फ्रॉम वी डी जी एम सी लातूर डॉक्टर अमित वर्मा फ्रॉम वी डी जी एम सी लातूर मैसेल डॉक्टर पराग टेंभुर्ने फ्रॉम वी डी जी एम सी लातूर सो द प्राइज गोज जॉइंटली टू लातूर एंड सोलापुर बोथ फॉर लातूर द टीम इज फ्रॉम लातूर कॉलेज एंड देअर मेंटर इज फ्रॉम सोलापूर दो शी इज प्रेझेंटली बेस्ट ॲट लातूर सो इट्स अ जॉईंट प्राईज बिटवीन लातूर अँड सोलापूर नाव अनाऊन्स टीम फाईव्ह टू कम ऑन स्टेज फॉर रिसिव्हिंग देअर प्राईज टीम फाईव्ह Congratulations to the winning team here. <laughs> Though there was no uh, opponent for this team, they have answered very well. So congratulations. Yes. Uh, I also want to mention special thanks to Dr. Shivraj Padia for uh, from, from CMC for contributing some questions to this quiz. Can you introduce? Yourself? Can you? Good evening. I am Dr. Sri Lakshmi from Bharati Vidya Peet Medical College in Hospital. Uh, good evening. I am Dr. Deepthi Agarwal from Bharati Vidya Peet Medical College, and I should thank the organizer for letting us participate in the quiz because we really wanted this fun of quiz. Though we were a little more than the MD students in the in terms of our uh, qualification, but we really thank them and we really thoroughly enjoyed this event. Thank you so much. डॉक्टर गानो प्लीज आय इन्व्हाइट द मेंबर्स फ्रॉम ऑडियन्स 
who want to speak regarding conference may i request some volunteer to speak yes dr rahish hello everyone now the, we are coming to the end of this session and before we propose vote of thanks we would like to have um, audience opinion about the conference so i invite dr rahish to uh, first of all i would like to congratulate the organizing team especially mohini madam and uh, mukund sir uh, who has uh, you know, worked really hard to bring this to uh, uh, such a grand conclusion uh, the ambience was good the academic sessions were good uh, the crowd was very attentive and very good to see these young budding uh, doctors coming up and you know uh, giving a good performance i congratulate uh, the winners and all the uh, participants uh, of the quiz it was really enjoyable you know at the end of the day listening to you all uh, so i'll just like to summarize the program uh, mrcon uh, this is the third mrcon Uh, started off uh, with words of wisdom from stalwarts like uh, Bishle Madam and Arvind Chopra sir, who gave us a holistic idea about what rheumatology is like as of today uh, in a country like India, where the resources are limited, and how we are going to you know move forward, and you know uh, how the young generation can uh, take this rheumatology uh, scenario in this country to greater heights. Uh, then Niharika Madam, the most energetic uh, of our lot. Uh, opened up uh, the sessions with uh, basic clinical history and how, how to diagnose various uh, rheumatological conditions very briefly. Uh, that was a very uh, informative session. Then we went on to the RA symposium where uh, the speakers did uh, their best to you know, concise uh, the overall picture about rheumatoid arthritis, the investigations, the management, the newer therapies uh, and uh, Dr. Praveen Patil uh close the session in style in his own you know cool and calm manner so that was very nice to see i always uh, appreciate dr pravin patel the how he, the way he talks so i like uh, to you know mention his name sorry i'm not mentioning other uh, speakers name uh then uh, we had the presidential oration uh, by dr uh, shubda madam uh, she did uh, speak her out heart out uh, she has uh, a chronic back issue uh, so the topic was very close to her heart and you know Uh, she spoke her heart out and with great uh, conviction about a very common problem which we many a time miss in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Uh, it was then uh, followed by Dr. Dharmanan's uh, keynote address uh, and inauguration, uh, which was uh, as you know uh, enlightening as uh, always. Then we had a symposium on spondyloarthritis, where uh, the speakers did speak about. Uh, spondyloarthritis is a diagnosis. What are the new therapies available? How to diagnose? What are the differentials? So, uh, Dr. Akirkar uh, is a stalwart in this uh, disease, and he has done a great job. So, he is one of the speakers. So, mentioning. Oh, sorry. He has just completed the Satara Marathon. Yes. So, <coughs> then we went on to uh, AOSD. Uh, by Dr. Uh, Rohini Samant. Uh, then we went on to infections and rheumatology, which covered the very common day-to-day uh, -day problems like chikungunya, post-COVID uh, autoimmune syndromes, what are the mimics of infections and rheumatic diseases, and what are the vaccination scenario in rheumatic diseases. So that was very well covered. Uh, refractory RA versus uh, CIPA basically was covered by Dr. Sandhi. Uh, good symposium on gout, uh, very lucid, you know, Overall, uh, very uh, nicely covered. All the topics were very cov easily covered, which is a very common problem in our day-to-day -day, uh, practice. Uh, then uh, the day ended with a good uh, entertainment session and you know camaraderie and fellowship. So we all enjoyed uh, the ambience and the songs. Uh, today morning we started off with uh, uh, interactive uh, sessions uh, by sorry. Uh, IgG4 by Dr. Uh, Rohini Samant, uh, which was very, very uh, informative and you know, uh, easy to understand the way she presented uh, the difficult cases that we, uh, she saw in her practice. Uh, 
then we moved on to osteoporosis uh, by Dr. Milind Aurangabadkar. Very common problem. We deal with uh, you know, long-standing inflammatory uh, diseases with steroid use. So it's a very, very important topic. And many of us, to be very frank, are not really focusing on the osteoporosis part in our day-to-day -day, uh, practice. So we need to be more aware of uh, the therapies, uh, the modalities that we have. Uh, myositis was uh, covered beautifully uh, by the esteemed speakers. Uh, symposium on lupus was very informative, uh, you know, covered very nicely all the aspects of this very uh, challenging disease. Uh, APLA talks, definitely very, very uh, informative. Uh, monoarthritis uh, by Dr. Gayatri Ekbote was very informative. Uh, then we went on to CCT ILD, uh, then we went on to vasculitis uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Nachiket and you know management of vasculitis by Dr. Uh, Josna Oak ma'am, uh, which was very informative and you know we got an overall picture of you know how to go about uh, such difficult uh, diseases. Uh, then we went uh, then we went on to scleroderma symposium where uh, Dr. Parikshit, Asmita, uh, everybody smoke uh, about uh, a disease which, you know, uh, gives you immense satisfaction when you, you know, start treating this patient and the patient responds. Otherwise, it's a very difficult disease to treat and uh, get results quickly. Uh, then was definitely the quiz was the highlight of uh, the program, I mean, day one and day two. Uh, overall, I think uh, MRACON has uh, always been striving basically to bring the rheumatology awareness to nook and corner of Maharashtra. Uh, I think this endeavor, this session uh, which we conducted here in Solapur with the help of uh, IMA, Latur and uh, Solapur, sorry, API, API, sorry, API, Latur and Solapur and uh, able guidance of Mohini Madam and uh, Mukundre sir. Uh, I think we have been successful in, you know, uh, creating that awareness uh, among the general population, the, I mean the general physicians, the grassroots level uh, physicians and encouraged uh, the budding medicos uh, to create interest in rheumatology and, you know, join rheumatology uh, so that you that the, the big caveat is filled actually. There is a lot of need of a newer rheumatologists, you know, better trained rheumatologists to be in every nook and car of Maharashtra so that they don't have to travel to big cities like Pune, Mumbai, uh, you know, all the way uh, to such long distances for basic treatment. I think uh, this this session or this MRICON has been successful uh, in you know reaching out to the general population, the primary care physicians, the students to you know take up rheumatology. I hope the MRICON reaches uh, greater heights uh, in the years to come. Uh, so, wishing all the best, and we had a great time. Uh, on behalf of all the uh, members here, I, I thank the organizers for such a great event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Vaish. I invite Dr. Nachiket Kulkarni. the recent past secretary of Maharashtra Rheumatology Association. At outset, I think we had invoked Lord Dhanvantari's blessings for a successful and academically enhanced conference. I hope that invoking led to a good uh, academically feasting conference for all of you. Uh, we have been running behind time, so again saving time, I just would express my thanks to the organizers. I know the difficulty in raising finances, logistics, bringing everybody here and holding this event, how difficult that is, but they have done it seamlessly well uh, and, and the ambience uh, has been most reassuring and comforting. Thank you. Thank you, Nasir. The final vote of thanks will be proposed by Dr. Ray, but before that, I want to give a short comment here. I personally feel from organizer's point of view, uh, it was a very good conference. The organization from our point of view was, we had tried our best and yeah, Dr. Ryan's special kautuk. Maza Bahirun logistic support hota. Solapur team and Dr. Ryan la and the special kautuk ground work sati. And Latur API team sa special kautuk background work sati. Rest will be told by Dr. Ryan. And it's not like I accept that. 
दैट रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी और चिंतन करूँ अपन अवश्य मोक्या मना आम पर्सनल हर कहू शकता तुम्हारा का त्रुटी वाटत आती नेक्स्ट टाइम वी विल ट्राई टू इम्प्रूव आवर सेल्स थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू डॉक्टर गानू नाउ इज द लास्ट सेशन ऑफ दिस कॉन्फरन्स वी नो all are now in a hurry to go back home after enjoying the conference hope the scientific session of this conference will help in everyone's practice and patient care and will really reach to the grassroots that is patients i specially thank for the able guidance of the organizing chairperson dr mohini ganu thank you madam i specially thank to maharashtra rheumatology association especially dr shubhda kalke dr arvin chopra dr lata bichile dr nachiket kulkarni and also dr b g dharmanand who happens to be our ira president it made us without the support of mra it was not possible to make sholapur as the venue of this conference thank you very much thanks to the members of api solapur and api latur and this was a team work whole lot i must say that it was a team work every member of api helped in some or the other way and make this event a success thanks to the faculties and uh, i must i am very happy and proud to say that 100% of the faculties who were requested to uh, deliver their speeches and talks have attended with a, without delegates any conference cannot be successful the registration drive was uh, steered up 3 months back and happy to share that 250 delegates have registered and attended the conference thank you very much these include not only practicing physicians but also the students who have presented papers and posters enthusiastically i must thank dr uh, mr avdut kulkarni and his team for the mmc work getting done and uh, seeing that the registrations are made hassleless and the further mmc and certification course is completed thanks to the balaji sarovar premier staff especially mr ambuj and mr gaikwad and the whole of the staff for excellent venue management clean and neat and not to forget the chef of the balaji sarovar who prepared delicious food and served it well thanks to mr samiran shedjale for his excellent audio visuals which was flawless and so the scientific program was enjoyable thanks for the decorative arrangements made by mr shedjale and his team thanks to mr chabukswar siddharam who helped us in booking the rooms and allotting the rooms in time for the delegates who had booked the rooms i especially thank dr kamatkar and dr prachi patil though she could not come from nasik for making the souvenir a good one i especially thank dr kamatkar for arranging and conducting the public forum program so well that it was appreciated by one and all thanks to dr nishikant maske our entertainment program in charge dr nitin toshniwal and dr paike and his team who orchestrated with jabbar's orchestra to entertain the delegates 
Thanks to Dr. Karkamkar Suhas and Dr. Yatin Zog, who were the driving force for raising the finance for the conference. Thanks to Dr. Satish Godse, Dr. Ashok Ganu, who are the presidents of Solapur and Lakhtur API, Dr. P.J. Pradeep Singhal and Dr. Sham Toshniwal, who are the secretaries of Solapur and Latur API and Dr. Suraj Dhut, who worked as Joint Organizing Secretary. Thanks to the Academic Committee, Dr. Jayant Goldwalkar, Dr. D.C. Apte, Dr. Nilima Deshpande and the judges from the our Rheumatology Association for judging the papers and e-posters. That was the most appreciated event in this MRACON. I must specially thank the hall management group, Dr. Nirmal Tapriya and Dr. S.M. Rudrakshi and his team with Asim Saifan, Dr. Yogesh Velapurkar, Dr. Aradhe. Without them, this scientific program would not have been so smooth. Thanks to the volunteers who, are, who work tirelessly to help, I should take their names. Chaitanya Divanji, Vedanta Bugde, Srutika Hire Kherur, Saurya Zadhav, Pratiksha Murkut, Utsurge, Sanyogita Gavane, and Manasi Malsuri. I think I don't have one name. <laughs> Thanks, all of them. Thanks to the pharma companies for their commercial support. I must thank IPPA Activa who supported for this educational activity in a big way. Others who helped for with the, their educational grant and commercial activity are CIPLA, Natco Pharma, Indobest, MSN Lab, Pharmed Limited, Alchem Laboratories, Lupin Pharma, Ajanta Pharma, Pulse Pharmaceuticals, HBC Life Sciences, Alembic Pharmaceuticals, Criti Care, Oxygen Hospital Care, Frenicious Cabbie Limited, Valles Lifestyle, Systopic Laboratories and Gentis Pharma along with Maclioids and Dr. Reddy's. Genmark was interested in serving tea and stall, uh, tea and coffee throughout the conference sessions. A special thanks to Mr. Kiran Kotane from Oxygen Hospital Care for having this Barabandi session and most of us have enjoyed that Solapur culture with the photograph in Barabandi. Thanks to known and unknown individuals and organizations who have helped in organizing this conference since 2020. Thank you, one and all. Is Dr. Rajendra Agrawal here? No, he is absent. Yes. So, thank you, everyone, and the chapter closes here. Thank you.